people, to the British people and to the world why the British government had made a decision to get involved in the attacks which started this afternoon. Uh, the Prime Minister, if particularly in the last week, has been, uh, his words have been the sharpest to the Taliban. Um, he has been involved in the diplomacy, particularly dealing with the Pakistanis over the last week in an effort to secure that part of the coalition. He has, as the President indicated the other day, been a very good friend uh, to Mr. Bush through it all. A couple of other uh, quick items here. Several Muslim leaders within Pakistan are denouncing the U.S. and British attacks, calling them brutal and unwarranted. They called on Muslims to extend full support to their Afghan brothers. That coming out of Muslim leaders in Pakistan. And the Taliban ambassador in Pakistan, Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif, Sunday, condemned the United States attacks as a terrorist attack. Quote, we tried our best to resolve uh, the solution, but the power drunk United States took the way of arrogance. It will be responsible for the killing of poor and innocent people in Afghanistan. That from the Taliban ambassador in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is the only country that continues to have formal diplomatic relations with the Taliban regime on its border in Afghanistan. Um, I know uh, this being a Sunday, a lot of you are coming in periodically. Uh, let me catch up on a couple of details as we go. The shot you see, the green shot, uh, to my right is a camera location of ours about 40 miles to the north of Kabul, the Afghan capital. Um, we look down at it, as I'm sure you do a lot, to see what we see. Uh, we see occasional flashes of light, but again, this is nothing like what we saw in Baghdad in those early uh, hours of the Persian Gulf War a decade ago. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell us that this is not an ongoing effort. In fact, we believe it is. It just tells us uh, that we're not seeing a lot of tracer fire coming back. Um, Christiane Amanpour in Islamabad has been uh, working her contacts. Christiane, are you picking up little bits and pieces of Pakistani reaction? Well, first of all, reaction from inside Afghanistan. Again, our sources there reached by phone say there is another wave of attacks underway on Kandahar, and they are speculating that it may be around Mullah Omar's house, which is, as you know, he is the supreme leader of the Taliban movement. So that's just what we've heard from Kandahar in the last few moments. Another round of attacks on Kandahar. Earlier, we had heard from uh, both Kandahar and close to Jalalabad talking about attacks in the last hour or so in Kandahar reached by telephone at or by radio at the airport they're saying that the command center had been hit the radar station had been hit also in Jalalabad our sources there saying that they believed a target south of the city had been hit that may have been the airport but a subsequent call to Jalalabad suggests that it may have been an al-Qaeda base according to a highly placed military source inside Afghanistan it may have been an al-Qaeda base around Jalalabad that had been hit on the humanitarian issue. We are hearing again from Kandahar that people have been fleeing in uh, the wake of these attacks, trying to flee out of the city. Of course, in the last few days, Mullah Omar, the Taliban leader, had been urging people to come back, saying that the United States was not going to attack. You know that over the last few weeks, many Afghans, thousands of Afghans, had left cities, gone either to the countryside or come to the borders with Pakistan. So that's what we're hearing, the latest from inside Afghanistan. As for here in Pakistan, we understand that the air space is still open here, indicating that there are no overflights, uh, military overflights of Pakistan. That, as I say, is speculation. All I can tell you is that it is open, the airspace. Also, the cabinet is meeting, and we apparently are going to have a statement either from the foreign minister or from the foreign minister's spokesman in about 20 minutes from now. One other note of vast importance, given the public reaction here, Prime Minister Tony Blair very, very clear about the humanitarian dimension of this, going out of his way to say that, quote, we are doing all that we humanly can to avoid casualties and that a big concern in this region every time we talk to anybody here many people insist that if there is to be retaliation against the uh, terrorists and the training camps that there must not be uh, attacks on Afghan civilians and uh, public reaction here suggesting that if there was widespread attacks or civilian casualties that would vastly impact public opinion in this 
this region. We understand from military analysts that any attacks would avoid civilian infrastructure, the roads, bridges and other things that we've seen being hit in other military actions, for instance Kosovo, the Gulf War and other such things. Aaron? Well, that's always the plan. It, it, this, this military business is an imperfect science, uh, but that's the plan, is to go after specific military targets, to go after command and control centers, to go after anti-aircraft sites, to go after terrorist bases or what's left of them. It's hard to imagine that whoever occupied those bases are still hanging around, but that's the plan. But as we know from uh, other battles and other times, uh, these things always don't go according to form. Um, these attacks started a couple of hours ago now. We have some pictures from Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is a uh, major television network in the Middle East. It is seen by much of the Arab world. Uh, these are pictures that they shot for us. We have an exclusive relationship with them and we'll be passing along not only the pictures that they have and they in some respects these are we believe just outside of Kabul um, they have some access that right now um, perhaps no one else has uh, they also give us a very good idea of what is being told to the Islamic world while this is going on so they benefit us in a number of ways uh, again these are taped pictures outside of Kabul. You can see the, uh, some tracer fire going up. Um, General Wes Clark is here too. And General, I assume you can see a monitor here. Uh, uh, and as we go to live, uh, back to our live picture, that camera to the north of Kabul. Uh, did you see anything in the Al Jazeera shots that, uh, from your eye, your experienced eye, that would be helpful to us here? Well, I, you can see the string of tracers going up from uh, probably 23 millimeter cannon. That would indicate that they, they believe that the aircraft is low enough to shoot down. Sounds like a cruise missile. If it's, uh, if it's any of our uh, manned aircraft, they're going to be much too high for that kind of anti-aircraft small caliber cannon to affect. And this will be a very precise uh, set of strikes. We're obviously going to take uh, great care to avoid civilian casualty, so you're not going to hear a continuous rumble of a fire. It will be pinpoint, precise, and, uh, and uh, it should have a very good impact. Um, walk us through a couple things, if you will. Uh, we've talked about a number of specific cities that these attacks have been launched against. Why don't you, in a sentence or two, the importance of each location? Well, we know in Kabul, of course, that's the capital of, of Afghanistan, and that's where uh, traditionally the uh, command and control headquarters has been. There's also been an alternate command post, which the Taliban occupied for some time in their spiritual center of Kandahar. There are air bases and other facilities that were there originally in Afghanistan. They were improved by the Soviets, and uh, presumably these are all occupied in one form or another by the Taliban armed forces today. And Jalalabad is to the north of Kab Kabul, correct? It is. And its it's importance is, is beyond, it is a fairly decent sized city, is uh, the terrorist base issue? Yes, there are terrorist bases in many of these locations, here and here. Uh, of course, the Pashtun area is in this region, so this is also an area which has been traditionally very supportive uh, of, uh, of the Taliban, plus it's uh, where probably Osama bin Laden would feel most secure. So we're not limited by the geography in these early sets of strikes. The cruise missiles have adequate range to cover anywhere in the country. They can come in from any angle and uh, they can come in at any time. Manned aircraft also have complete coverage of the area. The geography gets a lot more complicated uh, as the weather turns and as you start talking about not uh, air forces but uh, anyone who might go in on the ground. It will be more difficult for troops on the ground. There's no question the geography is a major factor for, for the ground troops. But at this stage, it, it's uh, a lay down from the air. It's a lay down. Tell me what that means. Well, we've been watching these targets presumably for a long time. Uh, we have complete dominance of the, of the skies from, from outer space and high altitude observation. And so uh, we've plotted these attacks in, in, with great precision and great detail. Everything will be choreographed down to the split second. Routes, times on targets, uh, ingress, egress, everything to do with the aircraft and the cruise missiles will be, have been carefully planned, rehearsed numerous times on computer war games, and uh, it'll, it'll flow like clock here.
Okay. Uh, General, thanks. I want to talk more about that question, the planning, as we go along this afternoon. Uh, the President has been on the phone to members of Congress, to foreign leaders as well. Major Garrett's at the White House, and he can give us some detail on that. Major? Aaron, all very typical. The President calling all four congressional leaders. That would include the House Speaker, Dennis Hastert, the House Minority Leader, Richard Gephardt, the Senate Majority Leader, Tom Daschle, and the Senate Minority Leader, Trent Lott, notifying them ahead of time of this military action. The White House throughout this crisis has maintained very close relationships, very close contact with the Republican and Democratic leadership of the Congress, not only on this front, but on all domestic fronts. Washington has seen a degree of unity and bipartisanship since September 11th that it has not seen in a very, very long while. On the international front, CNN has confirmed the president also called Russian President Vladimir Putin to notify him of the imminent military strikes in Afghanistan. Mr. Putin has emerged as a key and vital component of the coalition against terrorism and the president notifying him ahead of time as well. Aaron. And just uh, adding a, a sentence or two onto this uh, question of congressional support, while in the last week we saw some partisan differences about economic stimulus, about the right airport security plan, you know, who's on which payroll. Um, since uh, this began on the 11th of, of September, there has been unwavering uh, support for the president, uh, no matter the party, and nothing that's happened since that day has changed that. Um, obviously, we're moving uh, pretty quickly around the world here. The first official Taliban reaction now to the attacks, quote, America will never achieve its goal, that coming from the Taliban in Afghanistan. Christian Amanpour is in Islamabad. Christian. Well, just to describe to you a little bit more about what we're hearing from our sources inside Afghanistan, specifically in Kandahar, I reported a few minutes ago about a second wave of attacks on Kandahar. They are being described as more intense and heavier than the first wave. The source says that he believes that one of the explosions at least was around a compound that was used by Mullah Omar, a compound that belonged to him. It's a fairly big compound. It is unlikely, though, that he would have been in there, they say. A military base, this source believes, in the city may also have been hit, and also there has been some anti-aircraft fire directed into the sky. Some, we are told, not a lot. The Taliban ambassador is being quoted by AP and other wire sources here, and we're trying to get on the phone with him, but predictably saying that this is now a terrorist attack by the United States. We also have a statement from the JUI, one of the hardline Islamic parties here, whose leader today was put under house arrest, saying that this attack by the United States is uh, uh, what, we, what they called uh, justification for a jihad, a holy war, as they've been saying for the last four weeks, and they're also calling for mass demonstrations tomorrow. To reiterate, the Pakistani cabinet is meeting and we expect shortly to have a statement from the foreign minister or his spokesman. Aaron? Thank you. We might, uh, we might make a couple of uh, notes to our viewers. Ten and a half hour difference, I'm sorry, eight and a half hour difference uh, to Afghanistan from the east coast of the United States. Uh, and um, the State Department has issued a worldwide travel alert for Americans. Obviously that is not surprising, but it has been formally announced. So Americans are told to use extreme caution if they are traveling abroad. Extreme caution is what we always urge on Kamal Haider, who's been reporting for us from uh, inside Afghanistan. We won't be any more specific than that. Kamal, you have some detail on the second wave of attacks? Yes, uh, our people in Kandahar basically called us a few minutes ago, and they said that the second wave of attack was underway. They said that this was much closer than the last one, uh, which was uh, towards the airport, 30 kilometers away. Uh, but uh, these explosions were extremely loud. There was some anti-aircraft fire heard, and uh, they said that the intended targets were possibly the core headquarter in Kandahar and uh, possibly the residence of uh, the Taliban Supreme Leader, Mullah Muhammad Umar. And you're getting this by telephone, correct? So at least the uh, phones correct. are working. Uh, sorry? I say at least telephones are still working. Yes, in fact, uh, basically, uh, yes, uh, they're still in communication uh, with us. But don't forget, this is from our CNN office in Kandahar. I understand that. And did they tell you, did they give you any sense of panic in the city, of chaos in the city? Did they give you any sort of picture of what it is like to be in Kandahar, Afghanistan, under American attack right now? 
Well, uh, people in Kandahar have been putting up a very brave uh, show there. Uh, they uh, are building there is uh, more glass than anything else, and and they have been braving that and uh, still staying on to the phone. They did report, however, and were leaving the city. Uh, there was a, a, a bit of panic, and that people were trying to get out of the city. This is something that happened last time when there was a huge bomb explosion in which uh, Mullah Omar was the target, and even at that time there was panic, and people tried to flee the city. Um, uh, Kamal, hang on, we'll get uh, back to you, or you call us as you can. A uh, reminder to our viewers, it's about 10.45 in the evening in Afghanistan now. There is still uh, plenty of night uh, here for the American and the British forces to operate if they so choose to continue all night long. This attack started at around 8 o'clock, in any case, after it was dark. The picture you're looking at is coming from the north of Kabul. Uh, we have not seen much tracer fire uh, since the early hours, the early hour of the attack. Uh, but we now believe a second wave of attacks is going on in Kandahar and might uh, even be targeting uh, the Taliban leader Mohammed Omar's compound. It's not, it's not a house as such, but it's a, it's a set of buildings. I don't know if, if General Clark can hear me or not right now. Um, General, just on the cruise missile, could you almost literally program in the coordinates for a, a home and count on that missile to get there? Yes, you could. You may recall during the operation in Kosovo, we did in fact strike at the home of Serbian President Milosevic. It had a command bunker in the basement of it. It was a command and control center, and we did, in fact, strike that house. So and they can be that specific? Absolutely. And just to button up something you were talking about a moment ago, um, it, it has been just slightly less than a month since the attacks on New York and Washington. Is that enough time? Well, it's obviously enough time. They launched the attack. Is that as much time as you'd like to plan a military campaign as complicated as the one that is unfolding now. Well, this is a very doctrinal campaign as we've seen thus far in all aspects of it. As long as we have the information, we can plan an operation like this fairly quickly. It's a matter of getting the forces into position, and the forces were in position in adequate time to do it. So I think we've had enough time to do it. The question is, how much intelligence is there beyond the initial waves of strikes? And how will we be able to continue to update the target base and collect more information during the course of the campaign? And those, will be, those are imponderables right now for the military planners. We'll have to work that on a day-by-day -day basis. I assume the planners always want a little more time, but they also understand that they don't always get what they want. And uh, presumably, uh, they had enough at least to get going. Exactly. Thank you. We'll check back with you. Chris Burns, uh, in northern Afghanistan, around an area that is controlled by the Northern Alliance there. Uh, Chris? Well, there are the latest... The latest we have heard here is uh, from the Northern Alliance Command here is that the U.S. airstrikes or the Allied airstrikes have not only hit in the south but also in the north in three northern cities, very key cities, including Takar, Kunduz, and Mazar-e-Sharif. Mazar-e-Sharif is especially important to the Northern Alliance because that is a Taliban stronghold in the north. If that city falls, then much of the north will fall to the Northern Alliance. That is what they've been fighting for on several fronts, uh, fighting and pushing back, uh, at least they claim to be pushing back the Taliban and along several fronts. In fact, uh, today they said that they had taken a provincial city on the way to Mazar Sharif. Also in another province, they say they have surrounded that city. Uh, the, in the latest report, uh, the latest fighting was just before the airstrikes began. It was between 6 and 9 p.m. here. They say that they, uh, they fought Taliban forces uh, near the city of Aibek in Samangan province. They say that they took or that 180 fighters on the Taliban side surrendered. Again, very difficult for us to confirm from this end. It's a very remote region, extremely mountainous, but the fact that the Northern Alliance is reporting the uh, coalition forces striking three northern key northern cities uh, does imply and show that the Northern Alliance is working with Washington and vice versa in, in trying to destabilize and perhaps even topple the Taliban. Aaron? Okay. Chris, thank you. Uh, Mazar al-Sharif, by the way, if we show a map, is in the northernmost part 
uh, of Afghanistan. This is uh, Al Jazeera television, and we just want to hear what is going on. To God, thanks to God, supporter of the weak, oh, nation of all, oh, nation of Islam, this is a call during, for you during this critical time, uh, which distinguish between the believers and uh, the liars. This is our call for you as the nations of infidels, nations of infidels have all united against the Muslims. And before I start uh, my speech to you, I shall, I would like to ask the American people, oh, which, which his, his government pushes, pushes it against our nation. Oh, American people, can you ask yourselves why all this hate against America and against Israel? Why? All this hatred in the hearts of Americans against America. The answer is very clear and very simple, that America has committed so many uh, uh, crimes against the nation of, uh, of Muslims, unbearable and nobody could bear. America is the head of criminals uh, by creating this, the Israel. This continuous crime for 50 years, the Muslim, the Muslim nation shall not accept this uh, crime. It is your government uh, which, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, sieging the people of Iraq and ki killing them. Uh, it's your government which is supporting the uh, uh, rotten governments in our countries. Oh, American people, your government is leading you to another uh, lost, uh, losing uh, uh, war. Uh, your, your government uh, left uh, afraid from Lebanon and from Somalia and from Yemen. And uh, today, your government is leading you to another uh, lost uh, uh, battle where you would uh, lose your sons and your money and uh, let you know, American people, and let the whole world know that we shall never accept that the uh, tragedy of and Andalusia would be repeated uh, uh, in, in Palestine. Uh, we, sh uh, we, we cannot accept that uh, the uh, Palestine would become Jewish. Uh, and with regard to you, Muslims, this is the day of the big uh, uh, question. This is a new Quraysh against the uh, few uh, Amer the few uh, uh, believers. Uh, all against the Muslims in Medina. So be like the followers of uh, the Prophet, uh, peace be upon him. And Oh, oh youth, oh clergymen, lovers of God and the Prophet, this is a new battle, great uh, battle, uh, similar to the great battles of Islam, uh, like the conqueror of Jerusalem. So hurry up to the dignity of life and the eternity of death. Thanks to God. He who God guides will never lose. And I believe that there is only one God and I declare, I believe, is no prophet but Muhammad. Uh, this is America. God has sent 
أعظم مبانيها. One of attacks of by by God, and uh, it's uh, it has touched one of its uh, best buildings, and this is America filled with fear from its uh, from the north to south, uh, east to west, and thank God. And what America is tasting today is something very little of what we have tasted for decades. Our nation, uh, from uh, since nearly 80 years, is tasting this uh, uh, humility. Uh, its uh, sons are killed, and it's. Uh, and nobody answers the call. And when God uh, has guided uh, a bunch of uh, Muslims uh, to be at the forefront uh, and uh, destroyed America, a big destruction, I, uh, uh, I wish God would uh, lift their, uh, their uh, uh, position and when those people have uh, defended and uh, and retaliated to what their brothers and sisters uh, have suffered in uh, Palestine and Lebanon, uh, the whole world uh, uh, has been shouting. Uh, and there are civilian, innocent children being killed every day in Iraq without any guilt. And we never hear anybody, we never hear any fatwa from the clergymen of the uh, of the governors. And every day we see the. Um, Israeli tanks going to Jenin, Ramallah, Bejala, and other lands of Islam, and no, we never hear anybody objecting to that. So when the sword came, uh, came after eight years to America, then the whole world has been crying for uh, those uh, criminals uh, who attacked. This is the least which could be said about them. Uh, they are people. Uh, they, they supported the murder against the victim. So God has given them back what they deserve. I say uh, the, the matter is very clear. So every Muslim after this and after uh, the officials in America, starting with the uh, head of the infidels, Bush, and uh, they came out with their uh, men and equipment and they even encouraged even countries claiming to be Muslims against us. So we ran with our religion. They came out to fight Islam. Uh, with the name of fighting terrorism. People uh, at the end of the world, in Japan, hundreds of thousands uh, of people got killed. This is not uh, uh, a war crime. Or in Iraq, what, what, be, what are, uh, who are being killed in Iraq, uh, this is not a crime. And those, uh, when they were attacked in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, uh, Afghanistan and Sudan uh, were attacked. I say this, these events uh, have split the whole world into two camps, uh, the camp of uh, uh, belief and, uh, and the disbelief. So every Muslim shall take it, shall support his religion. Uh, now the winds of uh, 
of change has uh, blown up now, has come to the uh, Arabian Peninsula. And to America, I say to it and to its people this, I swear by God the Great, America will never dream, nor those who live in America will never taste security and safety unless we feel security and safety in our land and in Palestine. That from, that from Al Jazeera television, Al Jazeera uh, saying that it was shot today, when today would be an interesting question to know the answer to. It looked to be daylight to us. Having said that, that is as remarkably chilling several minutes. Osama bin Laden, this person we have seen uh, a picture of here and a picture of there, but almost never heard, almost never heard. Um, he said at one point, Americans are tasting today what we, uh, speaking of his view of the Muslim world, what we have tasted for decades, called on Muslims around the world. He said this is a battle of believers and non-believers and called on Muslims around the world to uh, join the fight. And then he said at the end, in one of those moments that really does send chills up your spine, Americans will never feel or face, I think was his words, safety and security unless we, speaking of his people, unless we and the Palestinians feel safe and secure as well. Again, Al Jazeera television saying that was shot sometime today. We don't know what time. We don't know if it was before the attacks. It looked like daylight to us. That might have been the lighting. We're not sure. But we didn't see the kinds of shadows we would have expected uh, to see as well. Peter Bergen, uh, who works with us, knows bin Laden, has written about bin Laden. Um, extraordinary moment, Peter. You just heard uh, uh, words from uh, the United States' most implacable enemy, but uh, none of those words were words he hasn't said before. I mean, uh, both he and his aide, Ayman al-Zawari, who we first heard from, uh, reiterated the common litany of complaints that they've had against the United States. I thought it was very interesting that we heard first from Ayman al-Zawari, a man that we know little about, except that, uh, and is kept very much in the, uh, the shadows, but who's coming forward much more publicly now. He's widely regarded by U.S. intelligence officials and by uh, Saudi sources and uh, uh, Saudi journalists as being really the brains of the operation. Ayman al-Zawari, an older man than bin Laden by about 10 years. This was uh, the guy, I'm sorry, uh, Peter, this was the guy sitting to the right with the glasses. Correct. Okay, correct. just so that we can orient viewers as we go here. Okay. Go ahead. I, I apologize so, for interrupting. No problem. So he, the fact that Ayman al-Zawari started talking first, uh, uh, reiterated uh, al-Qaeda's complaints against America I thought was significant. Uh, he's the man who's really radicalized bin Laden uh, and <clears throat> has been a, a, professional, a professional revolutionary for about uh, since the 1970s. Uh, bin Laden went on to, uh, uh, to say something he said in the past uh, about the embassy bombings in, in Africa. He, he used the same formula. He said we want to give Americans something of what the Muslims have tasted. Uh, he made the same observations about the World Trade Center attack. So uh, it goes with a lot of the statements they've said in the past. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, we're hearing from America's most implacable enemy uh, and somebody who is not intimidated uh, by these attacks. Uh, obviously, somebody who's been planning this for some time. Well, I agree. Uh, it's nothing we haven't heard before. But in the context of what's going on and what has gone on, um, the whole thing I thought was chilling. Thank you, Peter. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon, and we might add here we should get a Pentagon briefing perhaps within the half hour. Uh, Jamie, you've got uh, something you can pass along now. I have some new details, uh, Aaron, about what's going on now with these ongoing strikes. Pentagon sources tell CNN that these strikes will include attacks from long-range U.S. bombers, including B-2 bombers flying out of Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Also, B-1 and B-52 bombers, both flying out of the British base of Diego Garcia, uh, using uh, 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 sometimes satellite-guided munitions and sometimes uh, carpet bombing against some of the uh, positions, including some training camps in Afghanistan. Uh, these attacks now, I'm told, will continue through the night, probably another five hours of attacks. So this is a very substantial 
uh, attack that is being mounted from the air, both from uh, uh, sea launch cruise missiles, carrier-based aircraft, and also now we're told long-range bombers, some flying from the United States. The B-2 using the, the JDAM, or Joint Direct Attack Munition, which is guided by GPS, extremely accurate. But we're also told that the B-52s and B-1s may be involved in some carpet bombing, much as they did in Operation Desert Fox for the B-1s, and the B-52s in uh, Kosovo were also used to bomb fielded forces uh, with carpet bombing. In addition, Pentagon sources tell CNN that there will be at least one food drop during this uh, uh, mission to Afghan refugees of uh, humanitarian daily rations, specially uh, configured for a relief effort, will be dropped from a C-17 uh, to uh, refugees in camps in Afghanistan, uh, and then those food drops will continue in the days to come. So uh, it does look like this is a very substantial attack, all from the air. There's no indication now that there'll be any U.S. troops put in on the ground in Afghanistan. Jamie, a uh, uh, quick point here. Are you able to confirm uh, from the Pentagon's and this second wave of attacks on Kandahar? Well, I think we're beyond the second wave. I think okay. we're into, we're going to have, uh, as I said, we're going to have waves all night. This is going to continue for the, the next, next four or five hours so until gone. dawn comes. So expect a night of heavy bombing in okay. Afghanistan. Um, let me go. Uh, Jamie, thanks. We'll get back uh, to the Pentagon. Again, we expect the Secretary of Defense, uh, perhaps the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs as well. Okay to brief a little bit uh, later. Christian Amanpour in Islamabad. Christian. Well, there has been a meeting of the cabinet, as I told you a little bit earlier, and they've come out with a statement saying that Pakistan regrets the diplomatic efforts to convince the Taliban to uh, meet the demands of the international community have not succeeded and that now military action is underway. The foreign ministry spokesman said that Pakistan had done whatever it could to convince the Taliban leadership of the gravity of the situation and to take the right decisions on behalf of the Afghan people. He also went on to say that it remains our hope that the U.S. and allied action remains clearly targeted on the uh, uh, aims identified, the military objectives identified in the fight on terrorism as identified by the U.N. resolutions and that care will be taken to minimize any damage and harm coming to the Afghan people. Also going on to say that they hope the operations will end soon and that a concerted international effort will be undertaken to promote reconstruction and national reconciliation and to help Afghanistan uh, continue. We also, just in terms of describing what you've been talking about, that Osama bin Laden tape, it looked very much to those of us watching it here that it was shot in daylight. It looked very, very professionally shot. This was no fly-by-night small, you know, uh, VHS camera. It looked like a very professional uh, news release if you like and all the same things that have been Osama bin Laden's gripes in the past uh, were repeated again the issue of the Israeli Palestinian situation the Iraqis are uh, suffering as he said in Iraq and also uh, he talked about US support for uh, what he called uh, corrupt regimes in the region so this was very much what we've heard over and over again by Osama bin Laden notably also he was in a uh, combat Bad jacket and there was an AK-47 gun nearby. He was, as you've pointed out, uh, accompanied by al-Zawahiri, who used to be the head of Islamic uh, Jihad from Egypt, also implicated in the assassination of Anwar Sadat, and a very close ally, and they say the military brains of the al-Qaeda network. Here in Pakistan, we have been talking to a lot of people, and they very clearly distance themselves, as Muslims do many of them around the world, from the kind of radicalism that has been espoused, and they clearly distance themselves from that kind of attack that took place on the United States. So the implication that he is speaking on behalf of Muslims does not necessarily resonate with most of the Muslim people that we've spoken to. Aaron? Christian, thank you very much. I wonder, um, just uh, one more quote or two from the Bin Laden um, statement, uh, if you will. He said at one point after listing literally 80 years of grievances uh, extending from Iraq in the near term to Palestine, Israel, uh, long before it was Israel, in fact, they are the people talking now about the Americans who supported the murder against victims. So God, speaking now of the terrorist attacks in New York, now almost a month ago, God has given back to them what they deserve. Matthew Chance is in northern Afghanistan uh, reporting on what he's been seeing. He's had a fairly good view, in fact, 
uh, the fighting that's been going on, if fighting is in fact the right word of the attack. Matthew? That's right, Aaron. In fact, I'm just a, a few kilometers from the front line of the Taliban uh, positions and here uh, with the Northern Alliance forces, about 20 kilometers, about 12 miles or so uh, from the outskirts of the Afghan capital, Kabul. I can tell you that according to commanders of the Northern Alliance, the order has been given here to begin a bombardment of Taliban positions, the positions north of Kabul, that is, in the last few minutes, that bombardment has well and truly uh, got underway. Every few uh, uh, moments, there is uh, a big, uh, uh, loud explosion and a, a, a whoosh of red light uh, exploding on the horizon onto the hillside, uh, about uh, two kilometers, as I say, uh, from where uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm standing right now at my vantage point. I can't actually see uh, the outskirts of Kabul right now. Uh, that's blocked by a mountain which essentially marks the boundary between the area which is under Taliban control and the area which is under this anti-Taliban Northern Alliance uh, opposition. Just to give you some more details about uh, what commanders uh, here on the ground from the Northern Alliance are saying about the US and, uh, and British uh, attacks. Is that they say, according to their intelligence coming out of the Taliban controlled areas, there have been at least uh, seven locations around Afghanistan uh, targeted, including, of course, Kabul and Kandahar, uh, but as well uh, Mazar al-Sharif in the north of the country, Jal Jalalabad in the east, and a number of other locations across uh, northern Afghanistan. Now, uh, just to go back to this artillery bombardment, it appears to have gone uh, quiet for the moment, but you know, that bombardment is pretty sporadic. They say they, they're working on the uh, uh, direct orders of their political leadership, uh, the political leadership of the Northern Lions, and, and they say that they're working in cooperation uh, with the United States to decide uh, how and when to proceed to their ultimate objective, which is, of course, Aaron, an advance on Kabul and the seizing of power in Kabul itself. Back to you. Matthew, thank you. Uh, stand by a second. Again, we want to uh, let viewers uh, know that it is uh, eight and a half hours ahead of, of East Coast time, so it's a little bit after uh, 11 o'clock in uh, Afghanistan now. Uh, Christian Amanpour is in Islamabad, Pakistan, on the border. Obviously, a critical point now. Christian? Well, here in the capital, this is the center of all the diplomatic watching and the diplomatic uh, affairs here. We have confirmed now from Pakistani sources saying that Pakistani airspace was used uh, during and presumably is being used during the attacks on Afghanistan tonight. We also have had a statement from the Taliban ambassador just within the last few moments here in uh, Islamabad saying that he acknowledges that attacks are underway on Kabul and very short statement saying that the Taliban had repeatedly asked for talks uh, with the United States but were refused. Of course, you know that there have been delegations and missions sent from Pakistan to the Taliban leadership over the last couple of weeks, which yielded absolutely nothing. A quote by the um, uh, ambassador here that's been quoted by the wire sources. We haven't confirmed this ourselves yet because he gave us a very, very short statement saying that he believed Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden are still alive. Aaron? Christian, thank you very much. And we'll be back to you. I wonder if we can go to General Clark for, on a couple of points. Um, General, uh, going back to Jamie McIntyre's reporting, um, three things came to my mind. Number one, I, not surprising these attacks would go on all night. Uh, the importance of these first hours, both militarily and psychologically. Well, it's important to do as much as you can as rapidly as possible because there is a shock effect from this that is above and beyond the physical damage to the targets. And so what uh, the United States forces would obviously like to do is not only strike the targets, but demoralize the, the Taliban leadership and all of the followers there. The significance, if any, of using American-based B-2 bombers, we talked about this, I think, when we were on the phone a little bit on Friday. Uh, these are very long flights. They are long flights. Uh, the crews are trained for it. The aircraft are capable of it. And uh, it's primarily for logistical reasons. The aircraft is best supported from the United States from its home base. And this, is, uh, this has been the experience now in, in Kosovo as well as, I guess, here. Um, any particular reason why, given that it is a somewhat more challenging uh, effort on behalf of the crews, why use that plane in the early moments of this battle? Well, it has a, a very, very fine targeting system. 
It's very okay, General, good. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, and I hate doing it. Uh, the Secretary of Defense has just walked in to the Pentagon. He's about to start his briefing. He has just got back in the country on Saturday. It's Donald Rumsfeld. Terrorism will be broad, sustained, and that we will use every element of American influence and power. Today, the President has turned to direct, overt, military force to complement the economic, humanitarian, financial, and diplomatic activities which are already well underway. The effect we hope to achieve through these raids, which together with our coalition partners we have initiated today, is to create conditions for sustained anti-terrorist and humanitarian relief operations in Afghanistan. That requires that, among other things, we first remove the threat from air defenses and from Taliban aircraft. We also seek to raise the cost of doing business for foreign terrorists who have chosen Afghanistan from which to organize their activities and for the oppressive Taliban regime that continues to tolerate terrorist presence in those portions of Afghanistan which they control. The current military operations are focused on achieving several outcomes. To make clear to the Taliban leaders and their supporters that harboring terrorists is unacceptable and carries a price. To acquire intelligence to facilitate future operations against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban regime that harbors the terrorists. To develop relationships with groups in Afghanistan that oppose the tel Taliban regime and the foreign terrorists that they support, to make it increasingly difficult for the terrorists to use Afghanistan freely as a base of operation, and to alter the military balance over time by denying to the Taliban the offensive systems that hamper the progress of the various opposition forces, and to provide humanitarian relief to Afghans suffering truly oppressive living conditions under the Taliban regime. I want to reiterate a point that President Bush has made often and that he made again today in his remarks. The United States has organized armed coalitions on several occasions since the Cold War for the purpose of denying hostile regimes the opportunity to oppress their own people and other people. In Kuwait, in northern Iraq, in Somalia, Bosnia, and Kosovo, the United States took action on behalf of Muslim populations against outside invaders and oppressive regimes. The same is true today. We stand with those Afghans who are being repressed by a regime that abuses the very people it purports to lead and that harbors terrorists who have attacked and killed thousands of innocents around the world of all religions of all races and of all nationalities. While our raids today focus on the Taliban and the foreign terrorists in Afghanistan, our aim remains much broader. Our objective is to defeat those who use terrorism and those who house or support them. The world stands united in this effort. It is not about a religion or an individual terrorist or a country. Our partners in this effort represent nations and peoples of all cultures, all religions, and all races. We share the belief that terrorism is a cancer on the human condition, and we intend to oppose it wherever it is. The operation today involved a variety of weapon systems, and it originated from a number of separate locations. We used land and sea-based aircraft, surface ships, and submarines and we employed a variety of weapons to achieve our objectives. As President Bush mentioned in his statement, dozens of countries contributed in specific ways to this mission, including transit and landing rights, basing opportunities, and intelligence support. In this mission, we are particularly grateful for the direct military involvement of the forces of Great Britain. To achieve the outcomes we seek, it is important to go after air defense and Taliban aircraft. We need the freedom to operate 
on the ground and in the air and the targets selected if select successfully destroyed should permit an increasing de in degree of freedom over time. We have also targeted command facilities for those forces that we know support terrorist elements within Afghanistan and critical terrorist sites. President Bush has repeatedly emphasized that we will hold accountable any who help terrorists as well as the terrorists themselves. Before I take your questions, let me say that to say that these attacks are in any way against Afghanistan or the Afghan people is flat wrong. We support the Afghan people against the Al-Qaeda, a foreign presence on their land, and against the Taliban regime that supports them. What took place today and what will be taking place in the period ahead is a part of the measured and broad and sustained effort that the President announced shortly after the attacks on September 11th. General Myers, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, will make a few remarks before we respond to questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I know you have many questions I ask, so I'll keep my, my comments brief. As the Secretary said, today our forces have begun the initial part of military operations in the war against terrorism. About 15 land-based bombers, some 25 strike aircraft from carriers, and U.S. and British ships and submarines launching approximately 50 Tomahawk missiles have struck targets, terrorist targets, in Afghanistan. The first target was hit at approximately 12.30 Eastern Standard Time, and operations continue as we speak. As the Secretary said, these efforts are designed to disrupt and destroy terrorist activities in Afghanistan and to set the conditions for future military action as well as to bring much needed food and medical aid uh, to the people of Afghanistan. I want to remind you that while today's operations are visible, many other operations may not be so visible. But visible or not, our friends and enemies should understand that all instruments of our national power, as well as those of our friends and allies around the world, are being brought to bear on this global menace. We are in the early stages of ongoing combat operations, and our outstanding men and women in uniform are performing just as they have been trained to do, and that is to say, superbly. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to take your questions. Mr. Secretary, I don't mind I ask, uh, without, I know you don't want to give too many details, especially early on. Uh, you said 15 land-based bombers, approximately 50. Could you tell us whether uh, B-1s, B-52s, and B-2s were used in this? They were. B-2s were used. And did you hit, uh, we're told you hit a broad range of targets. Did you hit air bases? Uh, did, did you attack uh, uh, Taliban uh, jets and air bases? Well, as I indicated in my remarks, the, it is certainly necessary if one is going to engage in humanitarian activities that involve the air or the ground that, that uh, the you, one would not want to try to do that as long as the Taliban had aircraft or air defense systems that could pose a threat to U.S. Uh, personnel. Just one, I'm sorry, one brief follow-up. Did the B-2s, were they flying round trip from the United States as they had been on the Kosovo operation? Yes, yes, they yes, flew they from were. the continental United States. Can you tell us how extensive the humanitarian effort has been thus far, and how many C-17s worth of, of uh, th various types of refugee food and blankets and medicine are you dropping? Is there some way to it quantify is, it? it? It started, um, oh, 20 or 30 minutes ago, and is just in its beginning. Uh, stages. Can you give us some description of how many tons of uh, food and medicine you're trying to deliver? Well, we could. Uh, it, 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 as I say, it's in the beginning stages, and this is a, a first day. Um, the first day 
was something like 37,000 rations, as I recall, 37,500. But uh, whether or not that will all get delivered uh, is is something we won't know for a few hours. It includes more than just food, is that correct? It does include some uh, medicines and that uh, type of thing. General Myers, can you give us a sense of the, the weapons being dropped by the bombers? The secretary said this is not an attack against the Afghan people. That would be flat wrong. If said that presupposes we're using precision-guided weapons to avoid casualties. All three of those bombers you mentioned can drop these JDAM satellite bombs. Is that the sort of ordinance being dropped today? Uh, we are uh, using, or essentially have at, at hand, uh, all our conventional munitions, but you're right, Tony, that uh, the majority of them are uh, precision uh, weapons, but not exclusively, because some targets, we try to match uh, targets and weapons and their effects. Mr. Yes, Secretary, um, you said, and General Meyer said, that the Raids have been ongoing now for about two and a half hours, but using 50 T lambs, uh, one would assume that there, there is an end to this initial phase. Can you tell us if this initial phase is going to go on much longer, or is it for all intents and purposes over as of this point? Is it? it is not yet over. Secretary, Secretary could, uh, no. it was uh, Osama bin Laden uh, targeted in this raid, and uh, can you give us understanding that it's still early? Any preliminary uh, assessment of how successful these attacks? Are? No, it's far too early to, to try to measure success, and and the answer is no with respect to him. Uh, this is not about a single individual; it's about uh, a, an entire terrorist network and multiple terrorist networks across the globe. Um, uh, we, we would not have uh, actual um, reports on the success of the various attacks for some time. Mr. Secretary, are the airdrops uh, that have, you say, just begun, will that be a continuous operation or is this a one-time effort? Well, uh, the, the President's approach to this is that it will be continuous but that it will be broadly based and it will be economic and political and diplomatic uh, as well as military, overt and covert. And the fact that one sees a cruise missile on television at one moment and does not at another moment ought not to suggest that the, the pressure and the president's approach to this is anything but continuous. It is continuous. The humanitarian part, I was referring to the airdrops. Is that to the, be continuous? It, it, I don't know quite what continuous means. 24-hour days, seven days a week? No, unlikely. Uh, on the other hand, once once there is an opportunity to begin the, the humanitarian effort on the ground, I suppose it could be characterized as, as continuous. Secretary, Secretary, was this, is this, uh, can you give us any idea whether or not this is, uh, I know it's still ongoing, but is this essentially a one day operation in this phase or will it should we expect that there'll be more activity tomorrow and the so second part will the United States impose a essentially a no-fly zone over Afghanistan as it did over Bosnia and Iraq in the past I think then rather than trying to characterize what the United States is going to do on any given day uh, in in advance that I would prefer to to uh, say that that this effort will continue in a variety of different ways uh, over a sustained period of time and that we intend to uh, pursue it until such time as we're satisfied that those terrorist networks don't exist that they have been destroyed no fly zone section um, I don't know that I'd want to characterize it as that, although certainly uh, one would think that if you, your, one of your early objectives is to uh, deal with their aircraft and their air defense system, uh, Mr. Secretary, it, it, it very likely would, would uh, reduce the number of Taliban aircraft flying around over Afghanistan, I would hope, yes. Have you seen any response so far from the Taliban military? Have they flown? Have they uh, launched anything? Have Too they... early. Too early to know. Mr. No, Secretary, Mr. the Taliban has basically boasted that Osama bin Laden is still alive as well as uh, Mullah Mo uh, Mohammed Omar. What would you say to them about that sort of a boast? Well, the Taliban, since the uh, beginning of this, have, have been uh, uh, rejected every uh, suggestion, request, or demand made by the United States of America and the coalition partners. Uh, they have uh, established themselves as being uh, firmly connected to uh, al-Qaeda and, and the foreign presence in their country. They've made a choice. And I don't know that uh, there's anything to say beyond that, that uh, they are what they are. 
and they're bringing great harm to the Afghan people. You expect the United States to... Can you say anything about the Northern Alliance? Was this coordinated with them? And are they picking up any ground or as a result of this, or are they linking up with U.S. forces? Can you give us any sense of what's going on on the ground? Sure. There, there are a number of uh, elements on the ground in Afghanistan, Afghan people, in the Northern Alliance, in the tribes in the South, even some within Taliban that do not favor Omar and do not favor the Al-Qaeda and would wish they were no longer in their country. Uh, certainly our interest is to strengthen those forces that are opposed to Al-Qaeda and opposed to the Taliban leadership that is so intimately connected to them and to uh, strengthen all of those forces so that they uh, will have better opportunities to prevail and to uh, deal with what obviously is a, a regime that is enormously harmful to the Afghan people and, and poses threats to people all across this globe, including the United States of America. Do you plan to put ground troops in Afghanistan? Do you plan to put ground troops in Afghanistan? It's been said many times in the podium that there just aren't that many targets in Afghanistan. Apparently you found <coughs> some. Can you explain that? And also, can you address what seems to be somewhat of an anomaly in this mission, the idea that you're fighting your way in in order to drop humanitarian relief on people. And if the people, if the places where you're dropping relief, if you're getting shot at there, are you not essentially dropping relief on the enemy? Well, first, with respect to uh, uh, the targets, I think I've said repeatedly from this podium that there are not a lot of high-value targets. I pointed out that the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda do not have armies, navies, and air forces. And uh, that's clear. They don't. Uh, I've therefore characterized this conflict, this campaign, this so-called war, as being notably different from others. Uh, and it means that what we have to do is exactly what I said in my earlier remarks. We have to create the conditions for a sustained effort that will assist those forces in the country that are opposed to Taliban and opposed to Al-Qaeda. And we have to do it in a variety of different ways. We have to dry up their bank accounts. We have to bring political, diplomatic pressure to bear on them. Uh, we have to bring economic pressure to bear. And to the extent we can, um, use uh, overt as well as covert activities to improve target information to gather intelligence that will enable us to be more precise in what we do and to force people to move and change uh, what they're doing, uh, to raise the cost of what they're doing, to attempt to uh, reduce the number of people around the globe who support them and finance them. All of that helps. Uh, the, fact that the, the fact is, in this battle against terrorism, there is no silver bullet. There is no single thing that is going to, to suddenly make it, that threat disappear. Ultimately, they're going to collapse from within, and they're going to collapse from within because of the full combination of all of the resources from all of the countries that are brought to bear on these networks. Uh, and and that, that is what will constitute victory. General Myers, have ground you ground troops, yes. Yes. Will, you be, will you be providing uh, uh, arms and air cover to the opposition uh, forces to strengthen them? And As I uh, say, I don't think we, we, our, our goal is to, is to make them more successful. Getting into exactly how we'll do that, I think I'll, I'll defer. You can oh, send U.S. ground troops into yes. Afghanistan. Yes. You said a moment ago, you spoke of multiple terrorist networks in multiple countries. Is this phase of the operation going to involve strikes in some other places other than Afghanistan? As you know, we've had a policy here, at least during my tenure, where we don't discuss <laughs> ongoing operations and we don't discuss intelligence matters. Do you yes. plan to put U.S. ground troops yes. into yes. Yugoslavia? Yes. Go ahead. Please describe the Taliban anti-aircraft systems <laughs> that are running as a AAA surface-to-air missiles, and have any of the American uh, uh, aircraft been uh, damaged or brought down? We have we have no information that any American aircraft has been damaged or brought down at this moment, uh, at least prior to the time I walked in here. Uh, there is, we, as uh, I believe Dick Myers has pointed out, they do have a limited number of uh, surface-to-air missiles, and they have more than a limited number of uh, man-operated, uh, man-mobile uh, surface-to-air missiles. Mr. Secretary, could you give us a sense of how many targets you've hit? More than no, a dozen? There's no way to discuss the outcome of this operation. Yes, Tom. <coughs> um, are U.S. forces on the ground in Afghanistan now? And more broadly, could you illuminate if at all the so-called less visible side of this operation? 
Not really. Uh, if we wanted it to be overt, we would have discussed it. And yes. I, 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 I a question about the ground forces, please. My first part was, are there, ground, are there U.S. If, forces if, on the ground if, in Afghanistan? If we had, um, how to phrase this so that it, it's perfectly clear again, um, we have not, <laughs> um, I, I mean, the yeah, I mean, we've got, we've got, I'm disinclined to talk about things that are in process, and uh, um, if we had significant numbers of, of U.S. military on the ground, uh, it would have been known by now. Do you plan to send the decision to the airdrops? Is that predicated on some level of confidence that you've taken out at least some of that air defense threat? We certainly would not be using airdrops in portions of the country where we were not satisfied that it would be safe. For, for humanitarian relations. Uh, Secretary. So we don't discuss operational activities. Mr. Secretary, do you have any, can you tell us, is there any plans to send that, significant numbers of I ground? answered the question before you asked it. We do, <laughs> we, we do not discuss operations. Uh, very much of the country is, is in the, at least controlled now by the Taliban. Does that mean that, and a lot of, most of the refugees actually are, are internally displaced people are in those sections of the country. Does that mean that uh, those areas will not get the relief or as quickly? That other non-Taliban held areas will get it more quickly? Well, certainly, uh, non-Taliban areas would get it more quickly. Mr. Secretary, yes. can we define a little bit about the uh, humanitarian airdrops? Are these going to be, for the most part, high-altitude airdrops? Are going to use pallets or parachutes or just kick them out the way we did over Kosovo and Bosnia? Uh, it's, it's more like the latter, but uh, greatly improved. We know the effectiveness of those airdrops was less than desired. So between now and then, they have been working with the delivery means uh, to improve that. We think we can be uh, fairly effectively, effective from high altitude, and we're targeting uh, remote locations where it's difficult to get uh, uh, trucks in. This has all been coordinated uh, fairly well and very well with uh, USAID. Just follow up. You're not just kicking out the rations, though, by themselves. They're coming down by a parachute or some means to the ground, or are they? No, the delivery mode is... Uh, is uh, like, pretty much like you described, a little more sophisticated than that, but it's not by parachute. Or C C C C yes. Is there a danger posed to the um, people on the ground that you're trying to help um, as, the, as the humanitarian aid comes in? Are you exposing them to fire, or are these two operations wholly separate? If there is no risk to the people on the ground that are, ha would have an interest in receiving the humanitarian drops. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Secretary were C-17s used to drop the humanitarian daily rations today, and if so, how many? Uh, there were two C-17s planned today to drop humanitarian that rations. That was 100% of what was carrying the HDR? For the first day, that's correct. How can you drop them from high altitude? How can you drop them from high altitude? I mean, it's a layperson's question without using parachutes and not, and not destroy them. I mean... Well the, well, the system has been designed to do just that, and like I said, they've been testing ever since Allied Force stopped. Shortly after that, we began testing to make sure we could accurately deliver these, and uh, and that's been ongoing. We'll be able to put them where we want to put them. Well, pushing so that they correct. General, don't Secretary, they have precision guide, precision radars that can map an area and kind of drop it within a certain bullseye? <laughs> well, let me just go back. We have uh, high confidence they'll be able to drop where where their intended uh, uh, Af Afghan citizens are, and uh, there are several ways to do that. Absolutely. As part of the effort today, uh, are you dropping leaflets? Have you begun radio broadcast from Commando Solo and some of the other assets that you have that can do directed messages to the people who may not understand what you're doing? Yes. Yes. Today, both of those. Yes. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, Secretary, you said, are you asking, sir, the non-Taliban to uh, form uh, a government, or are you waiting for the total defeat of Taliban? That really is the business of the Department of State, uh, and the, what, what we are doing is we are attempting to help those and, and advantage the, those that oppose Taliban and that oppose Al-Qaeda in that country in a variety of different ways. And uh, 
how that might evolve and mean, what that might mean from the standpoint of the future of Afghanistan, it seems to me is a good distance off, and it is not an issue that, that this department really uh, uh, is involved in. Mr. Mr. Secretary, Secretary, are, are additional steps being taken to strengthen security in the United States in anticipation of some possible retaliation for this attack? Well, most of the kinds of attacks that we've seen uh, tend to have been planned months and months and months, in some cases years in advance. So the idea that any attack that could occur now would conceivably characterize as in retaliation for something I think would be a misunderstanding of the situation. The uh, United States is, as President Bush has uh, indicated, is on a state of heightened awareness and the armed forces around the world uh, are on a state of higher alert than is normal. The forces in the United States are on a, uh, a higher alert than is, has been the normal pattern for our forces. And uh, the various organizations that deal with uh, law enforcement in the United States, the FBI and, and uh, state and local officials are certainly aware that uh, as of September 11th we have to be sensitive to the possibility that there can be uh, various types of terrorist attacks in our country and as a result the president has marshaled a great many of the capabilities of the United States government including the military to assist in, in uh, seeing that we do what is possible but the the only way to deal with these terrorist threats is to go at them where they exist. You cannot defend at every place, at every time, against every conceivable, imaginable, even unimaginable terrorist attack. And the only way to deal with it is to take the battle to where they are and to root them out and to starve them out by seeing that those countries and those organizations and those non-governmental organizations and those individuals that are supporting and hiring, ha harboring and facilitating uh, these networks uh, stop doing it and find that there's a penalty for doing it. So we'll make this the last question, right in the middle. Yes, sir. Apparently there were strikes in uh, Kandahar and Kabul, and there's some I'll talk about the electricity system going down. Are you running the risk of being characterized as attacking the Afghan people rather than the military targets? You know, in, in this world of ours, if you get up in the morning, you're running a risk of having someone lie and someone mischaracterize what it is you're doing. What the United States of America is doing is exactly what I said. It is attempting to defend the United States by taking this battle to the terrorists that have killed thousands of Americans and that threaten not just the United States, but regimes throughout the, the world uh, because they are determined to uh, find ways to intimidate the rest of the world and to terrorize the rest of the world. And we are determined not to be terrorized. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, at the end, as steely as we can ever recall uh, hearing in, the United States government will take this battle to the terrorists. The Secretary saying that is the only way to fight terrorism. You can't defend every possible target everywhere in the world. There is only one way, that is to go get them, to starve them out, to use his words. He described this early attack as to create the conditions for a sustained anti-terrorist and humanitarian relief effort, and that relief effort is underway. General Myers, the newly installed uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, formally confirming what we've been reporting to you that this involved both land-based and sea-based cruise missiles, Tomahawk missiles, uh, 15 land-based aircraft, 25 carrier-based aircraft. Um, also in the mix, uh, two C-17s uh, which are being used uh, to drop humanitarian aid uh, where it uh, can be most helpful. The Secretary saying, as every administration official has said all along, this is not an attack on Islam, it is an attack on terrorism. Uh, that is a very brief overview, but I'd like to bring in uh, both of our uh, generals here, both of our military experts, uh, because they often hear things in these moments that we do not. Uh, General Shepard, General Clark, General Clark, let me start with you since uh, you're closer to me here in Atlanta. What did you hear from the Secretary? Well, it was a very straightforward account of what uh, has been done. 
He doesn't have the details on what the target results are, of course, because those those results wouldn't come in for several hours, of course. We don't know that the, when the attacks would stop because it's an open-ended attack, and we're not sure what the remaining set of targets will be because there are many parts of this operation that are not disclosed. So he's confirming uh, about what's been reported in the news media, uh, and he's making it very clear that, that, that this is a very powerful attack. It's going to be sustained. It's going to have many different aspects, to, some of which we're not going to see. And so this is the, the military part. But I think the other aspect of what he's trying to say is that the military part is only part. And we're not going to win the war on terrorism strictly by military actions alone. It's what many people have said from the outset, that this is a much broader uh, effort that involves intelligence and police activities and so forth by coalition and cooperation by many countries. And what we're seeing today and focused on today is just part of the response to the attacks of September 11. Okay, General, stand by. Let me go to General Shepard. Uh, let me give you the same open-ended question. Did you hear anything in there that the rest of us might have glazed over, not noted, that uh, was a code or anything of the sort? Well, all of us are used to listening not only what's said, but how it's said and what's not said. One thing that was, uh, it did come up there, he talked about mainly conventional means, and this was General Myers. Mainly. He was not referring to the use of nuclear weapons. What he was talking about was the other things, the humanitarian and perhaps the special operations. He did not, he was not indicating that perhaps nuclear weapons were involved in this at all. Okay, that got our attention. Thank you. Uh, General Shepard, a couple specific uh, airplane related questions, if you will. Um, B-52s from Diego Garcia. B-52s are, uh, are the, correct me on this, I know you will, they're about the oldest of the big bombers we have, right? They've been around for a long, long time. Yeah, they're older than some of the pilots that are flying them, but they have had a lot of work and modernization done on them. They essentially have been converted from a nuclear weapons uh, delivery mechanism to conventional weapons and a standoff platform. Uh, they are very modern and they're very good and very, very useful airplanes. And they go back, and at least in my recollection, I think they go back further than Vietnam, but they were heavily used in Vietnam. Uh, very heavily used and on long-range strikes. In Vietnam, we operated from Guam which, by the way, is much closer to Vietnam than Diego Garcia is uh, uh, to Afghanistan. That's about 2,000 miles, so these are long flights. And also, they mentioned the B-2 from the United States. Those round-trip flights are as much as 24 hours. It's a long way for our bomber crews, Aaron. And for those of us who can't imagine how that works, a 24-hour flight where they put several crews on board? Uh, we would really like to have that capability. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the uh, B-1, you have a little room. In the B-52, you've got some room to do that. In the B-2, you do not. You've got place for two people in there. So it's uh, uh, those two people against a long flight. And uh, it, it is indeed very long and very taxing. So they're expected to stay awake, stay alert, and stay in control for a 24-hour flight. Yes, and they trained to do that. I remember receiving a Pentagon briefing long ago in which they were zeroing in on the young man that made a round-trip flight uh, uh, in a, uh, in a uh, B-52 during the Gulf War saying, well, how did you stay awake? Did you take pills? And he said, no, sir, we had some Gatorade. Uh, these kids are well trained and they practice this all the time. I'll, be, I, I'll bet they are. It's tough to practice not sleeping. General, stand by. Back to General Clark for a second. I want to go back, uh, sir, about an hour. Uh, maybe it's a little less than that. When we heard from Al Jazeera TV in the Middle East, the Osama bin Laden statement, uh, significant to you, I watched you watch that, significant to you on a couple scores. It was significant. Uh, first of all, it was looked to me like it was uh, pre-taped, pre uh, looked like daylight there. Uh, it was a rehearsed statement. It was pre-positioned somewhere, presumably uh, outside of Afghanistan. It was ready to be used whenever these attacks began. So. He was expecting it, and he's using the attacks as a springboard to put forth his own campaign to rally, in his view, uh, the, the cause of Islam to his side. So he's trying to work to make this a matter of struggle between faiths, whereas Secretary Rumsfeld has said very clearly that it is not. Well, and it's hardly surprising that he would do that. That's I mean, the, the timing may be surprising, uh, but there was nothing surprising about either the language he chose or the message he used. No, it's vintage. I mean, he's used that language and, and that type of message many, many times. What is surprising is the way it was positioned and ready to go and, and shown on the 
uh, Arab television network Al Jazeera just so soon after the attacks. You know, I, and maybe both of you uh, uh, gentlemen can weigh in here. Um, Al Jazeera, in, for those who may have just joined us, Al Jazeera is a major television outlet in the Middle East that we at CNN do have, um, an agree have agreements with to, to use their material. Um, they are not always the favorite source of information for the State Department, the United States State Department. They have been broadcasting much of what you've been seeing throughout the afternoon across the Middle East. They carried the President's statement at about 1 o'clock uh, Eastern Time. They carried Tony Blair's statement. They obviously carried the Bin Laden statement. I'm not sure if they carried the Rumsfeld press conference, but that I'm told they did. So in the Middle East, those people with TVs or access to TVs, and obviously that's not every home, but it might very well be every village, uh, we've seen that a lot in the world, are hearing broadly what the world is saying. Um, generals, uh, obviously you would have preferred they had not heard Bin Laden. You, you, this is uh, Al Jazeera TV now in the, in the right hand box on your screen. Um, you, you might, obviously you would have preferred they not air the Bin Laden statement, I'll give you that. But you must be pleased, uh, from a military point of view, even in terms of the propaganda campaign, uh, the information campaign, that they are carrying broadly the American or the Western side, however you want to phrase it. I think that is important, and, and it is good to see that the Western side is carried. I, I think that in these campaigns, uh, the truth ultimately uh, rings sound throughout, throughout all, the, all the world, and people can tell when it's just a propaganda statement. And so. Uh, although they've heard Osama bin Laden, uh, this will ring increasingly hollow as more and more of the evidence against him comes out and more uh, uh, discussion occurs throughout the world, and we see how precise these U.S. strikes have been. And uh, General Shepard, anything you want to add to that? Or, uh... Well, I think uh, this is the world of television, and it's going to come from all, from all directions with all kinds of information, whether we like it or not. It's important for the world and the American people to see and know what we're doing without operational details that put our troops in danger. The message is that at the same time we are dropping bombs on targets, we are dropping food to sustain individuals out there. We want that message to get out, and I'm sure it will. And uh, on the subject of making sure none of us says anything that gets our troops in danger, I don't know what uh, Al Jazeera's policy is, but I know what ours is. We are very very careful on this sort of stuff. We don't uh, deal in real-time movements at all. Uh, there are times, um, I know, when there, there seems to be a tension between military planners and reporters, but um, you need to believe us, I think, on this one, that we are very careful. We understand the stakes um, as we go about the business of trying to report what's going on. Gentlemen, uh, we'll be hearing more from you. Thank you both. John King, our senior White House correspondent, is now on station at the White House. He's been working his sources. John, what have you learned? Well, Aaron, the president is being updated constantly on the ongoing operation. He, was with, he is with his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice. The Situation Room here at the White House obviously plugged in to all the incoming feeds, information from the Pentagon, from U.S. military assets deployed around the world at this moment. The president also, we are told, has made a round of phone calls and will make more in the minutes and hours ahead. Already he is in double digits in the number of world leaders he has spoken to. Once the U.S. strikes were authorized, the president spoke to King Abdullah of Jordan, the Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, the Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, Jean Chrétien, the Prime Minister of Canada, Jacques Chirac, the President of France, Vladimir Putin, the Russian President, and Gerhard Schroeder, the German Chancellor. Also calls to the leader of Uzbekistan, other calls to the region planned, we are told, in the minutes and hours ahead. This one interesting bit, Aaron, we are told from sources that the President notified congressional leaders mm -hmm. last night. One, he contacted the House Democratic leader, Dick Gephardt. Our source is telling us Mr. Gephardt in Baltimore at Camden Yards for Cal Ripken's last game as a member of the Baltimore Orioles. At 7.30 p.m. Washington time last night, the president informed leader Gephardt he had given the Pentagon the okay for this operation, the go order, as soon as the military felt it was the right moment to launch. So the president issuing that order, not today, but last night. Obviously, the strikes playing out today. 
the president at this moment, as I noted, being updated on all the developments. I just wanted to add before taking your questions, you're just asking the, the military guests about Al Jazeera television. Remember, that network is based in Gutter. The Emir of Gutter was here at the White House and at the State Department just the other day. One of the stern messages from the United States was, if you are going to cover from inside Afghanistan and put that message on the air, you better well put the message of the United States on your airwaves as well. Well, they have done that much. Whether they would have otherwise or not, we can't know, but they certainly have uh, today. Um, well, I'm going to obviously, because I always do, ask you about the mood in the place, but let me ask you specifically, do you know if the president has talked to his father yet? We do not know that, and this White House is very sensitive about relaying conversations between the current President Bush and the former President Bush. We do know they spoke, obviously, immediately right after the terrorist strikes of September 11th. It is normal procedure for this President to reach out to his father, among others, at times of crisis and big decisions. So there's no question such a conversation will take place. The White House always tells us that those are private conversations, very reluctant to get into the details, but certainly we would expect that conversation if it did not happen over the weekend as the president was authorizing this military action, that it certainly will happen time and time again in the minutes, hours, and days ahead. The, the White House has, has long been sensitive to this. There was a moment on the first Friday after the attack at the National Cathedral, I'm sure you remember this, John, where uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush reached over and grabbed the arm of his son uh, across the former First Lady. It was a very tender and telling moment. But other than that, they really don't like to um, uh, the senior Mr. Bush doesn't like to upstage his son at all. Uh, the mood in the White House. The mood is, a, it's a crisis mood. Aides are very slow to return phone calls because they are in urgent staff meetings. They are told to tell us as little as possible about ongoing military operations. Most of the senior staff here admits it knows very little about the specifics of the ongoing operations or the plans for the days ahead. And we should make clear, they say weeks and months ahead, as Defense Secretary Rumsfeld made clear just a few moments ago. Here at the White House, they say their guidance is this is move one in what will be a very long military campaign. The generals know better than correspondents like myself, the military trying to soften up, knock out communications, knock out command and control, but Secretary Rumsfeld making clear, and the White House, the President himself, in a much more vague statement earlier in the day, making clear to the American people, this is just the beginning, an attempt to make it, make sure that when U.S. ground troops are put in there, and that is a when, not an if, that there are situations on the ground where they would be as safe as possible. John, stand by, if you will. Al Jazeera Television, which we've been talking about a lot, is now interviewing the defense, uh, deputy defense minister, the Taliban, who has claimed, claimed to have shot down an American jet. We'll listen in a bit. I don't know. Uh, I'm not hearing the translation from the uh, I hope that the technicians will uh, address this problem I can appreciate I can appreciate the problem uh, having this from time to time. they've lost contact again the um, deputy defense minister for the Taliban is claiming to have shot down a plane is that an American plane is that a British plane is it even true we don't know in fact general Myers I believe it was in the briefing it may have been the defense secretary but in my memory it is general Myers said that they have no reports of any lost American or British aircraft um, and so that is just one of the things that um, that get to report it from time to time. Let's, let's see if they, Al Jazeera, have fixed their problems and we'll get a translation on this interview with the Deputy Defense Minister, the Taliban, as it goes on. They have double standards. They don't say to the Israelis uh, anything to the Israelis about what they're doing in Palestine or the Russians what they're doing or the Indians uh, doing in Kashmir. But you shall fight them. Now there are uh, elements of uh, Qaeda and Taliban. In this uh, condition, uh, are there any uh, coordination, uh, military coordination between the two at the moment? 
I personally, I, I don't think it's something, uh, uh, something big. With regard to Taliban government, uh, are there any uh, other pre preparations uh, um, are you prepared uh, are there any specific plans for each area whether be it Pandahar or other place thank God uh, um, as I said before um, and I repeat that uh, military secrets uh, are very difficult uh, to talk about and uh, we don't uh, tell anybody uh, what, what secrets do we have a short while ago, uh, we broadcast uh, a videotape uh, for uh, Osama bin Laden, Ayman Dawhari, and a spokesman for Qaeda, and they all have confirmed uh, the, their full support for the attacks without uh, bearing responsibility for them. Uh, do you think this uh, represents uh, maybe uh, a proof uh, that you were uh, re re requiring? Uh, uh, for Bin Laden's role in these uh, attacks. Our position is clear, we are against terrorism, and what has been said about us is not true. The American Defense Minister uh, uh, mentioned uh, secret uh, operations against Afghanistan. Uh, do you have an idea about the nature of these uh, secret uh, operations? And this is an interview with the uh, Deputy Defense Minister of the Taliban regime being interviewed by uh, Al Jazeera television. Uh, we didn't hear, to be honest, we didn't hear a lot there. There was a familiar restatement of the basic grievance um, and a not quite to our ear full denial that Al Qaeda and the Taliban have a military relationship. I heard him say not very much, but we're asking people in London here to be doing real time translations, and I don't want to put too much on that yet. Um, it's been about three hours since the attacks began, since the White House spokesman uh, came into the White House briefing room to say we are beginning another front in our war against terrorism, so freedom can prevail over fear. That was the formal announcement. It came at about 12.30 or so. That is the time the Pentagon now puts on the attack starting, um, and I don't say this to quarrel with them, uh, but to our memory, uh, we, we were reporting a little bit earlier than that, uh, perhaps 45 minutes earlier than that, the sound of explosions in Kabul and Kandahar. But in any case, that is the time that the Pentagon gives as the beginning point when it was announced at the football stadium, which is in fact not far from here, where the Atlanta Falcons are playing um, Chicago Bears, the crowd started to chant USA, USA. I suspect that was something heard in football stadiums around the country on this Sunday. There's beginning, we are now beginning to get some world reaction, leaders from around the world starting to react. We've heard already from the British Prime Minister and his forces are involved in this first wave. We also have some reaction from Shimon Perez, the Israeli Foreign Minister. He talked a short time ago with Larry King for Larry's broadcast tonight. I don't have the slightest doubt that the decision that was taken by the President of the United States is the right one, the just one, and you are going and we are going to win it. For the simple reason, not just because you have the technological supremacy, you have the moral supremacy. Bin Laden does not offer any solution and any hope to no person in the world who is not a Muslim. And to the Muslims who are not fanatic, they do don't have a chance. 
and the fanatics who don't kill are not included in his agenda. He offers nothing but killing and hate and murder. He cannot win. On the other hand, the United States and all the free world must win. There is no room for compromise. There is no way to let one or two or three or four crazy people to kill hundreds and thousands of innocent men and women and children. So I believe that in that case, it was one of the right and courageous decision. We would go the farthest possible way to make the world safe. May I say, you know, that uh, the first Prime Minister of Ben Gurion, of Israel, Ben Gurion, offered to the United States even to send Israeli units to Korea. We feel part and parcel of this campaign, and if it shall be asked, everything will be considered seriously and positively. That uh, from an interview, Shimon Perez, from an interview that he did with Larry King, that entire interview and the rest of Larry King Live um, tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, Shimon Perez, just one of the guests there. A couple of other international reactions. The French President Jacques Chirac, uh, the fight against terrorism is a fight that is complex, difficult, and that may be played out on several fronts. Chirac goes on to say, the French, all of us, he says, are united. Uh, reaction from the Canadian Prime Minister as well, uh, speaking about his country, we are part of an unprecedented coalition of nations that has come together to fight the threat of terrorism, and indeed the Canadians have offered uh, their forces, some of their forces, uh, to be used, though those uh, forces have not been used yet. The Germans and the French have likewise made offers, uh, but at this point those have not been taken up. Um, Jonathan Carl is, covers Congress for us. He's on the Hill now, and we're gar starting to get the first wave of reaction from uh, members of the Congress. Jonathan? Aaron, a strong, unified statement from the congressional leadership, that being Republicans and Democrats, a statement that will soon be released. I've got a copy of it. It reads, quote, We strongly support the operation President Bush ordered our military forces to carry out today. The administration has properly made it clear that today's action and any future action are directed against those who perpetrated the heinous acts on the United States on September 11th, not against Islam or the people of Afghanistan. We stand united with the president and with our troops and will continue to work together to do what is necessary to bring these terrorists bring justice to these terrorists and those who harbor them. That a joint statement that has been released, put together by the top Democrats, Tom Daschle and Dick Gephardt, and the top Republicans, Dennis Hastert and Trent Lott. As you heard earlier, they were notified ahead of time personally by the president last night that military action was about to be commenced. We know that the, uh, de the top Rep Democratic leader in the House, Dick Gephardt, got a call at 7.30 last night. Uh, the president connected with the top Democrat in the Senate at about 9 o'clock last night, Tom Daschle. They have both said they give him unconditionally their support in this action. And as you know, Darren, I mean, um, Aaron, it was about three days, it was exactly three days after the attacks of September 11th that the Congress passed a resolution authorizing the use of all necessary and appropriate force against the terrorists and anybody who aided them, helped them, or harbored them in any way. So the Congress, already on record some time ago, supporting the president in terms of military action, now that statement coming out, unified statement, Democrats and Republicans, the entire leadership saying they're behind the president and this military action. John, in the, uh, I was thinking of another moment way back there, way back a month ago, uh, shortly after September 11th, and I'm not sure if it was September 11th or the 12th, but you had virtually the entire Congress out on the steps <laughs> of uh, the Capitol. Do you expect to see at least the leadership publicly today or are they just going to issue this statement? Um, members are often out of town on the weekend. Well, many of the leaders are here in town. Tom Daschle, as a matter of fact, is here in Washington. But that was an extraordinary moment you're referring to. It was September 11th, was the night of the attacks. If you remember, the entire Congress had been evacuated from the Capitol. They had taken away the congressional leaders, taken them to a secure location away from Washington. They flew back via helicopter. That was their first appearance since they had been taken away via helicopter. About 200 or so members of Congress standing on the steps of the Capitol behind me, singing God Bless America and making a joint statement that they were not going to be uh, cowed into not coming back to the Congress by the terrorist action. This is a different situation. Congressional leaders, are, we are told, will 
remain a, uh, have a low profile on this. They want this statement to get out there. They want it to be very clear that they are united with this president. They do not have any disagreements about this use of force, uh, but don't look for any public uh, uh, show of support beyond this uh, it's very strong and very united statement uh, today. Uh, clearly a different moment. I don't mean to compare the two. Jonathan, yeah. thank you. I know you'll continue your reporting. Chris Burns is in the northern part of Afghanistan in an area held by the Northern Alliance has continued his reporting. Chris is uh, back with us now. Chris. Well, Aaron, yes, uh, very obviously a coordinated effort between Washington, between the coalition and the Northern Alliance forces. What we've heard in the past hour are more blasts along the front line. Uh, that is the front line between here and Kabul. Uh, apparently some more exchanges of artillery fire, gunfire between thousands of Taliban forces facing off with thousands of Northern Alliance forces. Also fighting going on in the north. Uh, the Northern Alliance claims that they are continuing to advance toward the strategic town of Mazari Sharif that is held by the Taliban. If that does fall, that would consolidate the holdings of the Northern Alliance, which has been fighting to expand beyond its uh, what is believed to be about 10 percent of the uh, land area in this Texas-sized country. Northern Alliance claims somewhat, some uh, 25 percent of the country, though it's very difficult to confirm that. Uh, also, in terms of coordination, the Northern Alliance says that the uh, coalition attacks have included attacks on airports in the north, three airports, including the one in Mazar-e-Sharif, uh, the one in Kunduz, the one in Takar. Also, a, 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 a allied airstrike against the, a Taliban base in the province, the western province of Herat, uh, also showing that the Northern Alliance is getting air support to continue its offensive to try to weaken the Taliban and hopefully, from their standpoint, uh, take uh, Kabul and install a government that would cooperate with Washington and the uh, international community in hunting down suspected terrorist sites. Uh, the humanitarian side is also being coordinated according to the Northern Alliance. They say that there will be airdrops as uh, the Pentagon just said. Uh, they're expecting airdrops in the north, very very remote mountainous rugged areas. In fact uh, the, North, the U United Nations says that some 400,000 people in areas where the fighting is going on up there uh, face starvation within a week because they plan there's, there's supposed to be running out of food by then. We, a couple of days ago, we went up to a, a camp, a, a refugee camp up in the north, on a barren mountain side that's going to be waist deep in snow in about a month. So that is also a concern among uh, the Northern Alliance and also uh, among the coalition. Aaron. Uh, Chris, a question here, but before I ask, let me, let me tell you and our viewers, we've got some uh, Nightscope uh, video that we can roll in here. Um, and I assume this is the attack in Kabul. Um, that we've just gotten a, a good look at and while we're looking at that uh, Chris um, uh, bring give our viewers a sense of who the Nor Northern Alliance is and in in, in this respect um, are they friends of the United States today or are they really friends of the United States I mean if you remember you're right I know you do if viewers remember their history of Afghanistan um, we were supporters of the Taliban for a while too and they turned on the United States so do we know much about the, the true allegiance of the Northern Alliance? Are they long-term reliable partners? Very good question. Well, the Northern Alliance had been in power uh, until about five years ago in, in Kabul. The Taliban kicked them out of there. Uh, they have managed to hang on uh, with their fingernails up in the northern area there. Uh, they are a, a diverse group of uh, at least five major factions, uh, mainly uh, Tajik and Uzbek ethnically, but also including some Pashtuns. Uh, it is uh, a, a coalition of um, various uh, warlords and political leaders that uh, itself has been divided among each other. Uh, in fact, uh, while they were in, in power in Kabul, there had been uh, uh, inter-ethnic fighting that leveled Kabul. Of course, Northern Alliance does blame uh, other factions as well for that fighting. Factions, they say, were, were backed by Pakistan. A very, very complex, very problematic. Uh, however, uh, the Northern Alliance is seen really at this point as the only hope of uh, posing some kind of military challenge uh, to the Taliban, and that is why Washington continues to support them at this point. Uh, I think there had been sympathies toward the Northern Alliance. Uh, the United Nations has recognized them as an official government there, uh, as well as a number of other countries. The United States stopped recognizing the Northern Alliance 
uh, because the Taliban had installed its own uh, uh, its own representative at the uh, at the Afghan embassy in Washington. Uh, so, there, but on the other hand, also the, the worry of inter-ethnic fighting if they do get back to Kabul has raised concerns among the international community. That's why there's been pressure on the Northern Alliance and other groups to form a broad-based coalition, perhaps including uh, the the exiled king of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. To, in, to bring some kind of stability if, uh, if the Taliban is toppled and if there is a government that is installed in Kabul. That is a main concern among the international community, Aaron. Uh, Chris, thanks. We're a long way from there. Uh, getting stable Afghanistan, where just uh, the country is just at the beginning of an attack, just three hours and 15 minutes or so uh, into it. Kamal Haider is reporting to us from um, an area inside Afghanistan, as we say again, we're, we won't be more specific in this case than that. It's not the, necessarily the safest part of the world right now. Kamal? Yes, um, we just have news that an oil dump on the airport in Herat was hit. The timing of the uh, attack was possibly the same as Kabul and Kandahar, but news filtering out very uh, slowly because of the lack of communication and infrastructure. But and that news uh, being now confirmed from Herat about a huge explosion, uh, possibly from a hit at the airport. And Herat uh, is in the north and the w in the west, as I recall, correct? It is in the western part of Afghanistan, uh, close to the Iranian border of uh, Islam Khila and uh, Turgundi towards Turkmenistan, so, so we western uh, Afghanistan. All right, we don't quite have it on the map yet, but we'll get it up on the map. But it's right about, if my memory is right, right about at the point where the A is on Afghanistan in the in the map that we showed you. Um, Absolutely. Um, and are you picking up anything else uh, while we've got you on the phone? We never know precisely when we're going to get to talk to you or not, uh, so we don't want to waste the opportunity. We've got the oil dump. What else can you tell us? Well, uh, of course, uh, the only other confirmation was from Kandahar some time ago, you, which you're probably aware of. We are trying to keep a watch on Jalalabad at this moment to see if there is any news coming out of there. The last information, of course, being that uh, three uh, huge explosions were heard and at least two aircrafts uh, were seen above the skies of uh, Jalalabad. That was about nine, uh, 10 past 9 okay. of our standard time. We will, uh, we will, as best we can, stay in touch. Thank you again, uh, Kamal, reporting that perhaps it's an oil dump, but in any case, or an oil depot, in any case, a large explosion in Herat, which is to the north and the west uh, part of Afghanistan at about the same time these attacks were going on in Kabul and Kandahar and in a number of other places. This is absolutely consistent with what the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense said a short time ago that these are, these are, this first wave of attacks, a very broad-based wave, this is a very much what we expected. There you see Herat, and it is right above the A in Afghanistan, um, and right up against Iran, which, keep in mind, is over on that western border of Afghanistan. Um, a couple, okay, uh, you want to go there now? We'll do that. Okay. Uh, Mayor of New York, Rudolph Giuliani, is about to speak. We've got a couple of other uh, things to get in here, here too. Uh, we, all New Yorkers, I'm sure, join me in supporting uh, President Bush in the action that uh, he, uh, he is taking in order to uh, defend the United States, in order to do everything that he can to bring to justice the people responsible for the World Trade Center attack and also to um, eliminate terrorism and terrorists so that they can't do the kind of horrible thing they did to the World Trade Center ever again. Our hearts go out to all of the men and women of our military who are carrying out this mission and their families. Probably New Yorkers, um, as well as people in Pennsylvania and Washington, having uh, borne the brunt of this um, attack on America uh, so directly and so personally, understand more than most the pain and uh, the suffering that families go through when they lose people and our hearts go out out to them and we hope very very much that none of them have to go through that pain new york mayor rudolph also, giuliani uh speaking in new york today it's to our ear sounding like the mayor's nursing a cold he has been working i think it's fair to say literally non-stop since september 11th um, one quick note and then to the white house um tonight 
uh, the Emmys were scheduled, the awards for television uh, programs, they had been uh, delayed by the September 11th attack, and now they have been canceled, the first cancellation of the Emmys in 53 years. They had tried to set up a broadcast that was appropriate to the time. We talked with the the uh, uh, fellow producing it the other night, and they tried to set it up in a way that was appropriate, and clearly now the news of the day makes uh, made them think that it wouldn't be the right thing to do to go ahead with it. Football games are being played around the country today, um, but they would have started almost at the time the attacks did. Senior White House correspondent John King uh, joins us, and I, I'm guessing, John, this has to do with uh, the vice president has to do with the vice president and the president as well, Aaron. Since you mentioned the vice president, first let's start with him. Consistent with the increased security that has been in place since the September 11th attacks, White House officials telling us that Vice President Dick Cheney is not here on the White House grounds taking part in the deliberations on this ongoing military campaign, but has instead for security precautions been taking to another secure location. The White House not telling us where that is, but we are told he too, like the president, can receive constant updates on the military campaign and that the vice president, Mr. Cheney, is among the senior administration officials making phone calls. In Mr. Cheney's case, we are told those phone calls to world leaders, leaders around the world, not on the president's call list, but on the vice president's call list. A bit more information. Remember these words, quote, I gave them a fair warning. That a direct quotation from the President of the United States just after he returned to the White House today from Camp David, Maryland. He walked directly into the Oval Office. Of course, he knew what was about to happen. Already his speech was in the works, the brief address he made to the American people. He turned to senior aides and he said, quote, I gave them a fair warning. He went on to say that he never expected the Taliban to deliver, uh, to act on his ultimatum, but the president saying that to aides. Ari Fleischer, the White House press secretary, just a short time ago, describing the president as, quote, resolute and determined. He also told us on the record that the vice president had been taken to a secure location. And Mr. Fleischer was asked, what about the continued terrorist threat the administration has talked of here in the United States? He said, quote, Americans need to be on alert. Threats do remain. Mr. Fleischer said law enforcement officials here in Washington and around the country were doing all they could, but, quote, this is a war. And again, the president had took some time this afternoon to have lunch with his senior staff, we are told, in the Roosevelt Room here at the White House, reminding them of the very difficult duty they will have in the days and weeks ahead. He also is receiving very frequent updates on the military campaign underway from his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice. And as we reported a short time ago, he is now in double digits calling key leaders around the world. Many of them contacted just before the first of the cruise missiles struck in Afghanistan, the president calling key leaders among them, the Russian president, the president of France, the president of Pakistan, obviously a key ally of the United States in this campaign, many other world leaders as well, including leaders in the very sensitive region of the Middle East. Aaron. John, any, any plan for the rest of the day for the president to come out to the cameras, uh, to talk to uh, us, to talk to the American people, talk to the world? Uh, any plan? We are told not to expect to see the president again today, that his statement to the American people stands. Obviously, the Pentagon then provided more details of the ongoing campaign, but White House officials do say the president understands as this can campaign continues in the days and weeks, and they're making clear months ahead, one of the president's chief obligations is to communicate the goals and to update the American people, and we do expect to hear from him. Indeed, we know we will hear from him tomorrow. There already is a public event to swear in former Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge as the new director of Home Homeland Security. That a job that will get a lot of attention anyway, even more so now because we know administration officials have told members of Congress in classified briefings they believe there is a very high probability of attempts to launch terrorist strikes here in the United States, especially if the United States responded militarily, which of course it now has. So Governor Ridge takes office tomorrow. We will hear the president at that ceremony. We would expect perhaps additionally as well. But as of now, the White House saying don't look to hear from the president again today. And, and not to make um, a tense situation any more so tense but as you were talking I went back to the conversation you and I had uh, on Friday night about the kinds of signals that intelligence and law enforcement sources were picking up and how edgy everybody was about the possibility of some sort of new terrorist attack in the country in the United States. 
That's right. In that reporting, Aaron, we reported much of it was overseas, most of it was overseas, but law enforcement officials were concerned because suspected members of terrorist cells were doing and saying and moving around much like they believe those responsible for the September 11th attacks were in the days before those attacks, now that they have pieced that together. But I must say one of the more remarkable things is, at least right here in Washington, we have seen immediately after the September 11th attacks and then on an on and off basis since then, security intensified, then lessened a bit, then intensified again. When I was rushing in here this afternoon, there was a street hockey game going on in Pennsylvania Avenue. So they certainly feel secure about the White House complex at this hour. When they are in a high alert mode, they stretch out the security perimeter farther away from the White House. Things relatively normal here around the White House complex, although Ari Fleischer saying a short time ago, some extra security precautions being taken here at the White House, at other key federal installations, and around the country as well. John, thanks. Senior White House correspondent John King. And um, I think it's fair to say the lead in all of that was that the vice president, Vice President Cheney, has been moved uh, out of his office in the White House to, as a security precaution. You may go back in your mind to the president's speech before a joint session of Congress uh, back after the, I think, on the Thursday of um, the week of the attacks on New York and Washington. Um, and the vice president was not, uh, for security reasons, allowed to be in the Capitol that day, um, as was a member of the president's cabinet and, uh, as I recall, Dick Armey, um, one of the ranking Republicans in the House. Uh, but in any case, the vice president has been taken to a secure location. As we have been telling you, these attacks began at about 12.30 Eastern time or so. That's the official time stamp the Pentagon put on it at its briefing. Mostly cruise missiles, land-based aircraft, sea-based aircraft. Miles O'Brien uh, on our staff has been dealing a lot with the tools in the toolbox. I heard him refer to it a little earlier. Miles joins us now with a little bit more on that. Miles. Aaron, we're still trying to piece this all together as, quite frankly, I'm sure as the military is right now, as they try to make some sort of assessment as to how effective things are. Still dark, of course, in uh, the region, and therefore they won't be able to come up with any uh, accurate assessment until daylight falls and there's an, they're able to get some kind of reconnaissance uh, in the region. But let's just take a look at uh, a typical cruise missile kind of scenario here. Many, many cruise missiles out there in the Arabian Sea on various platforms, submarines, on uh, uh, destroyers. Uh, and this essentially is a flight that uh, is well within the range of a cruise missile, range of about a thousand miles. T uh, it, it hugs the nap of the earth, if you will, so presents a very low radar profile. Radars can't see it very well, flying subsonically with precision accuracy. We know of uh, targets in Kandahar and Kabul uh, for certain, some 50 cruise missiles, some of them perhaps launched by uh, B-52s, uh, some of them uh, off of those uh, submarines off the coast, some of them uh, we know there were uh, uh, B-2s in play as well. Now Diego Garcia is a place where we know the B-52s uh, were staged from and uh, this is a 2400 mile mission uh, in one way but that's well of course within the range of a B-52 uh, unrefueled. Uh, the B-52s can launch a larger version of the uh, cruise missile and uh, as well as uh, dropping conventional gravity or dumb bombs, if you will. Of course, we know that the U.S. military is filled with these so-called smart weapons. Let's take a look at just some satellite imagery for you. This is imagery which was taken uh, long ago, as a matter of fact, July of uh, the year 2000. This imagery will give you a sense of the kind of uh, 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 type of uh, imagery that is used to get some sort of assessment. Obviously these kinds of images, this is Kandahar, and we know that we have reports that the uh, airport was a target here as well as some of the infrastructure radar capability. These sorts of images will be compared uh, against images that are captured once daylight breaks in the region and the military planners get a chance to pour over them. These are three, me three meter resolution, which, uh, excuse me, one meter, uh, which means three feet one meter, three feet, so they can, they can bring it down to three feet. That is uh, in the non-classified world. The classified stuff, of course, is about three times better than that. Let's take a look at Kabul just briefly for you and give you a sense of uh, what they will be seeing, what they'll be looking at, a non-classified version. The, the airport, of course, is in the, uh, to the north of the city. The center of town here is where uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Interior, and the Defense Ministry um, while we try to sort this all out, these would potentially be on the uh, target list. We're trying to get a better assessment of that as we try to piece this all together. Um, we will 
piece it together as the military provides us this information. We have a lot of people on the ground who also can give us some insights in all of this. Once again, a full assessment of how successful these raids uh, have been really will be several hours uh, in the future. Aaron? Well, certainly till daylight. Um, General Clark just made, uh, came over and, and uh, whispered in my ear, I think a, a good observation to throw out for all of us now. Um, we're, we're talking about, in the simplest terms, we're talking about what we know. We're talking about attacks we're able to confirm in places like Kabul or Kandahar or Herat or any of these other places, any of these other cities. But what we can't know and don't know, and, and you ought to assume that these are the only places these attacks are going on. There may in fact be, when you look at a map of Afghanistan, um, it is in, in literally uh, dotted with, littered with, um, these terrorist uh, training camps that are clearly targets of the American and British attack today. How many of those have been hit? Where they've been hit? Um, we just don't know yet, and we're not going to know that for some time. So we can tell you with certainty that Kabul has been hit. We can tell you that Kandahar has been hit. We have a report that uh, an oil depot in Herat to the west and the north by the Iranian border was hit. We know about those because we have good reporting from there, but we can't tell you that we cannot tell you and don't in, we don't want to suggest that that's all that's going on that in the interior of the country or in many of these other places there may well be uh, more than likely in fact be some um, missiles being dropped attacks being made to take out some of those terrorist bases Christian Amanpour is in Islamabad the Pakistani capital uh, Christian I know you've got some reporting here and I have one quick question when you're done Yeah, well, we just add to that list that you just mentioned, Jalalabad as well, the other major city in Afghanistan. We heard from our sources there that a target was hit, that they had heard loud explosions, intense explosions, and that one key military source there suggested that perhaps one of those targets may have been an Al-Qaeda terrorist base. We've also heard a lot from all the officials who've spoken tonight, both American and the British Prime Minister Tony Blair, how two things are really the main objectives to shift the balance of power away from the Taliban and thereby clean up these terrorist havens and to make sure that there is no or as little as possible damage to the Afghan civilians and in, in, in addition to that dropping aid and sustenance to Afghan civilians. Nick Robertson was the last Western reporter, CNN's Nick Robertson, to be in Afghanistan basically thrown out by the Taliban three weeks ago in anticipation of these strikes. When the US and the British say that their objective is to shift the balance of power. Give us a realistic assessment of the divisions within the Taliban. Certainly around Kandahar, and that is where the Taliban stronghold is, they, are, they feel they're most secure and they feel strongest. And certainly when we were in Kandahar, everyone we talked to there said that they would be behind the Taliban should they be attacked. Now, as you move away from there, it's particularly to the north, particularly towards the Northern Alliance, particularly to some of the areas where there was fighting today, north of the Salang Tunnel, which is a key strategic road linking Kabul to that city, Mazar in the north. There are other ethnic groups, Hazaras there, we heard earlier today, were fighting with uh, the Taliban forces, taking some villages in that area but essentially the further you move away from Kandahar the more we've been hearing rumors reports that the Taliban essentially losing their grip on some of those key commanders in some of those areas these first few days will be critical Christian what people do and indeed we heard from a source inside that it was quite worrying the defections that they were reporting uh, about a week or ten days or so ago now on the humanitarian side a four-year drought very very severe conditions in terms of food availability how bad is it? Absolutely. Towns like Herat, for example, where we've heard about an, uh, an oil depot, possibly fuel depot near the airport being hit. For example, there in that city, some 200,000 people displaced by those four years of drought. They've come from the central highlands. We were up there uh, this time last year. Their fields completely barren. People said that they'd sold even their seeds. They didn't have any cattle left. They'd been forced to move on. And it's similar similar situation around Kabul. Many displaced people completely reliant on food handouts from the World Food Programme. And it is these people that the food will need to continue to come into Afghanistan, either by road, by the mule trains that we've heard about, or by these airdrops. Because if the food supplies do not come into the country, these people who completely rely on the humanitarian effort will be left 
at risk, and that is a large number of people. Potentially, UN agencies say some perhaps 7 million people, Christiane. And just to point out to our viewers how dire the situation is, aid officials were saying even before this crisis, one woman every 15 minutes was dying in childbirth, uh, four children in every 10 would die before they reached the age of five. I mean, extraordinary statistics. On another issue that we've had tonight, the so-called Osama bin Laden video news release. This is a very slick operation, a very well shot tape, clearly preparing for what happened today. And clearly Osama bin Laden had a very good idea where he was going to deliver that message to the Al Jazeera network, who in the past, they are now the only station in Kabul, and in the past, they have also received other video messages from Osama bin Laden. The film of his son's wedding earlier this year, the film of his fighters, the Al-Qaeda fighters training in camps earlier this year. Clearly, he knew he was going to deliver this message. It was ready, prepared, a very professional job, as you say, and uh, given clearly a broadcast very quickly into these events tonight. Christian. Nick, thank you very much. And you also heard Donald Rumsfeld tonight say that in direct response to a question that Osama bin Laden was not personally a target, saying that no single individual is a target necessarily, but that the whole safe haven for harboring terrorists and the terrorist networks are targets there. Now, just to say about what the situation is here in Pakistan, we had a, a demonstration of about 100 to 150 people near uh, Islamabad, the capital here. That quickly fizzled away. We've called various places around this country. We've called our people in Peshawar and elsewhere, which is closer to the Afghanistan border. So far, reports all acquired, although some demonstrations have been called for tomorrow. Today, in anticipation of military action, the president of Pakistan, the government of Pakistan, arrested one of the more hardline uh, extremist party leaders here under house arrest now and they are clearly going to be looking very closely at the situation on the street as this proceeds now as action has been taken. Uh, another thing we have heard is that a statement has come out from the Pakistani government after a meeting uh, following these airstrikes tonight saying that they regretted that the Taliban had uh, basically not listened to their diplomatic entreaties, not come forward with the uh, required demands of the international community, that they thought this, that they said this was now an inevitable result of that. They hope that the action would be over as quickly as possible, will stick to the stated aims of attacking military targets, and that afterwards uh, the international community would pour money, effort, and help into reconstructing it and forming a government of national reconciliation. On another issue, we are being told by sources inside the military here that the airspace tonight was used, the Pakistani airspace, although official government sources won't confirm or deny that, simply saying that they had made available when asked, uh, special corridors to be used in the event of a military strike. Aaron? Christian, thank you. Remember, that I, I had a question, but you answered it. Thank you. I was concerned about or interested in Pakistani reaction, and obviously the next uh, 12 hours, it's um, about 12.35 uh, in that part of the world right now, so it's early Monday morning. Um, there's going to be newspaper headlines. There's going to be reaction in the morning and daylight. Uh, how the Pakistanis react is obviously very important. Uh, part of this job, to be honest, is keeping an eye, literally, on all of the various players. And General Clark, I kept an eye on you, and you seem to be shaking your head at times there. So let's give you a chance to tell me why. Well, uh, first of all, I, I just agree with everything that Christian and Nick were reporting there from from Pakistan in terms of the professionalism of the uh, of the of the information effort that Osama bin Laden had prepared, but also I was noticing our own our own uh, tape at the bottom of the shots, and and I, I think it's we, we ought to be very clear to our our viewers that the United States has said it's not attacking Afghanistan; it is attacking the Taliban and the Al Qaeda network, and uh, and we're certainly not attacking cities, but we may be attacking facilities in or near those cities with very precise weaponry and so I, I think the clarity of this is extremely important particularly since we've seen how Osama bin Laden on his side wants to escalate the rhetoric and, 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 and mischaracterize the operation so I think it's very important that the, the, the clarity of the and nature of the American attacks be reflected in, in, in what we're saying and doing. That, that's what I was really shaking my head about. At, at, um, I, 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 take the, I take that as a gentle admonition. Um, we need to be as precise in our language and in some cases as these weapons are in their ability to do the function they're created to do. Exactly. We talk about attacks on a city 
In fact, it would be more accurate to say they are trying to hit an airport or they are trying to hit an oil uh, or, or, or a munitions uh, place. And um, un until daylight comes and until uh, we have a chance, uh, we in the press or uh, the press that is still in Afghanistan has a chance to look at what's been hit, um, and no one's going to know. Um, how successful it was, but certainly the plan, and I think this is the point you're trying to make, and it's a good and fair one, is the plan is not to go after the city, which implies apartment buildings or uh, residences, neighborhoods, that sort of thing. Exactly. Okay. Um, we'll all be more careful. Thank you. I now know why you were shaking your head, too. Um, we've been talking, we talked briefly about when this attack began. Um, the Pentagon now says 12.15 Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, that's getting closer to our memory of it. Um, they had said 12.30. It is not in any sense important, but um, we made a deal about it, so we pass it along. The, in Pakistan, um, the ambassador to Pakistan, the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan, has talked to reporters and um, this is Abdul Salim Zaif. You may remember him. In fact, he was uh, quite prominent on television over the last week as the principal Taliban spokesman with access to reporters, access to the West. And he was uh, speaking, he was speaking in Pakistan earlier today. If we have that tape, we can hear him. Welcome to all the journalist community. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Afghanistan is victim of American arrogance and expansionism. Expansionism uh, attack. It wants to snatch from the Afghan Muslims people the present Islamic system. These brutal attack are as uh, horrendous terrorist act as anywhere else in the world. America will never achieve its political goals by launching horrendous attack on the Muslim people of Afghanistan. The Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan has always chosen the faith of tax, the faith and the way of tax, and reasons to solve problems. But America has always chosen the militarist, uh, militaristic approach. However, such brutal attitude by America will unify the whole Afghan nation against the aggressors. The, Afghan, the Afghans will rise against the new uh, colonialist we will condemn this terrorist action on the nation of Afghanistan. Did you receive anything from Mullah Omar or Osama that they are alive? Alhamdulillah. Well, the, um, the, the ambassador, I knew I'd find the word, the ambassador, that was taped by the way, um, we noted here that he's speaking in English. I mean, I, the point of that is um, this is clearly a message. This is the highest ranking Taliban official who has access to Western reporters at this point, the ambassador to Pakistan, the only country left in the world now that has formal diplomatic relations uh, with the Taliban. And so uh, speaking in English clearly to the West, making his argument that, and this is just one quote, you heard the rest, America wants to snatch the Afghan people from the present Islamic system. These brutal attacks are as horrendous as the terrorist acts. Um, Afghanistan will rise against the new colonialists. All the code words that you expect to hear, an attack on Muslims, uh, colonialist America, 
all of the ones you expect to hear in a moment like this you heard from uh, Mr. Zaif, the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, we're joined now by uh, Judy Woodruff in Washington. Judy, as I was thinking about the fact that I was about to um, say good afternoon, um, it occurred to me that we met this way on television on the 11th of September, a day about as shocking as any of us had experienced. Today is different. Today we ex may not have known the time and the place and the moment, but we certain ex certainly expected that this day would come when the Americans would strike back. We surely did, uh, Aaron, and you're harking back to what was almost four weeks ago. But today, you can't say that uh, under any set of arguments that the people uh, who run the Taliban, that the al-Qaeda network didn't have fair warning that this was coming. The rhetoric has escalated literally every day over the last week and more coming out of Washington not just uh, and not just from the United States from the Bush administration but also from the British from Tony Blair the rhetoric has gotten increasingly urgent up to the point yesterday President Bush saying we are running out of time time is running out uh, so I think if there was any doubt on the part of the Taliban and I thought it was interesting that their spokesman was saying today uh, that uh, this is an act we just heard their ambassador to Pakistan saying this is an American act of terrorism against Afghanistan, it's as if they've turned it all upside down and on its head. And, and just as recently as uh, last night, the Taliban, I mean, for the last week and a half, the Taliban has looked for one, um, I'm going to characterize this as stalling measure after another, uh, to try and delay uh, what clearly seemed to be the inevitable. Yesterday it was they would try uh, bin Laden in their country the day before. It was they would release the aid workers, the aid Western aid workers. Right. If the Americans did, there have been two missions by Pakistani officials, including officials very close to the Taliban in the Pakistani intelligence community, to try and get them to cooperate. And clearly the president and the administration and the British as well uh, came to believe that there was no point talking anymore. Uh, it was just going to be one stalling effort after another. So on with it, they went this afternoon. And Aaron, I think one thing we, we do want to continue to keep an eye out for, and I know we are, and that is when the president talks about, when Secretary Rumsfeld talks about a global-based uh, operation against terrorism, when you hear the list of countries that are active militarily at this point, they are all the nations of the West, the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Australia, Germany, France. The names of the countries that I think we have yet to hear in terms of what their reaction to all this are the Arabic and the Islamic nations of that region. What is Egypt saying? Uh, I, don't, I haven't heard yet. I'm watching at this yeah. point for some sort of statement from them. Uh, what about the Saudis, uh, the Jordanians, and so forth? It'll be very interesting to see if uh, the effort by Osama bin Laden and by the Taliban to make this an American war against Islam is having any effect at all. Well, the president said in his statement, uh, it's pretty simple. You're either uh, for fighting terrorists or you're not. Uh, there's no neutrality here. Jamie McIntyre is at the Pentagon. Um, Jamie, I gather you heard the uh, Taliban official saying that an American plane had been shot down. Do you have anything on that? Well, I've checked with officials here at the Pentagon, and they say they have no report of any U.S. or British planes being uh, lost or in any trouble, uh, and it's something that they would, have norm would normally know about right away. Of course, if it were the case, uh, they wouldn't comment on it at all while they mounted a search and rescue mission. But at this point, they're telling us uh, that there's, uh, they believe there's no credence to that report. Uh, and again, that was a report uh, made on um, Al Jazeera. Uh, the Mideast television station. We've talked a lot about this afternoon in an interview with this, I recall this, the Deputy Defense Minister for the Taliban, and at least at this moment the Pentagon says we don't know about it, which is about what you could get from them at this moment, right? Well, it's a little beyond that. They are essentially saying that they have no reports of any planes lost and they would know it if, they, uh, okay. if that were the case. Um, are you picking up anything else there? Well, we're getting a, it, the details are starting to dribble out about what exactly is going on in this rather extensive military strike in Afghanistan. One of the things we learned e earlier and was confirmed by Defense Secretary Rumsfeld is that two B-2 stealth bombers, the big bat-wing bombers, uh, flew out of Whiteman Air Force Base 
in Missouri where they're based, uh, 17 hours uh, to fly to hit targets in Afghanistan using satellite guided uh, precision munitions and then uh, they went on to the British base in Diego Garcia uh, in order to uh, rest and uh, then make the return trip back to the United States. Uh, these planes have, are, are, are highly accurate and used for targets where they uh, fix targets. You may recall that in fact it was uh, B-2s that erroneously hit the Chinese embassy in uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, that case was a case of giving the wrong targeting information. It wasn't that the planes missed. And also, we've learned that B-1 bombers flying out of uh, Diego Garcia, and the B-1 is not a stealthy uh, bomber, but it is a long-range bomber. It was using uh, what we call dumb bombs or unguided munitions uh, to carpet bomb some of the suspected terrorist camps. And again, the B-1s first saw combat in 1998 in Operation Desert Fox, used much the same way to uh, carpet bomb Republican guard barracks. Uh, two aspects of what's going on in this campaign, which is a pretty substantial strike. Among the targets, I mentioned suspected terrorist camps. They're also trying to hit all the airplanes that the Taliban have. They have some aging MiG aircraft. Uh, also, they're pitting some of the runways, so it's harder for planes to take off. They want to deny them any uh, ability to fly in the sky. Uh, they're also targeting uh, command and control centers and then other, quote, centers of gravity. The idea here is to put the Taliban at a military disadvantage to their uh, rivals to the north, the uh, Northern Alliance, and also to keep them on the run uh, so that they don't know exactly, uh, it makes it harder for them to plan any kind of response or do anything uh, next. In addition, the U.S. is uh, of all things, dropping humanitarian aid. C-17s flying from Ramstein, Germany, uh, carrying uh, packets of what's called humanitarian daily rations, uh, orange bags that are filled with a, a single day's food for one person. 37,000 of them uh, dropped out of C-17s over Afghanistan to feed Afghan refugees and to underscore the point that this is not a campaign against the Afghan people, but a war against terrorists and the people who support them. The operation is continuing, and Pentagon sources here say it may continue on into the daylight hours. Yeah. And, and Jamie, if I heard a somewhat taciturn defense secretary this afternoon correctly, I think he also confirmed that they were making a leaflet drop. Um, this would be, I'm, not, I'm looking for a word, I wanted to say propaganda, but it, in any case, they were, well, they were uh, dropping information on the Afghani people, trying to explain the American position from the American point of view, rather than simply relying on the Taliban to do that. Yeah, right, not, and not just a leaflet drop, but also broadcast from the uh, United States has a, a flying radio television transmitting plane, it's called uh, Commander Solo. Uh, which is capable of uh, direct broadcasting into, into the country. And uh, I'm not sure if this is, there was a report earlier that the United States may also be dropping transistor radios. They did that before in Haiti, just before the invasion mm -hmm. in Haiti. Uh, and they may be doing that again as well in order to, uh, it, you know, you wouldn't expect that too many Afghan refugees would have access to uh, radios to hear broadcasts. Uh, so they may be dropping the radios as well. These are like single channel radios that can only receive the, uh, uh, the broadcast that the United States is sending in, in the native language. Uh, Jamie, hang on. A quick thought on that from General Clark, um, who knows something about uh, both the reasons for and how this comes about. Well, it General. does look like a, a well-coordinated psychological warfare operation here. And uh, just a, a footnote to what Jamie's saying is that we had a, an early report that the official Taliban radio station was off the air. Whether that was due to electricity loss or whether the radio station had been hit, that then opens the way for the Commando Solo or other uh, radio broadcasts to go in and be received by the people of Afghanistan, something very important. And this is, this is a great example of information as a weapon. I mean, you, if you can control the information in or out in, in, in one way or another, that's a tremendous psychological advantage uh, for what you're trying to accomplish. Exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, it magnifies the impact of the physical strikes and, uh, and ultimately reduces the, the cost of the conflict. Um, and again, uh, General Clark, we talked about this earlier, this has all essentially been put together in a little bit less than a month. A, a very complicated operation and there's miles and miles and miles to go, as you warned me on Friday in our phone call. Uh, this has a long, long way to go, um, but at least um, off the start, at least, it seems to be going according to a plan uh, that has been laid out um, uh, to us in some detail about as well, about as they planned it. I mean, nothing's gone wrong that we've heard. That's right. It seems to be very effective so far in terms of following the plan. Uh, General, thank you. Judy.
Aaron, uh, and picking up on what you just said, President Bush, in his remarks today, describing it as a uh, military action designed to clear the way for a sustained, comprehensive, and relentless operation to drive them out and bring them to justice. While the military campaign is underway, very much efforts continuing on the diplomatic front. And for a little more on that, let's go to our State Department correspondent, Andrea Koppel. Andrea. Judy, Secretary Powell and his deputy, in addition to President Bush, have been in touch with key friends and allies around the world uh, as of even before some of the uh, strikes began today to let them know that they were imminent and with some countries letting them know that they were underway. I'm told the message has been to uh, make clear that these are precise and targeted uh, campaigns that are not uh, looking out actually not to hit any Afghan citizens as well as to thank various countries for their support. Uh, Secretary Powell and his deputy having spoken with uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations Kofi Annan, the, uh, the head of Oman, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Bahrain, Japan, Mexico, Argentina and Ukraine. The calls will be going on throughout the day, Judy, because not only was the diplomacy important before the campaign began, but now that it has begun, this is really where the rubber meets the road. It's keeping countries around the world, especially in the Muslim world, on board as this campaign continues. And to that end, a senior State Department official tells me that Secretary Powell will be traveling to Pakistan and India later this week. Secretary Powell was already due to be traveling to China next week for the Asian Pacific Economic Conference, which is where President Bush is supposed to be. But now apparently adding two countries to that list, India and Pakistan before he heads there. In addition, uh, Judy, Secretary Powell and others in this building have been trying to notify American embassies around the world to tell American citizens to be on alert above and beyond what they had been until today. Now that these attacks have begun, an additional worldwide caution has been issued. And in fact, if any Americans are thinking of traveling or are overseas right now, they're told to monitor the local news, to maintain contact with the nearest American embassy or consulate, and to limit their movement in their respective locations. This is something, obviously, now that the military campaign is underway, that Americans should exercise an abundance of caution, uh, not only traveling overseas, but also here in the United States. Judy? And Andrea, this is not because of any specific new information or new threat. It's just being cautious, is that right? Absolutely. There have been, we're told there have been a number of threats that have been issued, but they have not been specific threats, and as of now, they are not credible. So even before the September 11th attacks, there had been a heightened state of alert at American embassies and consulates around the world. Since the attacks, the threats continue, but they are not specific and right now not credible. And Andrea, just very quickly, how much do you know about administration efforts to get some of these moderate Arab states to speak up in support of what's going on? Well, of course, uh, the State Department, the Bush administration would love to hear those public comments, but uh, one senior administration official I spoke with said that they would be happy, the U.S. would be satisfied as long as there are no negative comments that are made. So clearly uh, they would welcome any expressions of support from whether it be Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, or others in the, in the Arab world. But right now, they are, the U.S. is understanding that their governments uh, as well have to walk a fine line with, their, uh, with public opinion in their own countries. And so just so long as they don't see any comments that are critical of uh, U.S. action, they'll, they'll be happy for now. So uh, for now, silence is, uh, is perhaps in some instances the best that they can hope for. Exactly. All right. Andrea Koppel uh, at the State Department. You've been hearing Aaron and our correspondents uh, describe uh, the ongoing effort to keep not just our allies informed, but also uh, others, uh, key figures in the American government, the United States Congress. Let's go back to the White House to our Chief White House correspondent, John King, on that point. John. Well, Judy, we know the president first notified congressional leaders last night. That is significant. It was last night that the president gave the Pentagon the go-ahead to act when it believe the moment was right for these strikes, but we also know we are told by sources here at the White House and on Capitol Hill, administration officials, among them the CIA Director George Tenet, calling key members of Congress and informing them 
Now all know the military action has begun, of course, informing them on what little the administration says it knows so far on what the Pentagon would call BDA, Battle Damage Assessment. I spoke to one lawmaker just a few minutes ago who had received a call from Mr. Tenet. He said that Mr. Tenet told him this would be, quote, a long, sustained action, and that this was day one to expect a lot more phone calls like this one, informing him of ongoing U.S. military operations. And in that conversation, the lawmaker said he was told that no complete battle damage assessment, of course, would be ready for a day or two, at least not until daybreak strikes in Afghanistan, but that he was told people are relatively optimistic. They're hearing good things so far from the region in reports back to the Pentagon and up the command chain. Here at the White House, we are told, Judy, the president receiving constant updates. He is calling around the world to world leaders as well. It was he who Andrea just reported, asked Secretary Powell to visit the very key countries in the region of India and Pakistan. Remember, a great deal of tension between those two nations in the past several years. The United States wants to make sure no other diplomatic fires to put out, if you will, as the ongoing military campaign continues. And again, here at the White House privately, they are saying this is day one. Expect this for days and weeks and months ahead. Judy. John, I think I know uh, at least part of your answer to this question. Uh, uh, but the president has had pretty consistent support so far from members of Congress. Why do they think it's so important to continue to stay in close touch? Well, one of the things the president has promised from day one is to cooperate and to coordinate with the Congress, and he has been heartened. Remember, this is a crisis that challenges the president not only as commander-in-chief, but the U.S. economy has slipped into recession. It may have been on its way into recession or perhaps technically in recession before September 11th, but the president has an urgent challenge here at home dealing with the economic consequences of these terrorist strikes. And on that front, we are told every single day the president cannot be more impressed, more happy with the cooperation he has received not only from the Republicans in Congress, his fellow Republicans, but from Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle and the Senate Democratic Leader Dick Gephardt. There have been some disagreements. There's been some fight over issues like airport security, over just what should be in the stimulus package. But those have been remarkably polite debates, and the president has said he cannot be more happy with that cooperation and that he feels a responsibility to keep key members of Congress, especially the armed services and the intelligence committees, closely informed of any U.S. military actions. And remember, as John Carl noted just a short time ago, the president also welcomed it was just days after the strikes when Congress did pass the resolution authorizing the president to use all necessary and appropriate force. So this part of the routine, this day anything but routine, but these conversations, part of the routine consultation between the administration and key members of Congress when U.S. troops are put in harm's way overseas. All right, John King at the White House. and. Uh uh, one other thing, we know the White House uh, was watching very closely today because John and our other correspondents were reporting on it, and that is a tape, a uh, re pretty remarkable tape, that aired on uh, the television network Al Jazeera, uh, which is based in Gutter, uh, and uh, it showed the first pictures that many as of us have ever seen of Osama bin Laden speaking. We were told he this was taped earlier today. Here's part of what he said. So God has given them back what they deserve. I say uh, the, the matter is very clear. So every Muslim after this and after uh, the officials in America, starting with the uh, head of the infidels, Bush, and uh, they came out with their uh, men and equipment and they even encouraged even countries claiming to be Muslims against us. So we run with our religion. They came out to fight Islam. Uh, with the name of fighting terrorism. People uh, at the end of the world in Japan. Just a portion of what uh, a very curious uh, and much watched videotape today of Osama bin Laden released, as we said, by the Al Jazeera television network. Chilling, I think, Aaron, was the word you used earlier to describe it. And I think that puts it exactly. No less chilling the second time you hear it. In fact, uh, again, we would, we would just make an observation about it that it, it appeared to us that it was done in daylight. The attacks began uh, after, uh, well after sundown in Afghanistan, about 8.30 or so. 
uh, time in Afghanistan, so obviously this was prepared in advance. Um, just in one other thing, in, in, uh, as you and John, Judy, were talking about the bipartisan atmosphere, the incredible support that the president has gotten. Uh, we remember reporting 10 years ago on the dissent and the vigorous debate that went on in Congress over uh, whether or not to authorize the use of force in um, the Persian Gulf. And there are, are, are enormous differences, not the least of which, and perhaps the most important of which, is the fact that the United States of America was attacked on September 11th, that New York and Washington were attacked by terrorists on that day. And uh, if you want to see a, a reason for a country to unify, uh, that's about as good a reason as you will ever get. Christian Amanpour is in Islamabad, has been talking to officials there, and Christian joins us now. Christian. Aaron, it's 1.30 a.m. here in Pakistan. There have been reports of small demonstrations in about three areas here in Pakistan. There was one near Islamabad, one in Lahore, and one in Peshawar near the Afghan border. Again, we're told small demonstrations, which uh, at least the one near Islamabad fizzled out fairly quickly some time ago. Also, we've been told by a military source here that Pakistani airspace was used in and is being used in the attack on Afghanistan although the official government spokesman will neither confirm nor deny that, but does say that the agreement with the United States had been to create special air corridors for any kind of military airstrike on Afghanistan. Now, I'm joined now by the former Pakistani ambassador to the United States, Mr. Najmuddin Sheikh. Let us ask you first about that videotape that everybody's talking about. Obviously, the, the, uh, the question is, when was it filmed? When, you don't believe it was filmed today, do you? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm sure that this was filmed uh, about two days or three days after the September 11th attack. It uh, reflected a triumphalism. It reflected uh, a, a feeling of a victory, of uh, having imposed on the United States the same sort of agony that uh, according to Osama bin Laden the Arab states have been suffering for a long time. There was no indication in this of an apprehension regarding an American retaliation and I think it probably was filmed as early as that because at that particular time I don't think he knew when the retaliatory attack would take place. Now let's ask about the situation inside Pakistan. Clearly everybody watching Pakistan, being that it's such a crucial ally to the United States, do you believe that the government has a hold on the situation here? There have been a few scattered demonstrations tonight? No, I think, I think uh, that so far uh, the, the Pakistan government has been able to exercise control. And this was apparent from the fact that uh, the Friday, the congregations and the demonstrations after the Friday congregations have dwindled in size rather than increased in size despite the efforts of the religious parties. Now, what happens tomorrow morning will depend very much on how accurately uh, military installations or targets of strategic value have been hit in the in the bombing raids if there are few or no civilian casualties then uh, I think the situation will remain under control we've been hearing from our sources inside Afghanistan that f at least four major cities the areas around them have been hit and all of our reports have indicated that they're around airfields and military bases one even suggested perhaps one of those uh, uh, suspected terrorist training camps also President Bush Mr. Rumsfeld, Prime Minister Blair have all made the humanitarian situation and the situation about the Afghan civilians a major portion of their speeches tonight. How important is that for public opinion in this region? I, I think that's going to be extremely important. The second point with regard to the humanitarian uh, uh, assistance and the fact that there are going to be drops of 37,000 packages sometimes tonight or early tomorrow morning will make an enormous difference here because it will establish that when there is talk about four facets to the action political diplomatic military and humanitarian then there will be a genuine content to the humanitarian and this will give a degree of confidence in the statements that this is not a war against Afghanistan this is not a war against the Afghan people and that this is directed against Osama and his associates and perhaps that the Taliban are uh, being targeted as part of the process of targeting Osama and his associates. Now, as you hear the words coming out of various Western capitals, even out of your own government, who finally made the leap that it's probably the end of a Taliban-controlled Afghanistan, how do you see a broad-based alliance shaping up? Well, uh, 
I think, I think uh, one must be clear that in the reconciliation, all the ethnic groups in Afghanistan have to be represented in proportion, in proportion to their share of the population in Afghanistan. But that in itself is not enough. If you take a look at the Northern Alliance, for instance, the Northern Alliance, uh, General Dostam, whom I, I knew personally. One of the warlords up there. One of the warlords, he's the Uzbek uh, uh, commander. He hated uh, Amit Shah Masood, but I think had a certain amount of respect for him. For Fahim, he would have only contempt. Uh, Amit Shah Masood, the legendary commander who the was legendary assassinated. Commander, the mm -hmm. late Amit Shah Masood. Oh, uh, uh, Dostam made no secret of his hatred for him, but he had a sneaking respect for him. For Fahim, he doesn't he even have uh, hatred. But briefly, Just is contempt. it going to be workable? Are they going to be able to get all these people to agree? Well, that's, that's exactly the point I'm making, that left on their own, as people of equal stature, considering themselves as people of equal stature, the prospect of getting together is rather remote. On the other hand, if they do have a figure that they recognize as more than primus inter pares, this, this must be somebody who is clearly above them. First among then, equals. Uh, well, not first more among equals, but not, not among the equals. He must be clearly superior. In that case, the prospect does exist. And of course, this raises the question of only one figure. The and, former uh, king. Yeah, with the former king. I, I don't think it's going to be for a very long time, but he can provide a period mm -hmm. in which some sort of Loi Jirga or tribal council can be called and something of a coalition can emerge. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. And clearly everybody is looking to this post-military campaign Afghanistan. Tonight, after it was announced that the military action had started, the Pakistani cabinet met. There was a statement issued by the foreign ministry saying that they hoped that very soon the international community would make every effort to form a national reconciliation government to pour aid and economic reconstruction into Afghanistan. They also said that they regretted that the Taliban had resisted all their efforts to get them to agree to the international community's demands but now military action was underway they hoped that it would be swift and that it would stick to the military aims and the aims enshrined within the UN Security Council resolutions those are the aims against uh, terrorism and also that it would cause minimum uh, damage to the Afghan people Aaron uh, Christian again it's about 1 30 1 40 in the morning in Pakistan people will get up the papers will be out and that will tell us a good deal about how Pakistan is going to react to all of this. That's exactly right. And some of the parties have called for demonstrations tomorrow. And it does remain to be seen whether, now that military action has started, this is a turning point or not, in terms of whether they will be able to bring demonstrators out into the streets in bigger numbers than they have been able to over the last month or so. So far, the demonstrations, the anti-American demonstrations, have been much, much smaller than this government feared. Christian, thank you. Christian Amanpour, the last month or so, we are almost... Uh, coming up Tuesday will be one month since the attack on the Trade Center, four weeks. Kamal Haider, who reports for us from uh, inside Afghanistan in areas controlled by the Taliban principally, though we won't go any farther than that. Kamal, are you able to provide us with uh, any more detail on the, on the nature of the attacks, the targets? Well, the nature of the targets, I think, uh, it clearly illustrates that uh, the key uh, objective is airfields. Uh, a little while ago, uh, Kandahar, uh, our Kandahar Bureau told us that were unconfirmed reports of uh, yet another strike from people living closer to the airport. And if true, that would be the third wave. Jalalabad at the moment in eastern Afghanistan is not reporting any further strikes. There are also now reports indicating that there was a strike in Farah province, which is uh, above Kandahar on the way to Herat. And of course the confirmation about the uh, blast uh, or the uh, direct hit at the fuel depot on Herat Air Base. Okay, um, and uh, just run that, just one point there. Are they saying that the, that the people you're talking to, are they saying there are no more attacks going on, they're not hearing any attacks now, or they're continuing? I lost that in the background noise here. Yeah, I, I was saying that uh, Kandahar is the only place where there may have been a third attack, but no confirmation. The airport is about 30 kilometers from the city, 
Unless uh, the explosions are very large, um, it's not clear. It is possible that there may have been secondary explosions. Not clear, but uh, the, uh, at this moment, Kandahar is the only place reporting possibly a third strike. Uh, no reports coming in from Jalalabad. Our chap in Jalalabad has not been uh, giving us more information, which means that uh, Jalalabad is quiet. Um, no reports of Jalalabad airport being hit, uh, but that missiles uh, or the um, uh, two fighter bombers that attacked in Jalalabad area struck targets to the south of the city where allegedly uh, there may be camps uh, run by Osama bin Laden. Kamal Haider, thank you. We'll stay in touch. Um, just one or two quick things here. Um, this day has already produced a number of, um, for lack of a better word, fascinating quotes that we'll all remember in the days ahead. Uh, Ari Fleischer coming out at uh, about 12.30 Eastern Time saying, we are beginning another front in our war against terrorism so freedom can prevail over fear. The president upon returning from Camp David saying to a senior aide, I gave them fair warning. And Secretary Rumsfeld in his most animated, steely look uh, at his briefing saying there's no way the United States can protect every possible target from terrorists there is only one way to fight this quote to take this battle to the terrorists and that is exactly what's happened the United States is taking the battle to Afghanistan today Judy I believe uh, Aaron I believe uh, we have uh, our uh, our military analyst General Don Shepard uh, available now here in Washington am I right there yes. you are, and also General Wes Wesley Clark. To both of you, um, a question about this whole notion or concept of carpet bombing. For many of us, this has a fairly, it conjures up a fairly crude image of just dropping bombs uh, across a wide area without regard to what's down there. Um, it, General Clark, to you first, what would be the purpose of carpet bombing and is it possible to be sensitive to civilian casualties when you're doing that? Well, I'm confident that this, these bombs wouldn't be dropped in areas where there were any civilians. Th this approach would be appropriate where, for example, there's a training facility outside of a town and you have a number of buildings, maybe some physical training activities, some ranges, maybe some ammunition dumps, and rather than trying to pinpoint with a single bomb each one, you might want to run a string of bombs very precisely over the area. Another time that we use this technique is, let's say we're going after an airfield. What we discovered in, in the Kosovo campaign was that if you bomb an airfield very precisely with a bomb and it strikes a runway and makes a hole, the next day a bulldozer comes out fills in the hole and the runways in use. But if you run a B-52 over that same airfield and it drops a pattern of about 50 bombs, it creates so much destruction on the ground that it's very difficult to put the airfield back in use anytime soon. So these would be the times. And this, this bombing is precise. It's not scattering bombs and certainly not directed against civilians. And, and uh, General Shepard, just to pick up on that point about civilians, we did hear the former Pakistan ambassador to the United States tell Christian just a few minutes ago that the reaction in that part of the world will be uh, in large part, uh, will have a great deal to do, he suggested, with the number of civilian casualties. Clearly, civilians will be part of this, won't they? Well, unfortunately, uh, in every conflict, we have had uh, innocent civilians killed in one way or another. But the term carpet bomb is not something that we need to conjure up images of World War II. General Clark uh, described very accurately what we use uh, area targets for. We use dumb bombs. These are not laser guided bombs, but regular bombs that are not guided to drop on area targets such as training camps that may cover several acres. We also run for every attack a uh, computer model to see what the collateral damage might be. Uh, we hope in no cases will civilians be involved, but I can assure you, as we have been assured, that in no case will the United States uh, uh, attack uh, innocent civilians intentionally. All right, uh, General Shepard, General Clark, I have another question for you all about 
uh, targets uh, in Afghanistan, but right now let's go back to Aaron for something. Aaron? Yeah, well, it, it, this just fits into the conversation awfully well. Um, Al Jazeera has just uh, been talking or is currently talking to someone from the foreign ministry, the Taliban foreign ministry, who was discussing the kinds of casualties that they have been taking, they, the Taliban, have been taking. Um, we'll listen in, see if we can, uh, if they're still talking about it. If not, we'll, we'll dip back to you guys. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, they I think there's uh, an attack and uh, uh, may God help us in shooting down uh, another plane. Uh, is uh, this attack uh, came out after a period of silence? Uh, yes, it's been renewed now and maybe as you see if through the camera, uh, the attack has been renewed. Uh, are they planes or, uh, or missiles? Uh, uh, there are missiles. Uh, we worked with Mr. Muhammad Qasim uh, from the Taliban this is an interview with uh, a member of the foreign ministry, the Taliban foreign ministry being conducted by Al Jazeera. Um, earlier he discussed, the minister discussed the casualties and, uh, uh, they had been taken, that are being taken. Obviously there is no way at this point for us uh, to verify any of this, uh, but it's interesting to hear what they are saying. All Mujahideen are uh, defending themselves. There, uh, we shot down uh, a plane in Farah province. What is the type of the plane? The details uh, are not ready and when they are ready we shall uh, supply them to you. But we shot the plane. Do you have an idea about the nature of the uh, of the targets and the casualties. The information always uh, ready, uh, they are available to me, no need to worry, there are certain uh, targets uh, and all Mujahideen, uh, they are in their trenches and they haven't been hurt. And uh, in Kabul, the news agencies said that uh, uh, the, uh, the airfield. Again, this is an interview uh, uh, being done by Al Jazeera in, uh, in the Middle East of a minister uh, within the foreign ministry, the Taliban, and he is renewing a claim that they shot down a western plane. It doesn't say whether it's a U.S. or a British plane, both apparently involved. The Pentagon about an hour or so ago said it had no knowledge that it had lost any planes in this first wave of attacks uh, on Afghanistan. And as Jamie McIntyre pointed out at the time, uh, the Pentagon would not say that a plane was down, in fact, because as soon as a plane goes down, rescue operations are put into play, and they don't want to do anything to jeopardize that most sensitive, most critical operation, pulling a pilot out of hostile territory. Uh, Judy, you had more with uh, Generals Clark and Shepard. I do, but before I do, I just want to make uh, what I thought was a very interesting point, picking up from the newscaster there with Al Jazeera. He asked the Taliban official, uh, in essence, based on what we heard Osama bin Laden say in that tape, expressing pleasure, uh, satisfaction with the attacks in the United States on September the 11th, he turned to the Taliban official and said, well, is this in effect uh, confirming that Osama bin Laden and his network are responsible for what happened? And I noticed there was a long pause in the, uh, the Taliban official, uh, and then he went on to make a very brief non-answer and I think this was in a segment that we aired maybe about an hour ago from that from mm -hmm. that same uh, interview yes back to the generals I do have a, another question uh, General Don Shepard uh, General Wesley Clark joining us um, General Clark it's been stressed to us and we heard again today from Secretary Rumsfeld there are few what he calls high-quality targets 
in Afghanistan. If that's the case, why is it necessary to come at them with this enormous array of firepower on the part of the United States and Great Britain? Well, for a couple of reasons, Judy. First, because if we bring a mass of firepower in early, we have a better chance of catching the targets in a less prepared posture and we get more psychological impact. Secondly, even though there are not really high quality targets, that is to say, they're not going to be decisive perhaps against the Taliban, they could change the correlation of forces on the ground, giving the Northern Alliance significant advantages. These may not be the targets that we would, uh, would like to plan uh, a major war against in a, in a conventional kind of war, but they may be very significant targets on the ground when the Northern Alliance is confronting the Taliban in its uh, planned offensive. And General Shepard, just to be even more specific about what the, what the Taliban forces have, I and mean, we're talking about just a very small number of, of military aircraft, isn't that right? Maybe a dozen or less? Uh, as far as aircraft goes, you're probably right as far as airplanes in commission. But Judy, there's a big difference between uh, high quality targets and important targets. In the beginning of any military operation, we must gain air superiority, which means we have to take down uh, their radars and also their communications mechanisms. So we're after things that are important from a military standpoint. Every military force needs to eat, they need to move, and they need to be resupplied with ammunition, food, and uh, uh, gasoline, petroleum. Uh, all of those things become important military targets. We're not after the standard things that we think of, such as dams, bridges, huge power plants, refineries, as we saw in the Gulf War. But these are very important targets that we must take out in the early hours to weaken uh, the Taliban, as General Clark expressed. And General Clark, as we're going after this variety of targets, some of them, uh, we talked about this a moment ago, uh, clearly getting closer to civilian uh, population. Mm -hmm. At what point does the United States, does any, uh, power coming in like this, attacking like this, run the risk of overkill, if you will. Well, we're always going to be very, very cautious about any target that might harm innocent civilians. In fact, I'm sure these targets have been engineered carefully, what we call um, targeteering. We've looked at what weapon has to be used, what the approach to the target has to be, so if the bomb somehow goes off course, if it misses in some way, it will do the minimum amount of damage. We're going to use the smallest weapon possible. We're going to do everything possible to minimize the risk to any civilians who might be anywhere near any of these targets. Accidents can happen, but uh, we're going to do everything we can to minimize the chance of an accident happening here. Now, with respect to the issue of civilian casualties, of course, we know very well that this is an extremely sensitive issue. It's something the U.S. US military been aware of for some time. We've worked very hard to prevent it. And, of course, our adversary in this case knows that it's a sensitive issue also. We may go back two and a half years to the Operation Allied Force in Kosovo. We saw on the very first night of the operation precisely the same claims made by Slobodan Milosevic and his generals against the Allied air attack. In fact, in that operation, you may recall, they had actually collected all of the people in all of the hospitals in Belgrade and then brought them together in one location and tried to take the news media in to show them that these were the people injured in the air attack. Of course, they weren't. The other thing we saw in that operation, again, was the claim that they had shot down a number of Allied aircraft. Of course, they hadn't. And so this is the kind of thing that we can expect coming from the Taliban side at this, at this time. In fact, given their poor communications and the dispersion of the attacks, it's highly unlikely that they know exactly what has been struck or what the casualties even are among Taliban military personnel at this point. It'll take some time to, for them to sort that out. And, and just picking up on that point, General Shepard again, um, and I know you all have talked about this before, but we are dealing, or the United States, is dealing with people who, uh, they may be out in the open to some extent, but we also know that they are holed up. I mean, the President, President Bush keeps talking about how they're hiding in caves, they're holed up somewhere. What, how do these forces that we're hearing described by the Defense Secretary and others, and what you all are talking about, how do they get at the kind of targets in, in people that we are dealing with here? Well, Judy, it's a, 
uh, it's a case of we, we watch for signs. We've been watching for a long time now with a suite of what we call sensors. Every time a person moves these days, every time they talk, every time they do anything, it leaves a trail, either a paper trail, an electronic trail, or a visual trail. We watch all of those and we develop patterns. Now we have weapons that will go about just about everything that they have. But we have to be very careful when we use those weapons that they, they, are, they, they give the results that we're after. So we've, we've got the ability to find these people, but it's going to take a long period of time and we're going to be very, very careful about how we do it. And, uh, and of course, as President Bush himself and Secretary Rumsfeld again stressed today, this is a long, sustained campaign. All right, General Shepard, General Clark, we've been talking to the two of you all afternoon and we'll continue to be talking to you on into the evening. Uh, there is, of course, the question uh, of a congressional role in this, and we've come back to this uh, from time to time. I want to bring in now our congressional correspondent, Jonathan Carl, uh, to help us understand, Jonathan, what exactly, from a, uh, a legal point of view, from a, a legislative point of view, has the president been authorized to do in this military action? Well, Judy, on September 14th, the Congress came in and drafted and passed virtually unanimously an authorization of, for the use of force in this case. It was passed by the United States Senate 100 to 0, by the House of Representatives 420 to 1. That resolution was a very short resolution and a very specific one, and it authorized the use of force against all those involved in the September 11 attacks. Let me read because it's important to get the exact language to see it, what exactly the Congress has authorized the President to do. Uh, it authorized him to take, quote, actions against those nations, organizations, or persons that he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11th, and also against those who harbored such organizations or persons. So clearly in this case, uh, the Congress, among talking very specifically about the, the, the regime in, uh, in Afghanistan, the Taliban regime, and also again about the Al-Qaeda network, possibly authorizing action far beyond just Afghanistan, uh, but very clearly the way this has been interpreted by congressional leaders has been an authorization of precisely the kind of force that we see now taking place in Afghanistan, uh, which is why it might not be surprising that we have seen the statement come out, the unified statement from all four congressional leaders expressing their strong support for the military action. Also, Judy, just a few minutes ago we got a statement from Joe Biden, who is the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a Democrat. He also offering a very short statement saying that he, quote, I join all Americans in supporting President Bush. At the time that that resolution was passed on September 14th, Joe Biden said on CNN that he believed it was the equivalent of a declaration of war. He said that constitutionally there is no difference between what the Congress did on September 14, authorizing the use of force and a declaration of war. Uh, and that's, uh, that's basically what we're looking at here, and we expect to see many more statements in the next hours and days from key congressional leaders expressing virtually unconditional support for this action in Afghanistan. The Congress was very specific, though, Judy, in saying that the action that was being authorized for the president was specifically had to be dealing with that September 11th attacks. It, was, it, the, it could go against those that were involved in the attacks or those who harbored those of the attacks, but the, but the resolution was very specific in, in putting that date in there. The, res, the, the force must be used against those that could be tied in some way to the September 11th attacks. And uh, John Carl, I have one more question for you, but I want, for any of you who are tuning in, as we are very close to approaching the 5 o'clock uh, time on the East, on the East Coast, uh, the United States has launched uh, military strikes uh, strikes against military installations and terrorist training camps in Afghanistan and we are now in the fourth well into the uh, we're into the fifth hour of those attacks which started about 1230 today Eastern Time. John, one other uh, quick question to wrap this up. In order, let me put it this way, what would Congress need to do if the administration were to escalate somehow to go to the next step or or is it felt that the administration at this point can pursue pretty much whatever it needs to do in this campaign well the resolution also makes reference to the the war powers resolution uh... which says that the president must keep the congress notified and must continue to get approval for congress as uh... he goes about executing force around the globe this resolution uh... many said at the time and we're seeing now in the statements that are coming out was, would not necessarily be limited just to Afghanistan. Anybody that was in any way tied with the organizations that did these attacks or harboring those who did the attacks. 
So uh, there, there's not clear, the, the president, let's say the, if the president wanted to take further action against other nations that he deemed had something to do with the attacks, say Iraq. Well, under this resolution, it was said at the time, that would be authorized as long as it could be clearly established to the Congress that the nations that the president was taking actions against had something to do with the September 11th attacks. This was not a blank check allowing the president to go after any terrorist organization anywhere in the world. To do that, congressional leaders would say the president needs to get further authorization. But as long as the actions are brought against somebody or nations that were directly tied in some way to that September 11th attack, this resolution authorizes that force. And as long as it could be clearly established, of course, uh, leaves a lot of room for uh, interpretation sure. down the road if we get to that point. Mm -hmm. All right, John Carl at the Capitol, and it is a little bit after 5 o'clock in the East. Let's go back to Aaron in Atlanta. Thanks. I know. Uh, thank you, Judy. I know a lot of people are coming in and out. It is a Sunday afternoon. Football games are being played around the country. It's the last day of the baseball season. All of this seems somewhat incongruous. To what we've been talking about for the last five hours, which is war. Uh, but life in the country is going on, and we can report as best we know there have been no incidents here in this country. We, we can only imagine the concern in some of these stadiums around the country, at airports around the country, but all is well so far. Here is where we are at 5 o'clock Eastern Time on this Sunday in October for nearly five hours now. U.S.-led forces, the British are involved, have struck at targets across Afghanistan. They are <coughs> excuse me, using missiles launched from the sea, as well as conventional and guided bombs delivered by B-1 and B-2 bombers. Some of those flights coming from the United States, B-52 bombers, are being used as well. British military forces are assisting the United States with Operation Enduring Freedom. The targets include aircraft and air defense systems in Taliban controls area, uh, tal Taliban controlled areas of Afghanistan, including sites near Kabul and Kandahar, other parts of the country as well. Early reports say the Taliban command center and radar system at the Kandahar airport has been destroyed. The Ministry of Defense in Kabul is also believed to have been damaged, certainly a likely target. The Taliban official in Pakistan vowed the attacks would, quote, unify the Afghan nation. And at the Pentagon, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld described the mission as, quote, continuous. He said no U.S. planes had been hit by Taliban forces. And he said today's campaign is the first step in a long war against terrorism. And that is very briefly where we have been for the last five hours since this attack began. Jamie McIntyre is at the center of it. He's at the Pentagon trying to get what information he can. Jamie? Well, Aaron, let me just wrap up just quickly. What has actually gone on in this military campaign? And this is just uh, the beginning of uh, what the United States is trying to do on many fronts. Uh, but so far today, what we're talking about is there have been airstrikes from 15 land-based long-range bombers, including B-1s, B-2s, and B-52s. There have been strikes from 25 carrier-based aircraft, both on the U.S. aircraft carrier Carl Vinson and the USS Enterprise in the Arabian Sea. Uh, the whole thing started with a volley of cruise missiles that came from four U.S. Uh, surface ships, one American submarine and one British submarine lobbing a total of about 50 cruise missiles at a w wide range of targets. The targets include uh, ter suspected terrorist training camps, uh, airplanes, airstrips, command and control centers, um, and uh, uh, areas in which uh, uh, the, that were military targets connected to the Taliban. The whole idea of this campaign is to change the balance of power in Afghanistan uh, so that the Taliban does not have the iron grip on control that it once had and to send a message that the United States is going to continue to uh, target anyone who harbors terrorism. Today at this uh, Pentagon briefing, uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld stressed that this will also, this campaign will also include humanitarian assistance and that some uh, humanitarian airdrops had already begun just shortly before his briefing. The message is to try to tell the uh, Afghan people that they are not targeting uh, the people, but they are targeting terrorists. Secretary Rumsfeld. The world stands united in this effort. It is not about a religion or an individual terrorist or a country. Our partners in this effort represent nations and peoples of all cultures, all religions, and all races. We share the belief that terrorism is a cancer on the human condition 
and we intend to oppose it wherever it is. Now asked about whether the United States had put any ground troops on the ground in Afghanistan, Secretary Rumsfeld said simply that there would be parts of the mission that would be visible and parts that would be invisible. Uh, he said, however, uh, the obvious, which is that there, if there were a large number of American troops in Afghanistan, it would be known, it would be fairly obvious uh, that that was taking place. They certainly didn't rule that out in the future. And he also indicated that the uh, humanitarian airlifts of uh, supplies, food and medicine, and also uh, uh, leaflets and other uh, information operations uh, would continue into the uh, into the future. Aaron? Well, yeah, he said it would be obvious that there were a large number of forces in there and um, I, I think we, we've had some reporting over the last couple of weeks about small units, commando units, special ops units uh, being in there. It's certainly reasonable to expect that the government is doing everything it can to gather what intelligence it can. It's not been an area that's been very intelligence rich for the United States. Well, one of the things that you might see at work here is, you may recall that during the, uh, and General Clark can probably talk a little bit about this, uh, but e during the 1999 war in Yugoslavia, the United States relied on uh, forces on the ground, the uh, Kosovo Liberation Army, uh, uh, to inflict damage on the ground against Serb forces without having to put U.S. ground troops in that position by simply backing them up with air power. Again, the United States is in a position where they have uh, an enemy of, uh, of their enemy who is their friend and that is the, uh, uh, the Northern Alliance. If the United States alters the balance of power the Northern Alliance may do some of the work of destabilizing the Taliban and putting them on the run without the United States having to put ground troops in itself. However, the U.S. may also want to establish some sort of base of operations, so we'll just have to see what they do. Well, it's not unlike what the United States did in backing the Mujahideen in the war against the Soviets, and uh, sometimes you, you, you got to be careful who your friends are. It doesn't always work out. Jamie, th oh, Jamie, before you go away, there was a report on the plane. Uh, the Taliban claimed that the plane had been shot down. Uh, briefly, anything on that? Just quickly, the Pentagon says there's no reason to believe that report. Uh, they have no reports of any planes lost. Thank you very much. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Matthew Chance is in Afghanistan. Actually, uh, Matthew, we've been talking to on the phone this afternoon, is uh, fairly close to where some of the uh, missiles and bombs have dropped, um, 20 kilometers or so, if my memory is right. Matthew, is it still going on? That's right, certainly is, uh, Aaron. Uh, in fact, there have been more explosions uh, lighting up the skies over Kabul within just the last few minutes. There were two explosions about 30 seconds apart, uh, followed by intense anti-aircraft fire. Let me just briefly tell you that I'm in a position, as you say, about 20 kilometers north of Kabul. I can't actually see the city itself because there's a big mountain in the way, but we, we, and it's very dark here. It's just after 1.30 in the morning uh, local time. But you can see these uh, large explosions that are literally lighting up the sky uh, over the mountain, uh, beyond which, of course, uh, lies Kabul. Uh, from the position of the Northern Alliance, the anti-Taliban forces with whom I'm based right now, uh, the order has been issued to uh, commence a bombardment or continue their bombardment of Taliban positions at just two kilometers from where I'm standing right now. And it's certainly been doing that every few minutes. There's been deafening barrages of rockets and tank fire uh, towards Taliban positions and, and towards Kabul itself. Uh, they say, the commanders of the Northern Alliance say they're aiming at streams of cars apparently uh, pouring out of, of Kabul towards the front line with their lights on, so it's very easy to see them in the otherwise pitch dark here. Uh, the Northern Alliance say that the Taliban have been reinforcing their positions, uh, uh, delivering people to the front line positions through these cars. It's not possible for us at this stage, though, Aaron, uh, to give you exact details on what kind of damage uh, is being uh, inflicted. Daylight is expected to arrive here around four or five hours from now. Um, and it's reasonable, it is a reasonable guess, and that's all it is, that as daylight approaches, these attacks will wind down. Um, it's as simple as it's just safer for, it's safer for the pilots, certainly, to, uh, to come in. Uh, Matthew, thanks. We have, um, 
we know from our reporting, for example, that uh, the, the number of sites that have been hit, and this gives you a sense of the broadness of the attacks across uh, the country of Afghanistan, um, each of them important in somewhat different ways, I, I guess. Kandahar important, it's, it's, it's a good sized city. It's also psychologically important. It's where the Taliban uh, are based, um, principally where the principal Taliban leadership lives in, and uh, works and prays in Kandahar. Kabul, of course, the capital. Jalalabad, uh, at least the area outside Jalalabad, is an area where there have been a number, uh, there are reports of a number of terrorist bases, whether those bases uh, remain active or not, uh, we do not know. We know they hit, um, or we believe, uh, they, are, they have hit uh, a f perhaps an oil depot in Herat to the west, up uh, fairly close to the Iranian border. Um, and we also know the, uh, the Iranians uh, have, have said that there was a statement out of Iran today, uh, we would add here, that they deplore this attack. Uh, so whatever else was going to happen from the Iranians, we're not going to get, we the United States, the United States is not going to get support from the Iranians. The Iranians said these attacks will, however, push the United States into another dilemma, which not only the Americans, but the whole region will have to pay that from the Iranian government today. Judy. Afghanistan's, uh, Aaron, Afghanistan's neighbor to the east, uh, Pakistan, of course, playing a critical role in the diplomatic, uh, even the military efforts leading up to today's uh, attack. Uh, CNN's Christiane Amanpour joining us now where she's been uh, for the last several hours in Islamabad. Christiane, it was uh, by my calculation 9.30 at night when this all began. It's now, what, about 2 o'clock, a little after 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, how are officials there following and staying informed on what is going on in Afghanistan. Well, they've, you know, there's a people in Pakistan, the military government here and, and governments in the past have enormous numbers of resources and methods of communication with Afghanistan. We too have been able to piece together a picture from this long distance by talking to our sources inside Afghanistan. We just called again to Kandahar where we spoke to our CNN employee there in Kandahar who says that there it has been quiet for at least the last uh, hour or hour and a half. In addition, just to repeat, when we've been talking to our sources and other sources is inside Taliban controlled Afghanistan. They mentioned the towns that have been portrayed on the map you just showed, but all of them talk about how airfields outside of the town they believe have been targeted. None have told us that the centers of those towns have been hit. We've been told about Kandahar, Jalalabad, Kabul, uh, and Herat, and all of those, as I say, we've been told are uh, uh, outside, a considerable distance outside the towns have been hit. We understand a radar station, a, a military installation in Kandahar, perhaps an airport Airport, but perhaps also a terrorist base in Jalalabad and that depot of oil uh, near the airport in Herat. All of those places do have those significant airfields. In addition, we were told that from Kandahar at least people started fleeing the city after the first wave of attacks. We've also heard from uh, Taliban officials who've been interviewed live on the Al Jazeera uh, Arabic cable network and they have sought to produce and to project a confident air. They've talked about the airstrikes, they've said that there are no casualties. They've said that a number of, of targets have been hit, but they've said sort of nothing, nothing to worry about yet is what they are saying. Here, the cabinet is meeting. The foreign ministry earlier set out a statement after the military attacks. The cabinet is meeting. And let me turn to our guest, Rifat Hussein, Pakistani defense analyst. What do you think the cabinet is meeting about right now? Well, I mean, they are, uh, they are thinking of devising a Pakistan's response, particularly keeping an eye on the uh, law and order situation, because even though it is at night and uh, it is night here and nobody knows what tomorrow will bring, but we have already seen some reports of spontaneous reaction. For example, in Rawalpindi, there were a very small demonstration, about 200 people. They came out and they were chanting anti-American, anti-Musharraf uh, anti and anti-Western slogans. So uh, tomorrow, uh, when people find out the extent of this damage, uh, the offices are open, the government has not closed down the educational institutions, so we may see some kind of an adverse public reaction. So that is something that will be the foremost on the, on the minds of the, uh, the people who are meeting in the cabinet. Now, the government has arrested or put under house arrest one of the hardline Islamic Party leaders here. How 
confident do you think are they that they will keep the situation under control like it's been over the last four weeks? Well, I think the, the, I mean, the, the very fact that the government has not uh, arrested uh, the leadership of most of these religious right parties does indicate a certain level of confidence that Musharraf has in his ability to cope with any, uh, uh, with any such situation. Uh, and they would not like to use excessive force or even give the impression that the government is being on the defensive and not institute any kind of harsh measures. So I think they are, they are going to go with some kind of a proportional response and a very well thought out strategy and they will see how the public sentiment on this particular issue unfolds and then deal with it accordingly. Now the leaders who have spoken today uh, about the military strikes both in America and in Britain have spoken very 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 loudly about the humanitarian situation, their desire not to attack the Afghan people, that this is not about an attack on Afghanistan but on targets that, that they've already identified. Uh, how, what, is, what are you going to be looking at to gauge how public opinion here reacts? Well, t tomorrow I think uh, most important going, is going to be the reaction that will come out of the mosques. Around 1.30 you will have you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, first, uh, the first prayer and depends on how many people go to the mosque and if these streams of people who are going to the mosque, if they are going to get together and will they be org organizing themselves and trying to take out some kind of a, uh, some kind of a procession. Well, that, 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 will be, that will be one indication. The other will be very early in the morning between 9 and 12 o'clock when most of the bazaars open and you, know, so you may see some kind of an attempt to organize some kind of a demonstration. But I think the, the people in Pakistan know about this because this has been all over but what kind of reaction will emerge uh, is something I think the next 10 to 12 hours are going to be are going to be critical in my own judgment we, the people who have already come out on the streets people who have been protesting are the same kind of people who are going to come out and protest mm -hmm. tomorrow and so far just to reiterate they've been very small and very yes, short lived absolutely, these, these absolutely. demos tonight absolutely absolutely well we'll watch for tomorrow thank okay, you thank Rifat you. Hussain and just to reiterate the government has put out a statement here saying that it regretted that all the efforts that it had made to get the Taliban to uh, accede to US and international demands have failed and that now this uh, military action has, under, has been undertaken and they said that they hoped that in the end the U United States, the international community would pour economic assistance and reconstruction efforts into Afghanistan as well as attempting to set up a national reconciliation government. And just one more issue, an important issue about Iran which neighbors Afghanistan. A very interesting report in the Washington Post suggests that it, it, European diplomats in Iran were told by members of the Iranian president's uh, office that the Iranians believe believe that Osama bin Laden was responsible for those attacks in the United States and would understand attacks being uh, retaliation being taken on those terrorist uh, operations inside Afghanistan but would never come out and say that publicly so that report would suggest uh, some very interesting views from inside Iran at this time Judy Christiane Amanpour and you're right that it was a fascinating uh, detail as Christiane said uh, reported in, uh, in the Washington Post. Uh, Christian reporting from Islamabad, Pakistan. And just uh, we would note in addition, uh, President Bush has now asked Secretary of State Powell to travel to Pakistan later this week as well as to India. It is now just about 20 minutes after the hour, after 5 o'clock in the east. We want to give you the latest developments at this hour, just shy of four weeks after a massive terrorist assault on the, on the United States. U.S. and British military forces are attacking key Taliban targets in Afghanistan. The Taliban say their radar system and command center at the Kandahar airport were destroyed in the airstrikes. Now, other reports say that the Taliban's Ministry of Defense in Kabul was also hit. Explosions were reported in Jalalabad as well. In this country, President Bush is emphasizing the global support for the attacks. He says Canada, Australia, Germany, and France have all pledged forces in the operation. And the president says more than 40 countries are permitting air transit or landing rights. Suspected terrorist mastermind Osama bin Laden, meantime, has made a taped statement available after the attacks. We don't know when this was originally taped. But in it, uh, bin Laden says Americans won't know safety or security until, he says, the U.S. changes its policies in the Islamic world. Aaron. Judy, thanks. Uh, we have joining us now former Secretary, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Uh, Mr. Kissinger is wise in the ways of diplomacy when it succeeds and when it doesn't. Uh, Mr. Secretary of State, welcome.
pleasure to be on. Um, what is the role of diplomacy now? What, uh, because clearly there is one. It's just different than it was uh, last night. Well, uh, diplomacy has already been very successful in enabling us to get the support of so many countries, some for participation, some for transit rights, some for intelligence cooperation. Uh, now, in uh, the next weeks, it will be necessary to hold this coalition together, which I'm sure we can do. And uh, I suppose if Taliban collapses, uh, to work out a transitional arrangement with, so that the people of Afghanistan can benefit from this action. What are the kinds of things that would threaten the coalition or could threaten the coalition? Well, if uh, both the President and the Secretary of Defense have said that any country that harbors terrorists will be considered outside the international community and therefore by implication subject to attack. Uh, I agree with that statement, but I'm not sure that all our coalition partners would agree with that statement. And at that point, the decision would have to be made uh, whether we will act on our best judgment or on the basis of what other countries support. But I agree with what both the President and the Secretary of Defense have said. But in, if I understood you, sir, correctly, what you're saying is that as long as the attacks are confined to Afghanistan, uh, confined to bin Laden and al-Qaeda, um, then the coalition probably holds together pretty well. If it, goes, if it goes beyond that is where it gets a little dicey. It gets dicey, and we will, uh, we will have a choice to make, but... Uh, it's fundamentally what we're doing is in the interest of of our allies as well because if if this uh, system of terrorism spreads they have even less capability of retaliating they have none so they are dependent on our support and critical those countries that might we're not suggesting they will waver, but countries that would be extraordinarily sensitive to the broadening of the military campaign would be which? Well, they'd be most Muslim countries, or many Muslim countries. And there one has to remember that some of the Muslim countries who might be, appear to be wavering in public would be cheering us on in private. They would be uh, taking into consideration their domestic opinion. So a, a country like Egypt, which has is walking a very fine line. They have serious problems with Islamic fundamentalists, or they have had. Uh, needs to be careful what it says for domestic political reasons. Yes, but, it, but they certainly, having problems with fundamentalists already, do not want to see them strengthened in the area. And, and the same is true of Saudi Arabia. And s some of our European allies might be nervous if this uh, continues beyond Afghanistan. And when you're sitting in the State Department and you're trying to hold this disparate group together, um, are you constantly calling people up, taking people's temperature, making sure everybody, you know, the care and feeding of these countries is going on as it should? Uh, if you are as skillful as uh, Secretary Powell has been, that, that's what you will do. Uh, one thing that I find I found interesting is when I was in office, even though telephone communications were good, to we did not do as much telephoning as is the case today. But I think it is now so much part of the scene that uh, it is necessary to make the calls that we read about. Uh, Mr. Kissinger, I, um, this is kind of it's an extraordinary day. I don't normally ask a question like this, but is there anything you want to say you haven't said? Uh, in the last 10 minutes or so, anything you wished I'd asked that I haven't asked? Well, first of all, I think uh, the American public should support uh, the president and should uh, keep in mind that this has been put together in a very skillful w way by very professional people. It cannot have an immediate outcome, but uh, it looks to me well designed, and therefore I think uh, we can all be very satisfied with how we have reacted to this outrage that took place September 11th.
Secretary Kissinger, thanks for joining us on a Sunday. We appreciate uh, your time and, and, and your knowledge. Thank you, sir. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger from his uh, home in Connecticut today. Judy. And Aaron, joining uh, me now here in the Washington studio is the representative or the envoy of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan. This, of course, is the group that has been fighting against the Taliban for some years. Haran Amin is an envoy and spokesman for the Northern Alliance. Uh, Mr. Amin, first of all, your reaction to what's happened today? Well, we, we do welcome uh, uh, the resolve by the international community to strike Osama bin Laden's uh, networks in Afghanistan, as well as uh, the facilities that the Taliban have provided for him. Uh, there is, is a very interlinked and intertwined relationship, and one could not be the slouch without the other. And in order for this between to Mr. Bin Laden and, and the Taliban, in the, the Taliban, indeed, and and, and the two have to be done. Uh, the, the rollback of the Taliban, as well as the hunt down of Osama bin Laden, have to be done together. This is the initial phase. We welcome it. I think we see it as an opportunity to be able to rid of Afghanistan uh, of the uh, hub of terrorists that have gathered in Afghanistan for so many years. And of course, we're ready on the ground. When the time comes, we'll engage also. Well, let me let me just ask you, in part, a question I put to some of the generals who are serving as our military. Military analyst. This is a very broad-based effort. We're going into the major population centers uh, with uh, bombs, with cruise missiles, and so forth. And yet, the people the United States is fighting hide in caves, go to places that may not be reachable by missiles uh, and bombs, yes. and unless we know precisely where they are. Yes. So how much headway do you think you can literally make against uh, an enemy like this? Well, uh, we have fought them in the past. Uh, we know the terrain, we know the geography, and what needs to happen is the rollback of the Taliban should precede anything else. With these target, with, with the specific targeting of the territories of the facilities of the Taliban, I think that could be made very feasible. They, uh, their communication uh, their uh, uh, air force capability, their ground capability. When that happens, the rollback is possible. With the rollback, with the utility of special ops, international communities, uh, special ops special forces. Special ops meaning? And special operations forces on going the ground. Going in on the ground. Going in on the ground, securing uh, specific positions, and then targeting those specific positions. I think this could be done. But it has to be first with the rollback of the Taliban, then the hunt down of these specific uh, camps and, and, and the caves and so on and so forth. What do you mean by rollback? Well, what I mean specifically is that the Taliban have to be pushed back, that they have to be pushed back from their positions that, at the front line of Afghanistan. They have to be targeted and, and from the ground force. But first... Right now they control 85% of the country. Right? Well, our estimates, uh, our estimates know, they, indicates that it's, it's in at forth. best 65% of the country, but uh, we already have estimations that uh, uh, a lot of them will face disarray. And we've already gotten 800 of them uh, that defected to us in Badris, about 200 in Larmont. So we see Just this in the, as last, in the last couple of days. In the last couple of days. Yes. Let me, as you, as you know, Mr. Amin, today, and again I'm talking with Haran Amin, who is uh, envoy to the United States and spokesman for the Northern Alliance, the group that's been fighting the Taliban for several years. Uh, today we had this videotape made available to us from Osama bin Laden. We don't know when it was taped, mm -hmm. but we did show most of it. Uh, just a few minutes ago we, we re-aired portion of it. Let me just read to you part of part of what he says here. He says these events, and he's talking about a succession of events, what the United States has done over years, have divided the whole world into two sides, the side of the believers and the side of the infidels. He's tr clearly trying to separate the United States and its allies from the world of Islam. Why is that not a successful tactic on his part? Well, it's not because he's victimized the Afghan nation. He's killed um, the many people of Afghanistan. I mean, what made uh, what makes him a better Muslim than Commander Massoud, whom he had assassinated just two days prior to the incidents of, uh, of, of, of September 11? And I, I see Massoud as the most devout person that I've known. He was the leader. He was the leader. He was, the, leader. He was the military leader of the United right. Front. Right. So it, it actually is not a justification. He's trying to uh, uh, somehow attract uh, some certain sort of uh, street sentiments in around the Muslim world, but it's not going to work in the end because people know better that a true Muslim is one who does not target innocent lives. All right, Haran Amin with the Northern Alliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, We Judy. appreciate it. Good to Thank see you. you. Thank you. Aaron. Thank you, Judy. We've, uh, we've been blessed this afternoon by some terrific reporting uh, in Afghanistan. It's obviously not an easy place to be and to report from. Kamal Haider back on the phone. Um, we don't we will say again we're not going to give his specific location suffice it to say he's close enough to see what's going on and to know what's going on Kamal what can you tell us 
Well, um, uh, the CNN chap in Jalalabad just called us, um, and he told us that a few minutes ago there was a, a, a bigger attack on Jalalabad. Uh, the aim, uh, the, the, the targets that they were trying to hit was uh, the camp at Tora Bora, uh, at Milawa, south of the city, and uh, towards the west, uh, Darunta. Anti-aircraft fire was heard initially, and the attack did not last too long, but uh, there was still some sporadic fire into the air. And just uh, to help and orient, I'm sorry, to help orient our viewers a bit, if you can go back to the map, guys uh, and gals, if you go back to the map, um, Jalalabad, uh, there it is, rests between, essentially, uh, or almost between uh, Kabul and Kandahar, and it's an area that uh, the government... Uh, Kabul and Peshawar, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, not Kabul and Kandahar, it would be on the Peshawar to Kabul Highway. Correct. It's the capital of Ningarhar province. Um, and we're just showing a map now that has Jalalabad on it, so people are a little better, <coughs> excuse me, oriented as to uh, where you are, or the area in which you're talking about. Now, having interrupted you and apologizing for that, go ahead. Well, perhaps we've lost, perhaps, uh, Kamal, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was asked, saying to you, if I interrupted you uh, in the middle no, you of... you didn't. Uh, okay. You didn't. I was just clarifying the uh, location of Jalalabad. Thank you. I'm sure it must be very hectic for you also. It's, it's reasonably hectic, but probably not what it's like there. Um, do, are you able to... Are you able to hear any of the continuing attacks from your location? I know you're doing a lot of phone work now, which is what reporters do. Are you able to uh, see it, hear it from where you are? No, uh, basically uh, I'm not able to hear anything, but uh, we have uh, a man uh, in Jalalabad and he has just reported to us. We have uh, our people in uh, Kandahar, as you know, CNN has people in Kandahar and uh, near Jalalabad and uh, they are reporting to us here at, uh, in eastern Afghanistan where we are located. Okay, Kamal, we'll talk again as you hear more. Um, that's a pretty good explanation for viewers in some ways how we're getting information. We have people uh, in a number of places around the country, not necessarily people you will ever uh, see on the air or hear, but they're in contact with co correspondents and producers passing along information. In many cases, it's the only safe way uh, for us uh, to operate in Afghanistan right now and uh, that's how we take care of business there. Major Garrett's at the White House. It's been a while since we talked. Good afternoon uh, to you again. Good afternoon, Aaron. We are beginning to piece together some of the extraordinary details of President Bush's weekend. We can tell you, for example, that the speech that he gave to the nation and to the world today announcing these joint military attacks by the United States and the British was being written at Camp David by, among others, the President, his top communications director, Karen Hughes, and Chief White House speechwriter Mike Gerson, also with the President at Camp David, the National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, and the CIA Director George Tenet. As John King has reported earlier today, the president began notifying members of Congress Saturday evening that he had given the go-ahead to the Pentagon to begin this military activity when they thought it best. The president arrived here at the White House this morning, about 10.40 a.m. He departed Marine One and went straight to the Oval Office. In the Oval Office, he told senior aides standing there with them, quote, I gave them fair warning. That quote comes from Ari Fleischer, the White House press secretary. The I gave them fair warning, a direct reference to the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. Ari Fleischer went on to say, and this is not a direct quote, but this is the essence of the president's words, and they chose not to heed it. From the Oval Office, the president then proceeded to the treaty room in the White House residence, and from there, he spoke the words that will clearly define his presidency and just as clearly define the first great military conflict of the 21st century. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. 
Aaron, it's also worth pointing out some extra security precautions taken here at the White House at just about that time or maybe shortly before the president's speech. Vice President Cheney, who was working from his West Wing office, was sent to a secret and undisclosed location. That as a security precautionary measure. The White House urges Americans not to read too much into that. They're just saying for the last three weeks, the White House around the compound has taken security precautions, and they're doing it again today with the vice president. Aaron? Major, thanks. I know you're a history buff. History does not allow you to pick your moments. They just happen to you. Uh, this president, uh, eight months ago talked well eight months ago one month ago was on the verge of pushing very hard for his education package was trying to find some common ground and a patient's bill of rights uh, all this whole s slate of domestic issues and but history uh, has other plans and it did for him history has other plans and i've often talked to uh White House speechwriters and senior White House officials about life in the White House. What is it like for them as they get used to this presidency? And they say, you know, they've done a lot of reading about history, and they say the one thing that they learned reading the history of other great leaders is that often events define you. You can sometimes seek events, you can sometimes seek an agenda, change the world, but often the world comes at you, and what you do at those moments define your presidency in ways you and the people you have been chosen to lead never imagined. And uh, thank you, Major. And as I'm sure the president knows, and we should all remind ourselves of, um, we're at the very, we the country, the United States is at the very beginning of something, not the end of anything. Uh, this is a long, as the government has said repeatedly, every, uh, every minister in the government, every sec uh, cabinet secretary, again and again, this is going to take a long time. It's a different kind of war. Patience is required. Uh, the country is just at the beginning of something. The tests for the government, for the administration, are just now beginning. Judy? And Aaron, that is exactly one of the points my guest just a moment ago, uh, Heron Amin, who's the envoy to the United States from the Northern Alliance. Of course, that we want to remind everyone again, this is the group that's been fighting the Taliban inside Afghanistan. He said, uh, after the interview, I said, was there anything else you wanted to say? We didn't have time to point out. He said, just to make sure the audience knows, Americans know, we know there will be casualties, people will be killed, people will be injured, but this is a long campaign. At the same time, he then went on to predict that given the firepower that's now coming raining down on the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda network, he said, I don't think they're going to last more than a week. And I think by that he was referring to the Taliban. Joining us now on the telephone uh, to get a, a better sense of uh, international reaction to today's events, Javier Solana, who is the European Union Defense Minister. He's joining us uh, on the phone from Luxembourg. Uh, Mr. Solana, first off, uh, how, from your perspective, uh, does this look like it is going? Well, we think that uh, this uh, operation is uh, fully legitimate uh, according to the UN Security Council. And uh, the European Union has uh, all the solidarity with uh, Euro uh, the United States in this operation. The fight against terrorism is our fight, and together we are going to win. At this point, uh, Mr. Solana, Minister Solana, I should say, uh, what exactly is the European Union, uh, Europe, the West, in your view, authorizing the U.S and Great Britain to do. Um, surely you're not saying they can do whatever they want. What, what are the limits, if you will, of what they've been authorized to do? Well, we have uh, full confidence that uh, the United States and Great Britain and other countries of the European Union, which are contributing with, uh, by other means, not directly involved at this point, but with uh, the help of uh, aerospace, bases, etc., we have full confidence that it will be done a targeted operation with their objective to defeat uh, terrorism. Uh, this is a long campaign that is not only, it has not only a military component, but it has also an enormous political component, share of information, uh, stopping the, 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 the financial the resources that arrive to these groups, uh, stopping the weapons that may arrive to these groups. So this is a battle in which we are all engaged. And, Mr. Minister, how much does this continued support on the part of the EU and other uh, Western nations, how much does that support hinge on, A, how successful this campaign is in getting the Taliban out of power, and, B, uh, on the an amount of civilian casualties? Well, the, the, the campaign, uh, we think, will be successful. We we are pretty sure they will be successful, and we will continue to, to, to count uh, on the support uh, of the European Union and the European Union people. 
You're saying without regard to uh, casualties, am I hearing Well, we know right that now? in a military operation, is, uh, it has risk, but uh, uh, I am sure, we are sure, that uh, the United States and the European countries which are participating will, uh, will have a very targeted operation. And uh, they will do their utmost uh, in order to, 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 to focus on the, on the responsible of the terrible crimes of the 11th of September and the infrastructure they have maintained them. All right, Javier Solana, who is the defense minister for the European Union. Thanks very much, Aaron. Judy, the uh, people who run the Emmys, the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, I guess it is, uh, were scheduled to hold their big event, one of television's big events uh, tonight. They are now in, I'm sure that's Los Angeles, to announce what their plan is. Um, the, these awards were scheduled to be given originally on the 16th of September, the Sunday after the attacks. Obviously, they were canceled then, and uh, we believe they will be canceled or postponed yet again. Um, and as soon as uh, all of these players are seated where they're supposed to be, um, they will formalize what we believe to be true that the 53rd annual Hello, Emmys everybody. will be canceled. In just a minute. Um, I'll make the introductions. Obviously, um, this happened, this is a, an announcement that came at the very 11th hour today. So there will be questions that just simply can't be answered at this point. But the three people on the stage here um, can answer as many as possible within the respective areas. So we'll do our best to get those. If there's some I don't knows, we'll try to get you to those immediately following. You know, there's a lot of you in this room. We ask the, to maintain the normal press conference protocol in which, you know, raise your hand. We'll identify you. Please name your outlet, ask your question. Um, to my immediate right is Don Misher, executive producer of the Emmys. In the center, Leslie Moonves, president and chief executive officer of CBS. And on the, my far right, Bryce Abel, chairman of the Television Academy. We're happy to take your questions. Uh, we're not at this point calling it a cancellation. We're looking into all the options. As you can all imagine, we've had very little time to think about this. Uh, we've simply gone ahead and said, for now, we're postponing. So there will be no winners announced at this point. But obviously, we're going to have to look into that very quickly. Jan? I didn't receive calls from any stars. I did speak to uh, the uh, executives at the other three networks. Uh, I did speak to a number of executive producers from various shows throughout town. Um, everybody, there was a general feeling of people feeling uncomfortable, uh, people feeling it was not a day to celebrate, certainly, not a day to go up there and uh, accept the best supporting actress in the comedy. Uh, it seemed like it was trivial. So there wasn't, there wasn't, it, it was the community really coming together and expressing sort of the same feeling that it would be the wrong thing to do to come together tonight. There wasn't a discussion of possibly taking the show and airing it at a later date? No, that, that never came up. Mark? Well, my day started on the golf course, but I didn't make it all the way through. Um, uh, I did receive a call very early on. I left. I, I quickly got on the, you know, it was from uh, my scheduling guy first and Andrew Hayward, who you know very well, president of CBS News, telling me what the situation was. Um, when I arrived home quickly thereafter, Bryce was on the phone, and Bryce and I had been speaking throughout the day uh, on, on numerous occasions. Um, I either called them or I did receive calls from all the other networks and it was a constant discussion. I spoke to Chris Ender, who you all met, head of press, and there, there were a thousand considerations going into this decision today. Um, you know, first and foremost, we're, where were we as a community and where were we in relationship to the country and, and uh, you know, there were, you know, for four or five hours the phone didn't stop ringing. Uh, with all these guys and everybody weighing in and pro and con, and then we all came to the, I think, the same decision simultaneously. Jerry? Uh, 
Uh, the security issue is a big one here, and, and I, I want to answer that directly. Uh, we have maintained contact with all our security agencies involved here, and that includes the FBI. Um, however, I want to make one thing very clear. Uh, the decision to postpone the telecast tonight is not based on any specific threats. No new information was developed or conveyed to us in any way that would imply that uh, this uh, telecast would have presented another target. The LAPD, the FBI, our own ME security people all basically told us the show was good to go from a security point of view. In fact, from a security point of view, they felt that today would have been better than, say, tomorrow or the day after. So our decision was made uh, for the various reasons that Les just talked about. I think all our days began uh, either turning on the TV or listening to the radio or someone we know calling us and saying, have you seen what's happening? And then trying to find out what the town thought was appropriate to do about uh, the situation. And, and that's really been the defining moment for us. That's Bryce Tony? Sable, who uh, runs the Emmys, the National Academy of Television Arts and Scientists. Science uh, scheduled for, or their awards were scheduled for tonight. Um, they've been postponed. They clearly don't know where they're going with that. It's too early for them to know. We talked to him the other day, and he talked about how they had redone the whole production to put part of it in New York and part of it in L.A. They had never done that before, and now they will have to plan it again. As I was listening to that, I. I thought, you know, how trivial sometimes these things seem, but in fact it is a part of life. Uh, the football games were played across the country today. Baseball uh, wound up its regular season. Barry Bonds hit his 73rd home run, uh, an all-time record, as most of you know. The Seattle Mariners up in the Northwest were trying to win their 117th game. No team in baseball had ever done that. I suppose no one will remember any of that. We will remember this day for... Uh, in the way we should, I guess, or for the day that that this new war uh, began. But life outside of here and uh, across the country has gone on on this Sunday. Uh, we turn to Paul Bremer, who is uh, an official in the Reagan administration, expert on counterterrorism, and he joins us, uh, I assume, from Washington. Uh, good evening to you. I got the administration right, didn't it? It's the Reagan administration. And I'm in Washington. Thank you. I'm, I'm two for two here. Uh, tell me, uh, just tell me how to, we ought to look at, at the field of play at this moment. We'll go from there. Well, I think there are two things. First, the administration has done a really extraordinary job in the, setting the diplomatic table for this uh, operation. The president spoke today about having representing the collective will of the, of, the, of the world, and I think that's true. It's an extraordinary coalition they've pulled together. But we are really only at the beginning of the beginning here. Um, the operations in Afghanistan will have a military and a political and a humanitarian dimension. And as the President said and as Secretary Rumsfeld said, that's really only the beginning because in the long run, what we've got to do is deny terrorists safe havens. And that's the strategic objective that goes beyond Afghanistan. But that's such, we were talking a bit ago uh, to uh, former Secretary of State Kissinger, and one of the things he talked about was the danger of this extraordinary coalition um, uh, falling apart, maybe is a bit strong, but starting to see countries break off. Um, as the battle against terrorism expands beyond Afghanistan. So there's a kind of never-ending diplomatic work to be done. Well, it's certainly true, as Dr. Kissinger said, that there are risks. On the other hand, I'm sure he would also agree that if the United States acts robustly and effectively in this first stage, that is to say, dealing with the Taliban and the terrorist groups in Afghanistan, the chances of our getting support in the next stage, which is going to other countries which are providing safe haven, are much higher. People will then see that we are really serious, we will have demonstrated by our actions in Afghanistan that we mean to be, as the President said, comprehensive and relentless in our pursuit of terrorism. And I think there will be strains in the coalition, no question. But I think the sine qua non for moving on is great success in this first phase. Let me offer up um, a notion here. I'm, I'm not sure that it, let me just offer it up, that, that there's also a domestic political concern here that the country clearly is united uh, at this moment. Um, New York and Washington, D.C., after all, were attacked in the most vicious, evil way imaginable. 
but ought not the administration be concerned about a war that may extend beyond Afghanistan and the people that perpetrated this particular evil? And when you start looking at other countries, Iraq, or I mean, if you want, you can take it all the way to Colombia uh, and, and drug terrorists if you want. Um, that's a pretty broad mandate. And do you think the political will for it is there? One of the problems in the fight against terrorism in the last 30 years has been the rather episodic attention to the problem by political leaders and, of course, by the public. But the nature of this attack on September 11th was so dramatically different than anything we've seen. Certainly what I've heard talking to Americans on talk shows and radio and television, what one reads in the newspapers suggests the American people are ready for a long struggle. I think they understand what we're getting into. There are going to be American casualties. There probably will be counterattacks by the terrorists, perhaps even here in the United States. The president has really laid the groundwork for this, however, and I think we'll find the American people are re very resolute in sticking with him. Yeah, um, and, and you may be right. Um, it's just... Uh, well, I certainly hope I am. Uh, I, I'm sure you do. It's just one of those very complicated political questions um, once, you, once you've dispensed with the people who have perpetrated this incredible evil and, and you want to make the argument you ought to go on and I, um, it's obviously a fight that needs to be fought at some level and by whom is for other people to say but it's a complicated question. Yes, but the fundamental problem which is represented by Al-Qaeda and its marriage of convenience with the Taliban is that terrorists must be denied safe haven and support by states. Terrorists don't exist in the ether. They're not free floating. They have their feet on the ground somewhere and somebody is responsible for that ground. In this case, the government of Afghanistan represented by the Taliban. There are other failed states around where these terrorists may, the ones that escape us, may go. But as long as terrorists can find a place where they can operate freely as they have in Afghanistan in the last decade and as they did in Lebanon in the 70s and 80s, we're going to continue to face massive problems with terrorism. So the president is absolutely right. The consequence of starting down this path is to say that any state which supports terrorism must be considered, as he said on September 20th, a hostile regime. Those are tough words. And if we're going to follow those to the end, it's going to be tough. We're going to have a hard time keeping the coalition together. But if we're really serious about fighting terrorism, it's not just about bin Laden. It's not just about al-Qaeda. It's about delegitimizing terrorism. Mr. Bremer, thanks for joining us. Very interesting and provocative comments today about where the country uh, ought to be looking right now at, at the breadth of the war that unfolded just after noon today, uh, beginning, as we've said a number of times, in Washington now. Judy? Aaron, uh, I believe, uh, do we have joining us now Richard Holbrook, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. First of all, Ambassador Holbrook, we've been talking a little bit earlier about the European support for this, but I want to go straight to, if you will, maybe the soft underbelly here of this whole operation, and that is the support among some of the nations in the region. So far, we have not heard from Egypt. We have not heard from Saudi Arabia. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, uh, some of these countries saying they want to wait and see what happens. How much does continued success depend on the reaction of these countries? Judy, I would agree with uh, what Henry Kissinger told Aaron Brown a few minutes ago, and that is that they're not going to be as enthusiastic in public as they are in private. Every one of the governments you just named understands that the success of the extreme Islamic uh, leaders like the Taliban and Osama bin Laden is a direct threat to them. If Osama bin Laden had a chance, he would kill Yasser Arafat, President Mubarak of Egypt, and the house, the ruling house in Saudi Arabia in a second. So they naturally are going to hope that our attacks will be swift and effective. But the key word here is effective. If they don't succeed, they will lead to mass demonstrations against American attacks on on uh, Islamic populations, and that'll backfire. So in the end, the key thing in terms of this phase of the crisis is how successful the attacks themselves are. And how do you define success here? Uh, first of all, two, two points. Number one, 
even if the attacks eliminated Osama bin Laden and drove the Taliban from power, and I take those two as goals we will achieve. Taliban, after all, is a motley group of mullahs and militia, uh, not a real government, and they're not going to stand up to this kind of stuff. And a lot of Afghans are fed up with them. And Osama bin Laden is going to be a man on the run. And I hope fairly soon uh, he will be uh, eliminated one way or another or captured. And I think those will happen. But the most important thing we need to bear in mind here is that the actual threat against the United States will continue, regardless of what happens in Afghanistan, because it's part of a network with, internet, with money crossing international borders, sympathizers and cells in places like Hamburg, Germany, and 10 miles from where I sit in New York now and 10 miles from where you sit in Washington, there are sympathizers, and they need to be tracked down. And therefore, the law enforcement part of this in Europe and the United States is critical. Yesterday, I had a long talk with the Secretary General of Interpol, Ron Noble, the former, an American who's a former Undersecretary of Treasury. And when he described the total lack of international coordination between the major law enforcement agencies, I came away feeling that these military strikes, while they're completely justified, and like all Americans, I support President Bush and I look forward to their success, are only a fraction of the struggle that we have begun. Well, but just to, just to be very clear here, when you say this... Uh, these countries, their support in the future for what's going on will depend on how effective this first stage is. Right. You're talking specifically about uh, whether the United States and its allies are able to remove the Taliban from power? Is that at the very base? At yes, the very yes. Uh, now the, the Taliban no longer has any international support. The Pakistanis have abandoned them. The other two countries, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, that had t supported them have gone. There isn't any international uh, regime, government, that would want them to survive of any consequence. But it is vital that they be removed rapidly so we can get on with the more urgent tasks. A protracted struggle for power for the city of Kabul, a city which has been, you know, it doesn't control the rest of the country, and it has been controlled by a dozen or more different regimes over the last generation, is not where the United States national interest lies. So a quick and successful change of regime in Kabul is only a very first step. And the Arab countries, the moderate uh, Islamic countries you mentioned, plus I would add Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim state, want us to succeed there. So a protracted struggle for power in Afghanistan would be uh, very disadvantageous for us. And I would also remind you and your viewers that this administration, all of whose leaders participated in Desert Storm, have repeatedly said that airstrikes are not sufficient to achieve an objective. So I think what we're seeing today is the important beginning of what's going to be a very difficult struggle, and I hope the Afghan part of it is relatively swift. One other point, Judy. Uh, Prime Minister Blair talked about the humanitarian issue, and I'd like to stress that that isn't just humanitarian. If those refugees are not taken care of, uh, Pakistan could come apart, and then we would have a much more serious situation. All right. Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Richard Holbrook, joining us on the telephone from New York, making there a very important point at the end, uh, Aaron, about humanitarian assistance, which is, as the President and Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld have stressed, very much an important piece of this whole operation. Yeah, um, and it is going on right now, as best we know, two C-17s dropping food aid into Afghanistan uh, as the attack was being carried out in other parts of the country. A quick programming no uh, note, Shimon Perez among the guests with Larry King uh, tonight at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Um, tomorrow, Tom Ridge, the former, now former governor of Pennsylvania, will be sworn into a cabinet-level position uh, of homeland defense. This just a few days after some members of Congress were told, some members of Congress were told by officials there's a 100% chance of some sort of terrorist reaction to the attack that was launched today. Jean Meserve in Washington is tracking the homeland defense side of the story, and she joins us now. Jean?
Aaron, we've been talking to officials in cities and states across the country and almost all tell us that they are on a heightened state of alert, including those here in Washington, D.C. Here in Washington, a joint command and control center has been activated to facilitate communications between the various law enforcement agencies that have some jurisdiction in this town. Among the things they have been monitoring today, a demonstration that's going on as we speak in front of the White House at Lafayette Park. This is an anti-war demonstration. D.C. Police Chief Charles Ramsey does tell us that his department was given no advance notice of today's strikes and that as of this hour, there have been no credible threats against the Capitol. No credible threats reported in Philadelphia either. There, there were three major events going on in the city today, a couple of parades and an Eagles game. So a lot of police were already on duty. But when the strikes against Afghanistan occurred, they were redeployed to the city center to guard high rise and high profile buildings. A couple of bomb squads were on alert at Veterans Stadium were likewise moved to the city center. Right now, Philadelphia police officials are drawing up a plan for the rest of the week, which will include placing uniformed police in high visibility locations throughout that city. Baltimore Mayor Martin O'Malley says security has been stepped up in his city around vital infrastructure such as railroads, tunnels, bridges, water supply facilities, industrial sites, and also around mosques and synagogues. The mayor says Baltimore officials have been planning for weeks how they would respond when American military action began and the mayor said because of that the moves taken today were almost automatic in his words. In the state of California, a spokesman of Governor Gray Davis says state government was advised early on by the FBI that in the event of a U.S. strike, state officials should be prepared for retaliation. So today, patrols around electrical and water facilities were stepped up and officers of the California Highway Patrol have been put on 12-hour shifts. Police officials in the city of Los Angeles say they are on a citywide tactical alert. This means police officers on duty stay on duty until they're told otherwise. No word at this point when that will end. A spokesman for Governor Davis does note, however, that there have been no credible threats made anywhere in the state of California. A few other odds and ends in Colorado. The National Guard increased security around its own facilities, and several governors have received special security briefings from their state officials, but not all of them. A spokesman for Colorado's Governor Bill Owens says there's been no change in his schedule. He is spending the afternoon as planned at the Broncos game. Back to you, Aaron. Thank you, Gene. We'll take a quick look around the country. It's, uh, I think it's fair to say that while there's always going to be concern about a, a day like today, you have lots of uh, large groups of people in a number of important cities. Uh, the fact is that the threat, if there is one out there, is not one that necessarily we were going to see today. It's going to be in the days, the weeks, the months who knows the years ahead American life has changed it changed on September 11th and what happened today further enforces that at uh, 10 o'clock tonight a special report we'll have for you will update all the events of the day we should by that point have a better idea a better idea though not necessarily a good idea of how successful this uh, first wave of attacks has been we've had some daylight in Afghanistan and we'll be able to do some reporting on that all of that at 10 o'clock tonight we hope you'll join us for that Judy. All right, Aaron, and I'll see you then. Yes, we will you be will. together. You'll be in Atlanta, and I'll be here in Washington. Well, it is moving uh, just past 6 o'clock in the east, about three minutes after, and we want to give you a quick update on what we do know at this hour about today's U.S.-led military attacks. United States forces, with assistance from the British, have hit targets in Taliban-controlled areas across Afghanistan. Air defenses and aircraft near Kabul, Kandahar and Herat are among the areas reportedly damaged. Pentagon officials say Operation Enduring Freedom includes cruise missile attacks as well as assaults by aircraft. The high-tech B-2 bomber has been used to drop precision-guided bombs, and B-52 bombers have hit targets with conventional so-called dumb bombs. Now, shortly after the operation began, British Prime Minister Tony Blair announced Britain's involvement in the mission and the goal to hit Taliban targets. Taliban targets, not civilians. This military plan has been put together, mindful of our determination to do all we humanly can to avoid civilian casualties. I cannot disclose, obviously, how long this action will last, but we will act with reason and resolve. Also today, the Arab television network Al Jazeera released this new video of Osama bin Laden. On the tape, and we don't know when it was taped, bin Laden said God is giving Americans, quote, what they deserve. 
وفي كثير من بلاد الإسلام صاح العالم it was not even half an hour after the attacks uh, began uh, in Afghanistan that President Bush went on the air here in the United States telling a national television audience uh, that the attack was underway and once again outlining the rationale for it. CNN's John King is at the White House. John, and ever since uh, that moment, it was about 1 o'clock Eastern Time, the President's been monitoring all this very closely. He has been, Judy, inside the White House receiving, we are told, very frequent updates from his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, in the White House Situation Room here, instantaneous communication with the Pentagon and the U.S. Command and Control Centers around the world as this military operation unfolds. In that address to the American people the President made this afternoon that you mentioned, he said this military effort would be, quote, sustained, comprehensive, and relentless. Now, this is a picture of the President returning back from Camp David this morning. He went straight to the Oval Office, and when he went into the Oval office, Mr. Bush began calling world leaders around the world to tell them that military strikes were imminent. Among those he called the Russian president, the president of France, the chancellor of Germany, the close ally, the prime minister of Canada. Mr. Bush looked to a senior aide at one point and he said, quote, I gave them a fair warning. That a reference to the Taliban, and Mr. Bush made that point again in his address to the American people, noting that it was two weeks ago that he made an ultimatum, turn over Osama bin Laden or suffer the same fate. More than two weeks ago, I gave Taliban leaders a series of clear and specific demands. Close terrorist training camps, hand over leaders of the Al-Qaeda network, and return all foreign nationals, including American citizens, unjustly detained in your country. None of these demands were met. And now, the Taliban will pay a price. CNN is told by senior administration officials the president actually gave the go-ahead last night. We're also told he first started calling congressional leaders at 7.30 p.m. last night, said he had given the go-ahead for the military to act as soon as it believed it was the right moment to strike. As a security precaution, also, we are told Vice President Dick Cheney, not on the White House grounds, but taken to a separate secure location. That because of the continuing fear that there will be some terrorist retaliation here in the United States as a result, although White House officials say there are no specific or credible threats. Earlier today, a senior administration official saying, quote, Americans need to be on alert. Threats do remain. This is a war. Judy. John, when the president said today uh, this action is designed to clear the way for, in his words, sustained, comprehensive, and relentless operations to drive these out, how much is the White House saying about just exactly what's going to be involved here? They're saying very little in detail, although they do tell us, and the Pentagon briefing was a bit more detailed, that this is day one of a campaign they believe will take weeks and months. The Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld saying one of the goals was to soften up, make it so that U.S. ground troops would go in. We don't believe that has happened in any significant numbers as yet, but White House officials, while saying they will not tell us much about the military planning for the days and weeks ahead, that they believe this campaign will take months, that it will involve ground troops and we know from other sources that the CIA director George Tenet among those making calls to key members of Congress I spoke to one lawmaker who received such a call who said Mr. Tenet was also quite clear this is day one the first call of many you will receive we expect this to be a very long and sustained campaign all right John King uh, at the White House and uh, picking up on what John just said about Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld uh, talking about this is softening up the Taliban, if you will. He also said he predicts that it's not going to happen in one strike or a few strikes from the outside. This is something where we're going to watch them collapse from within. Some pretty graphic words there from the Defense Secretary. My colleague Wolf Blitzer uh, joining me now here in Washington. And Wolf, uh, you've been talking to some of our military analysts. I have, Judy. And uh, in fact, uh, General, uh, Major General Don Shepard, retired U.S. Air Force, is joining me right now. And uh, General Shepard, the Defense Secretary uh, specifically said the first objective was to destroy, remove, in his words, the threat from air defenses and from the Taliban aircraft. What kind of air defenses does the Taliban military actually have or had? Well, Wolf, this is a classic military operation. If I can go to the telestrator here, I'm just going to draw some examples. Around the edge of the country, you will find what we call 
early warning radars. You want to take those early warning radars out so that they cannot see where you are coming from specifically so they can line up their other defenses. Now I'm going to raise those and I'm going to put in, for example, some air bases. There are seven or eight air bases that we're concerned with around the area there. And of all of those air bases there, you have airplanes on the air base. You want to get them on the ground if you can, not let them get airborne. And if possible, you'd like to do it without destroying the air base, which you may want to use later for humanitarian relief or for the Northern Alliance to operate from. So it's very tricky. Again, we'd like to get them on the ground. You can also get them if they take off. All of these things are protected by another thing, which is missile sites. And I will just put an X at each one of these things, fixed missile sites, perhaps two or three at each location. You need to take out the early warning radars, the aircraft on the ground if possible or in the air, and then also the fixed missile sites so later on you can operate with impunity with your forces or bring in humanitarian relief. What kind of aircraft, warplanes, do they have that potentially could be a threat to the U.S. and the other uh, coalition partners? Not very good. They've got old MiG-21s, a couple of dozen of them. They're short of pilots. They're short of spare parts. It's no match for the United States Air Force or the United States Navy. This is not a serious problem, but it has to be dealt with. So presumably the Stinger, the shoulder-fired surface-to-air missiles, those mobile missiles, that's the greatest threat. It's hard to pinpoint those. That and AAA or anti-aircraft artillery, which always we always worry about the missiles, but we have defenses against missiles, electronic countermeasures, and also flares, and then we, we, we get hit by the anti-aircraft by flying at low altitudes. So all of that's a threat. So there's still a threat up there. Uh, President Bush, when he spoke out on television to the American public, to people all over the world, I want you to listen to one excerpt of what he said, because it indicates that air power alone won't get this job done. Listen to this. Initially, the terrorists may burrow deeper into caves and other entrenched hiding places. Our military action is also designed to clear the way for sustained, comprehensive, and relentless operations to drive them out and bring them to justice. That suggests ground troops might be necessary to go into those caves. Yeah. Joint's been the word for the last few years in the Pentagon. If you don't say joint before and after each sentence, you don't get financed in the Pentagon. So we're, we're experts at joint operations. We have bombs that will do things. We can go after terrorists and buried targets and that type of thing. But clearly what we're talking about is getting them out of the caves in other ways. What we want to do is allow the Northern Alliance to take territory and then allow them who know those caves to go into those caves or use other methods to get them out. Not necessarily take them out with bombs and not necessarily go in with our own troops and commando rates. And speaking about the Northern Alliance, the opposition forces, the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was clear that another U.S. objective, in his words, was to go after the so-called offensive systems that the Taliban may have that could hamper the progress of what he described as various opposition forces. Those are ground, that's ground equipment. Now, they have tanks, uh, they have uh, vehicles, they also have uh, uh, artillery and that type of thing. Now we need to go in and get those piece by piece. It requires that you know where they are from either photographs or from coordinates. We have ways to find that out, but we're going to have to clear the air defenses first. We're going to have to take care of the people with humanitarian aid, and then we're going to have to go against this cave by cave and piece by piece. It's going to be a long time uh, military operation campaign. That could suggest potentially hand-to-hand -hand combat involving U.S. and perhaps British other troops. Uh, that's always a possibility, and we have the people that can do that. Hopefully it won't be necessary. Hopefully we will weaken them so much by the things we do that the Northern Alliance can take over a great deal of these things, and it won't be a walkover, but it'll be much easier than it is here in the beginning. So much of what the president, President Bush said, what uh, Tony Blair, the British prime minister said, what Donald Rumsfeld said, focuses on the humanitarian relief operation now underway, dropping food, medicine, other supplies. That could be a pretty risky operation, though. It's a risky operation. First of all, it's important because of the psychological nature of this against the Isla world, the Islam world. It's the also political just overtones. The political overtones. It's, it's important, though, that we take care of people no matter where we are, and we are, always have. To do that, you have to have the air defenses cleared out so that those airplanes can come in and drop this stuff. And ideally what you want to do is not drop it forever, but you want to drop it from an emergency standpoint to keep people alive. Then you want to take it into air bases and get it taken in trucks by the humanitarian organizations. But it's very difficult, dangerous to the air crews dropping it, dangerous to the people on the ground who can also get hit by it. Now refugees are fleeing from all over the place in Afghanistan. If you want to show us uh, on the, uh, the map over here, they're trying to get into Pakistan, they're trying to get into Iran as well. Where are those airdrops likely to be fo focused uh, mostly? Okay, there's a couple of key areas around here. One area is around Keita right here in Pakistan. Another is right above the A in Jalalabad, which is Peshawar. And basically, people are 
fleeing from Afghanistan into these areas uh, across the border. So what we want to do is get aid into these particular areas here. And again, the idea is to drop it from an emergency standpoint, tell the people where it is so they can go get it, and then get it to people in trucks so that we can take care of all of these people. It's, it's dangerous and complicated stuff, and uh, we can do it now uh, through the weather. We didn't used to be able to do it through the weather. But as uh, many U.S. officials are insisting, politically, uh, very, very critical to the entire operation. John, uh, General Don Shepard, our CNN military analyst, thanks for joining us. Back to you, Judy. Thanks, Wolf. We did hear General Shepard say it's his hope as a military man that this uh, effort, at least the initial part, is over quickly so we can get on, or so the United States can get on to the next phase. In fact, when the country of Pakistan uh, issued a statement today after these attacks began, the government uh, said, we also hope that the operations will end soon and a concerted international effort will be undertaken to promote national reconciliation, already looking ahead. Our correspondent, Christian Amanpour, is on the ground in Pakistan, in Islamabad. Christian, first of all, what are you learning there about the success so far of these uh, U.S.-led attacks? Oh, impossible to give any uh, analysis over the results of what's happened so far. Just to reiterate that we have had phone contact with uh, eyewitnesses on the ground, both sources inside the Taliban and our own people there, about what they have seen and what has been hit. We've talked about the towns that we've been able to see or at least get eyewitness reports from, uh, Kabul, Jalalabad, Kandahar, Herat, uh, and all of those appear to have been attacked on the outskirts of the towns towards what our eyewitnesses have described as airfields we've heard about radar stations at least in one place Kandahar having been destroyed a command center there also potentially uh, other airfields or, or, or strategic uh, concerns on those airfields in Herat maybe Jalalabad and maybe even a terrorist training camp near Jalalabad we have heard as well as the reports from Kabul we have heard also from Taliban officials via the Al Jazeera Arab television network in which they've admitted that there have been certain strategic uh, targets hit they say they have had no casualties and they say that there's so far nothing to worry about according to Taliban officials. They also claim to have shot down a plane but there is no independent confirmation of that. Here in Pakistan their cabinet has been meeting. There have been very isolated small demonstrations not far from here in the capital Islamabad. Also at Peshawar which is just across the border from Jalalabad on the Pakistani side of the border and also in Lahore another big city here in Pakistan. Small demonstrations a little bit noisy but quickly fizzled out a very large police presence in this case probably more police than demonstrators the key will be to be watching tomorrow for what happens some of these groups have called for demonstrations tomorrow already the Pakistani government has put under house arrest one of the most antagonistic of the Islamic hardline political leaders who had been calling demonstrations over the last several weeks so that's what we're going to be looking for tomorrow now in terms of reaction we've heard a lot of reaction from the United States Western allies we've heard nothing yet officially from our Arab states who are allies with the United States I spoke about half an hour ago with a key leader of one of the main Arab states uh, who said that he understood that the United States had to do what it had to do and predicted that Arab allies would not come, uh, would, would, would pretty much support what was going on but would be very mindful in case there are any casualties amongst the civilians and this of course is going to be the key point in which to gauge public opinion and support for this action here in the Middle East at least. Judy? And Christian, that tracks uh, what uh, former U.S. Uh, ambassador to the United Nations was saying just a few moments ago, that the Arab support among the moderate Arab states is much more likely to be in private uh, than in public. Christian, the statement from the Pakistan uh, government when the, uh, the strikes got underway, that they hope the operation will end soon. Why is it in their interest to see this move quickly? Well, because uh, anything that happens in Afghanistan inevitably affects or has the potential to affect Pakistan. Long border, long history of relations between the two countries, uh, very uh, significant Pashtun minority. The Pashtuns are the people in Afghanistan who make up the Taliban. And there is this, you know, sort of sympathy, if you like, along the border area, the northwest frontier provinces, they're called. And they, you know, here they've always been concerned about the, what they call the vocal minority's ability to destabilize the situation.
situation. We have to, when we say that, put it in context that they have tried these opposition groups so far for the last four weeks during the build-up. They have not been able to bring out the crowds that they have called for on the streets. The government feels that it has things under control, but clearly you just never know as these things proceed. So clearly they do want it to end quickly. Obviously they want that also for a humanitarian point of view. They made very clear that they wanted this to go according to clearly defined targets within the UN Security Council resolutions, military targets, targets that directly targeted terrorism, not against Afghan infrastructure on the civilian side. And they added that they regretted that the Taliban had paid no heed to Pakistan's entreaties to make the right decisions and, and, and try to avoid military action. They added that obviously the Taliban had failed to do so and now military action was underway. Judy? All right, Christiane Amanpour a a reporting from uh, Islamabad, Pakistan, and we should say it is now 3.20 in the morning in Islamabad. Christiane has been reporting steadily from there for the last almost six hours since these strikes got underway, and I, I just should say we keep asking our correspondents what's the reaction. We've asked Christiane this question again, but it was 9 o'clock at night when the s strikes began. It's 3 o'clock in the morning there now. It's very difficult at this at this time of the day and the night, or rather the night, the morning, to gauge what the public reaction is, but of course we'll get a better idea of that in just a few hours. Joining us now on the telephone from London, the former Assistant Secretary of State uh, in the Clinton administration, James Rubin. Uh, Jamie Rubin, are you there? I'm here, yes. You're not just on the telephone, you are in person. <laughs> we can see you. Yes. Uh, let me let me begin by asking you. We keep hearing uh, various speculation about how difficult it is going to be to hold the coalition together. Um, what are the criteria, in your view, for 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 these countries staying on board with the United States and Great Britain? Well, I think it's important to realize that many of the countries in the Arab world are never going to provide the kind of public support that Europeans and Russia and China and many other countries have. The key question will be is what kind of domestic reaction there is in countries uh, in the Arab world, in Pakistan, after we begin to see the inevitable pictures of casualties or innocent civilians. And I think the administration did an admirable job by making the decision to begin humanitarian airdrop simultaneously with the military action. This is unprecedented. It's never happened before. And I think it was a, a very good idea to try to limit uh, the fallout in the Arab world. But the tests will come when we do see these inevitable pictures of people who are either uh, suffering from the uh, lack of food and medicine and supplies or people who have been uh, killed uh, perhaps by mistaken uh, raids or maybe even some of the pictures will be doctored designed to uh, promote this kind of reaction in the Arab world. And how does that unfold is the key question. Will it be uh, public demonstrations? Will leaders begin to go from a silent posture to an antagonistic posture? You know, you have uh, the government of Iran publicly opposing this and privately supporting it. You have a lot of private support uh, in the Gulf states, in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, but they won't go public. Will they transfer their s private support to public opposition? And that will be the first key indicator of whether this incredibly broad coalition the President and the Secretary of State have put together is as deep as it is broad. And, and that's hard to ascertain until uh, some of those developments take place. Well, Jamie Rubin, talk a little bit more about what, what are the characteristics of a campaign that would enable these countries you just described, whether it's Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE, Richard Holbrook earlier mentioned uh, Indonesia, uh, that would enable them to feel comfortable remaining on board or at least privately supporting, if not publicly. Well, I think uh, the key is to move uh, beyond the public airstrike type of campaign where you see the pictures of American forces attacking Afghanistan uh, to a second phase where what you're really going to see happen is the kind of internal fighting within Afghanistan where the Northern Alliance is joined by 
uh, perhaps uh, 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 tribal leaders who switch sides and begin to unseat the Taliban. And when that's going on, when the fighting is internal, essentially between Afghans, uh, that will make the situation easier. It will also be easier if the humanitarian airdrops turn into uh, a more coordinated, organized campaign in and around the border areas when the Taliban lose control and the United States and its European allies and others are seen as providing food and medicine directly to the people of Afghanistan. And finally, of course, it's when the Pakistanis, the Iranians, the Russians, the um, other countries north of Afghanistan, the United States, begin to uh, develop this post-Taliban government that has been talked about in the United Nations for several years. They have uh, talked about a plan for that, and the more that Pakistan, Iran, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, the Russians, the United States can sit around a table and begin to plot out with the king, with the United Nations, uh, the future government of Afghanistan, the easier it will be to maintain this coalition. So those kind of steps need to be taken very visibly once the Taliban loses power. And then the real battle will be going on behind the scenes where uh, local forces or perhaps special forces are engaged in what President Bush promised would be this effort to find Osama bin Laden's network and destroy it. Jamie Rubin, we're talking with James Rubin, the former uh, spokesman for the State Department uh, uh, in the Clinton administration, also former Assistant Secretary of State. You brought up Osama bin Laden. I don't know if you were able to see part or all of the video uh, uh, that he that was released uh, today by the Al Jazeera Arab Television Network. When, when people in that part of the world, and again, we're still talking about these Arab uh, countries, countries that are primarily Islamic, when they hear him say these events, uh, and he's describing, a, in his words, a history of insults by the United States against uh, people who believe in Islam, he said these events have divided the whole world into two sides, the side of believers and the side of the infidels. And he goes on to catalog the offenses of the United States. It, how sympathetic uh, are our ears going to be in that part of the world? Well, I think there's several points to be made. Clearly, uh, he planned for this. Clearly, he would like this to be a war between the West and Islam. Uh, that's very much been his goal from the beginning, is to create this incredible rift between civilizations and pit Islam against the United States. I think the, the Bush administration, Tony Blair, the other leaders have gone out of their way to try to avoid this. But I think we all have to be honest with ourselves that it does receive uh, uh, some sympathy in that part of the world, whether it's because of misdirected uh, anger at the United States, whether it's because it's misdirected anger at their own regimes, or whether it's the new cause that Osama bin Laden has just suddenly found in the past weeks, which is the Palestinian issue, that there is uh, some resonance to his words in that part of the world. That's why it's extremely important for the administration uh, to present what it's doing as an, an action on behalf of the whole world and to try to develop, even if you can't get the leaders in these countries to stand up and be counted publicly and support what's being done, and, uh, to get the uh, lead opinion or other commentators to try to show the people of this part of the world that Osama bin Laden's version of Islam is evil. And the more that you can get religious leaders in the Islamic community to shun him the way every government in the world has now isolated him as an outcast, the uh, easier it will be to deal with the resonance his views still have. And finally, uh, James Rubin, what about the, the statement that emerged from the Bush administration this week uh, clarifying, if you will, their position that indeed they do support a Palestinian state at the end of a peace process uh, between Israel and its neighbors? Did that win converts, do you think, in the Arab world? Well, certainly uh, in the leadership of the Gulf states in Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, obviously, and other places, they were concerned that the Bush administration was uh, only going to support uh, the Israeli government and w has not yet met with Yasser Arafat, that there haven't been 
uh, an engaged process. And I think the administration is quite correctly trying to show that it is going to engage, that it has some ideas about how to move forward. Uh, it worked very hard at encouraging the Israeli government to set up some meetings with the Palestinians, which, as you know, yielded this rather uh, dramatic and unfortunate reaction on the part of the Israeli leader to uh, label uh, George Bush as the equivalent of an appeaser, which he subsequently apologized for. So I think the Arab world saw that the Bush administration was trying to calm the waters in the Middle East conflict, and I think that was helpful. But I think we all need to know that as, as long as there are uh, this kind of uh, daily murder and death in the Middle East, both uh, is innocent Israelis dying and obviously Palestinians dying, that the Islamic world is going to have great sympathy towards the Palestinian cause and some questions about America's role. And this is the resentment that Osama bin Laden is trying to feed into. But it's really important for the whole world to realize that his cause has nothing to do with the Palestinian cause. At the very time that the United States was putting pressure on Israel, and every Arab leader in the entire Arab world was praising the Clinton administration in 1998, was the very time that Osama bin Laden attacked the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And so he is not acting on their cause. This is a, a late conversion uh, by Osama bin Laden. And I just hope that the Arab world, the Palestinians, and the others who hear his words are not deceived by his odious uh, goal of a war between the West and Islam. Jamie Rubin, and I'm uh, glad that you brought that point up because he did include the Palestinians in that, in that uh, video statement that was released today. Joining us uh, from London, James Rubin, uh, former Assistant Secretary of State. As we now move into uh, 6.30, uh, about exactly six hours since U.S. airstrikes began uh, against Afghanistan, we want to bring you uh, the latest developments. It has been a night of thunderous explosions in Afghanistan as the U.S. and Britain strike at targets in that country. The military attacks come a little less than four weeks after the terrorist attacks on the United States. The Pentagon says the strikes are targeting air defenses, terrorist training camps, and other strategic military targets that are linked to Afghanistan's Taliban rulers. President Bush announced the military action just a couple of hours after returning to the White House from Camp David. Mr. Bush says the strikes are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. Mr. Bush says the strikes against targets in Afghanistan are supported by the collective will of the world. Meantime, Al Jazeera Television is reporting that Osama bin Laden survived the attacks carried out in Afghanistan, at least as of a short time ago in an interview broadcast today on that network. Bin Laden, and we should say we don't know when this was taped, bin Laden says God is giving Americans what they deserve, and they will never know safety again, bin Laden says, unless the U.S. changes its policies in the Islamic world. Again, it is not clear when that statement was taped. We've been following uh, the closely the military developments as much as we can from halfway around the world practically, but uh, clearly there are diplomatic efforts uh, moving at a frenzied pace. And for the very latest on that, let's go to our State Department correspondent, Andrea Koppel. Andrea. Judy, good evening. Secretary of State Powell has been on the phone pretty much since the, uh, the attacks first began. In fact, uh, even making some calls ahead of time to alert a variety of uh, key friends and allies around the world that not only were they underway, but that the targets were military targets, not Afghan civilians, that the U.S. was going to be trying very hard not to, uh, not to inflict any of this uh, campaign on the civilians themselves. In point, of fact, uh, in point of fact, the administration, Judy, has been going out of its way to make clear that uh, it wants to help the Afghan civilians. Earlier this week, President Bush announcing a $320 million aid package, not only in food, but also in medical supplies and whatnot. And as part of that campaign, Judy, now, now that the strikes have begun, 
the diplomacy is actually going to be just as important, if not more important, uh, than what we saw leading up to the beginning of the strikes. And that is because the pictures that Jamie Rubin was referring to that we'll be seeing uh, perhaps on television screens in the not-too-distant future are going to uh, bring on the anger, not only within uh, uh, the Arab world, but also within the Islamic world, to see uh, the pictures of, of civilians who may be suffering. And so part of what the administration is going to be doing from here on out is moving into really the propaganda side of things. They're going to try to airlift in and drop in transistor radios into Afghanistan. They're going to try to airdrop uh, leaflets, letting the Afghan people know that uh, the U.S. is on their side, hoping to foment some, uh, some dissent amongst the Afghan people, perhaps even within the Taliban itself, against uh, the ruling Taliban regime and their uh, protection of uh, Osama bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda network. So look in the days to come, Judy, for more repetition of, uh, of statements that the U.S. is trying to help the Afghan people and that the sooner this is over, the better uh, to try to keep the coalition together. Judy? Andrea, with so many people leaving Afghanistan, or at least trying to leave there, we've seen all these reports of thousands of people leaving Kabul, leaving Kandahar. At whom is this information campaign directed? Is it at the Taliban itself? Is it at what people are left there on the ground? Presumably, we're talking about very poor, uh, little educated uh, population, aren't we? Yes, we are. I'd say it's, it's all of the above. Uh, one of the reasons why they're going to be airlifting in and dropping down those transistor radios is because that's how most Afghans get their news. And in fact, uh, the U.S. says that the Taliban had been collecting radios and so uh, they weren't getting any news. And so by airlifting in transistor radios, you're going to have a whole variety of people who will then be able to hear in their native lang language uh, what it is that the United States is planning to do to try to help them. They're going to get this message out through uh, local Pakistani radio. They're going to get it out through Voice of America, again, in the local dialects trying to let them know that this is something uh, that is not targeting, this campaign is not targeting the average Afghan, but rather the Taliban, which is protecting Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda. Judy? All right, Andrea Koppel uh, reporting for us from the State Department. And for more now on uh, that information campaign and much beyond that, my colleague Donna Kelly joins us in Atlanta. Donna. Hi, Judy. Thank you, and good evening to you. In a Pentagon briefing just a few hours ago, we heard more about the humanitarian efforts for the Afghan people. President Bush said today that at the same time of the military strikes, the oppressed people of Afghanistan will know the generosity of America and its allies. The plan is to drop food, medicine and supplies and two C-17 cargo planes plan to drop some 37,000 packets of aid today. Sources tell CNN that the relief missions are planned for high elevations in Afghanistan, inaccessible probably to trucks or even uh, to donkeys. At the Pentagon briefing this afternoon, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld and the new Joint Chiefs Chairman, Air Force General Richard Myers, said they had high confidence to be able to drop uh, the aid where Afghan citizens are while keeping the supplies out of the wrong hands. They got some criticism, you might remember, for humanitarian aid dropping off target in Bosnia. The Air Force has been working on ways to improve the accuracy of the delivery of its airdrops. And we were told that these supplies will not be dropped by parachute. There are a number of alternatives to parachuting supplies in the easiest way. Maybe just kick them out the back and let gravity do the job. The food packets are wrapped in plastic and so they can easily survive the trip. Another way is a special delivery technique that's called LAPES or Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System. In that method, the parachute is only used to drag a pallet out the back of the plane. And when they say low, it's like two to ten feet off the ground. The load falls the short distance then to the ground. Of course, the plane could land. The C-17 is capable of landing at very rough airstrips, but it's doubtful that that's the plan this time around. Again, the Pentagon not giving any details on how the planes will go about their humanitarian mission, but they are saying that there was no risk to people on the ground who will get this aid. Now, earlier this week, we showed you a packet that was uh, like one of those that was likely to be dropped. It's a medium-sized yellow packet. It's called an HDR 
or humanitarian daily ration. Each one holds a day's worth of food, so it's three meals in one packet. It contains no meat, so it's consistent with Muslim dietary traditions. And while they don't have meat, they do have a bit of dairy, no alcohol or alcohol-based products, and that includes the towelette that's in the accessory pack. That's alcohol-free as well. That's your salt and pepper and sugar, and a few other things in there as well. They have a high amount of calories, 2,300 calories, vitamins and minerals added. They weigh just under two pounds, and they're bright yellow so that people can see them easily. And they will last for 36 months, so that's three years at temperatures up to 80 degrees. And they cost $4.25 a day. And MRE, which is different than these HDRs, MRE, Meals Ready to Eat, or a C ration as they used to be called, uh, those are about 24 bucks, so that's an 80% savings for taxpayers. They're really designed to get to people in emergencies, like a refugee, until more conventional relief programs or feeding can get going. Even before this action, millions of people in Afghanistan depended on charitable aid to survive. The various aid organizations have been trying, they've been working on trying to set up the refugee camps, and uh, we were going to hope to show you that. There we go. Uh, where you see these R's, those are refugee camps that were going to be set up and in the Khyber Pass was an area that a lot of refugees were trying to get through. That is a rough, rough area, 30 mile, a 33-mile strip. It says, you can see, west of Kabul, which is, of course, the capital. And at one point, that area is only three yards wide. So as we say, though, these R's that are uh, marked on our map are where some refugee camps were being set up. The United Nations uh, was trying to, to estimate at least 100,000 people could be the first wave of people who need help. And over the next six months, one and a half million could be refugees in need of every basic human necessity. That's in addition to the people who are already, uh, who've already left years ago. Joining us uh, in Atlanta is our CNN military analyst, General Wesley Clark. He was in charge in Kosovo. He can tell us a little bit more about the humanitarian missions that go on and what troubles you can run into. Hi, General Clark. Hi, hi um, a lot of storage facilities apparently around the world. What's the, what's the supply like? Well, there's a good supply, but the problem is distribution. You have to get it to the right place at the right time, and that's why the airdrops are so important. Now, the Air Force has told me this evening that the method they're looking at is a high-altitude drop. So they're going to keep the airplanes high. They're going to drop it in remote areas af of Afghanistan where people won't be hurt on the ground. And the technique that they are describing using is to have the humanitarian daily rations packed in a large cardboard container that has a static line on it. In other words, it's attached to the aircraft. And when you push it out the back of the aircraft, the static line opens the box and all of the rations, about the size of a pillow, fall down to the ground. Now, they still weigh two pounds, but you drop it in a remote area and, uh, and it scatters around in the area and then the humanitarian agencies or the individuals have to themselves come and pick it up. We were talking about those C-17s, the two C-17s, the airdrops that were planned. Clarification from the Pentagon information that we're getting right now is that that's not started quite yet. So right. they're still working on that. So how long can you do the mission? How long can you continue this? Well, you can do it as long as it's safe and as long as you think the mission is effective. We looked at doing this over Kosovo, in fact, but when we looked at it, we could never quite be comfortable with the air defense situation over there. So it's going to depend first on making sure we really do have the air defense neutralized and those taken out. Those have to be out so Absolutely. that the, those who are dropping are not in danger. That's right. Okay, so when you do this and you look at the people that you're trying to help, there was some criticism before. This afternoon in the Pentagon briefing, they talked about that they have improved the delivery. What do you know about that and, and how that's improved so that people aren't trying to get help and, and, and get hurt when it well, drops? Well, I think that it, that's, this is the humanitarian daily ration drop system and they call it a container delivery system where they push the thing out the back of the, thing, of the aircraft and then it opens and scatters the, the rations. But what's different about this is now we've really practiced this so we know from high altitudes where they're going to land approximately on the ground. We can compute for wind and, and other things and the, and the crews know how to do this. So we should be pretty accurate with it. How do, you, how do you keep it from falling into the wrong hands, though? Some of it will fall into the wrong hands, there's no doubt about it. But when you scatter them out individually, it's awful hard for all the wrong hands to pick up all the rations. Mm -hmm. And that's what they probably mean, probably, talking about that they've improved the delivery. How many weeks, days, years, months can you go on with this? What's the supply? Well, it, it will never be as easy to deliver it from the air as it is from the ground. So the real key is to let the Northern Alliance expand, get the refugees either into Pakistan or get them into areas control where we can deliver the humanitarian assistance by ground vehicle. That's the right way to do it. 
Also in part of these packets, they'll have radios and leaflets, and we were just right. hearing a little bit more about that from our Andrea Coppola at the State Department. We happen to get ourselves uh, one of the radios, similar technology. Let me, uh, let me see if you can get a good uh, shot of this. Uh, this is similar technology. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what they hope to accomplish with well, this, Well, the idea is that you drop the radio, and then it's tuned to a frequency, and you can broadcast in the information on a particular frequency. We've tried to do this before, and if you can target the people and you can get the radios into them, it works. Obviously, the authorities are going to be very sensitive to these radios. Mm -hmm. And so if they're dropped into areas where they're strong, controlled by the Taliban, the Taliban are going to do everything they can to confiscate the radios. Mm -hmm. People will be risking their lives to listen to the truth. Uh, you, you pull the handle out here, if we can show you just a little bit more, and then you wind it up. So it doesn't require power, of course, and it doesn't require batteries. You wind it up for 30 seconds, and it plays for 30 minutes. And in Afghanistan, we're told that they have one radio or one television for every thousand people in Afghanistan. So this will help to get the message out. And then you have your volume and tuning. So there you go. And, of course, uh, the goal is certainly to help people in a humanitarian way, but also to, to re-emphasize that terrorism is the target, not Islam or Muslims. And our Washington Bureau Chief, Frank Sesno, has more on that for us, including the message in the leaflets. Frank. Well, hello, Don. A couple of things, if I may. I've been speaking with people who are involved in these humanitarian drops, including Andrew Natsios. He's the head of, the, of USAID, and he actually, his agency, along with DOD, targeted some of the areas where these humanitarian drops will take place. Two main criteria is in intense need and the true inaccessibility of the locations. Now, several things that uh, Natsios points out, and I want to just, if I may, add a couple things to your conversation with the general a moment ago. One of the things they're doing with the delivery of these packets, you were talking a lot about how they're actually delivered. When those boxes open up and the individual packets fall out, they will actually flutter to the ground. They have sort of a, a wing type thing, Natsio says, that comes out from the side and it allows it to gently flutter to the ground so that people on the ground aren't hurt. Another thing he pointed out is on the packet itself, in addition to the leaflets that are going to be dropped, will be the words in several languages, a gift of the American people. And instead of what is traditional with this kind of drop, a, an insignia of you. USAID, there will be a big American flag. It's very important, uh, Natsios and others say, that people understand that this food is being paid for and coming from the United States. Back to those radios for a moment. Uh, Natsios and others say that when those radios go, uh, go inside, what you'll be hearing uh, will be the kind of information that people aren't able to get from their own domestic uh, broadcast, but they'll also be told specifically to stay in their villages, that food is going to be uh, uh, coming, that they should stay away from the fighting. There are several uh, reasons here, Donna, that food is taking such a central role in this campaign. First of all, there is a very serious uh, uh, famine problem in Afghanistan, a 26 million approximate population, up to a million and a half of them, humanitarian organizations say, could face starvation and death within just a matter of months. Aside from war, a very serious drought has racked Afghanistan for years now, making it one of the most perilous, dangerous, and malnourished places on earth right now. So this humanitarian mission uh, ac uh, obviously op uh, operating on that level. Beyond that though, the message to Afghanistan and the rest of the Islamic world is that the United States and the other nations involved here are trying to help. It supports the president's contention, according to U.S. officials, that the U.S. is not at war with Afghanistan or with the Islamic people, but rather is trying to help. And of course, excuse me, nothing helps more than food when it is badly needed. Beyond that, though, some very hard realities, and that is where food is dropped, U.S. officials say, it undermines it, where it's needed. It undermines the authority and the legitimacy of any duly constituted government, or in this particular case, the Taliban, because the most basic message to people should be that you survive, that you eat. And the thinking goes, if your government can't provide food for you and you have to get food from the outside, that government is undermined in the process. So an awful lot of things happening at very many levels here, Donna. All right, our Frank Cessna, our Washington Bureau Chief, thanks very much. And as we say, two C-17s, as we heard from the Pentagon earlier today in their briefing, planning to do airdrops today. Those have not started yet. Judy? Thank you, Donna. And uh, just to f uh, bring our audience uh, up to the moment, we are now a little more than six hours into it. Uh, air campaign, military strikes against uh, Afghanistan, a campaign that is led by the United States but has been joined by Great Britain and a number of other U.S. allies will be participating from a military standpoint. You're looking at live pictures from Afghanistan. Let's see, can someone tell me uh, where these are, what 
part of the country they are. This is, uh, this is the scene near Kabul, uh, which is the capital. And again, it's still night. It's eight and a half hours uh, beyond uh, what it is here on the east coast of the United States. We're coming up on seven o'clock in the east. And so uh, somebody help me with the time. It's, what, 2.30 in the morning there. Uh, and I'm sorry, 3.30 in the morning. This is about 40 this is about 40 miles north of Kabul, and I'm told this is uh, territory controlled by the Northern Alliance. Of course, this is a night scope, very difficult to see, but occasionally you can see the tracers lighting up the sky as uh, some uh, anti-aircraft fire uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, activated there. We've been talking uh, throughout this day about uh, the diplomatic aspect of uh, the U.S.-led effort, and joining me now to, to pursue that a little bit further, Jim Steinberg, who was a former Deputy National Security Advisor to President Clinton. My first question to you, Jim Steinberg, is what does this hop operation have going for it from a diplomatic uh, perspective in, in your mind? Well, the most important thing, Judy, as you've been emphasizing tonight, is the very strong uh, focus that the administration is putting on the humanitarian side of this operation. It is unusual for the uh, operation to begin even on the same day as the first bombing with humanitarian relief and the president in his statement making a, a great deal of uh, emphasis on the fact that this is helping the uh, Afghani people. It's a strong message to the people in the region uh, that this is not about trying to harm the Afghani people. It's trying to hold the coalition together. What we've seen in the first hours is very strong and visible support from our European friends and allies, Prime Minister Blair, President Chirac of France, but a very cautious attitude by the leaders of the Arab and Muslim states. They're going to be watching to see if we can maintain this humanitarian focus and to avoid those civilian casualties. What exactly are the leaders of those Arab states looking for? Be a little bit more specific. What do they need in order to, to be supportive? And we've heard uh, all afternoon, uh, Dr. Kissinger, former Secretary of State, was one who made this point, but others have made it as well. We can expect them to be supportive privately, publicly, is something else. Well, I think that's right. But I think that what's important now is they're going to be waiting until the dust settles on this first day of strikes. They're going to want to see whether the United States has been successful in pinpointing the operations and hitting exclusively military targets or targets associated with the terrorists. If we've done a good job, if, we, if all goes well, then I think they'll, uh, they'll breathe a bit of a sigh of relief and hope that we can stay on this track. You've heard a lot tonight from your correspondents around the region hoping that this will be over soon. I think everybody's holding their breath because they think that they can survive a day or two of these attacks. But if it goes on for a long time, if there's no obvious result to this, then the pressures on these governments are going to grow. Well, do you think they will be able to be successful? I don't want to ask you to pull out your crystal ball, Jim Steinberg, but it's been reported in recent days. You're very familiar with the fact that there were efforts under the Clinton administration on more than one occasion to go after Osama bin Laden. Those efforts were not successful. What makes this one different? Well, that they're hoping for good fortune in some respects. Uh, if they can get a, a piece of intelligence that allows them to go after bin Laden or his close associates, that'll be uh, terrific for this effort. But they're also hoping that the disruption that's taking place and the, the sense that maybe the Taliban's days are over might lead people to, to take actions, maybe to uh, betray bin Laden or his associates, to somehow shake the uh, situation up in a way that improves their odds of getting that piece of intelligence that they need. Did you see the video today uh, that was released by the Al Jazeera network of bin Laden? I did. And your reaction? Well, I think that uh, what we're seeing is a very visible use of the way modern communications uh, are part of this effort. Uh, this was clearly very carefully planned by bin Laden to have something that he could be on the air showing that uh, he was still uh, defiant, that he was still challenging the international community. It's a message to try to rally his supporters uh, throughout the Arab and Muslim world. And uh, it's really going to be a very difficult fight over the coming days for us to get our message across that this is not a fight with Islam or the Afghan people because he's going to be using all his resources to make the opposite argument. What other resources does he have at this point? He's obviously hiding somewhere in Afghan, or we we don't know where he is uh, for absolute certain, but it is believed he's still in Afghanistan. What other resources does he have in this fight? Well, he has uh, an operation that's active around the world, and there are people who, uh, who for one reason or another, have been rallying to his cause. Uh, they're going to be looking very hard to see whether there's evidence that we've overshot the mark in terms of the targets that we've hit, and he's going to try to keep the pressure up, and everybody's going to be watching to see what his next move will be. 
and, uh, and, and when you say pressure up, are we talking about potentially another terrorist attack? I think that's something we have to be very alert to. It's uh, something that uh, we've, the authorities have been concerned about for some time. It's obviously going to be of some interest to him to show that the, uh, the network is still active. He's going to have to make a judgment right now about whether he's better off laying low, letting us continue our military campaign, perhaps seeing civilian casualties that will strengthen his cause. If he moves now and creates another terrorist attack, it could undermine his position. We learned today that President Bush has asked Secretary of State Powell to travel to the region, to Pakistan and India later this week. What would that be all about? What would that accomplish? Well, it's very important that the United States reassures Pakistan about uh, its long-term in intentions here. Pakistan is very concerned that even if the Taliban is overthrown, that there's a kind of stability and order in Afghanistan. That's an important uh, border for them. There's a huge refugee problem. It's a matter of great stability. And there's also a concern that uh, in India that this not become a situation where our fundamental interests change and that we lose our interest in good relations with India as well. So I think it's a wise decision by the administration to send Secretary Powell out there. This is really the crucible of where the action is, and I think his presence will be very reassuring to both countries. All right, Jim Steinberg, uh, good to see you again. Uh, Jim Steinberg, of course, being the former uh, Deputy National Security Advisor under President Clinton. Thanks very much. And we were just talking about Osama bin Laden and that tape that was released today. Uh, joining me now here in the Washington studio, Peter Bergen. He's become a familiar face here on CNN in recent days, Peter, because you've been uh, studying Osama bin Laden. You've been writing a book about him. And let's talk with some specificity about what he said in that video today. As you looked at that and listened to it very carefully, what stands out? Well, I think what stands out is that he said all these same statements before in many other forums, whether it was in television interviews with networks like CNN or ABC, or in his release statements. Basically, it's an attack on American policy in the Middle East, whether it's a support for Israel, uh, support for uh, uh, regimes uh, that he regards as un-Islamic, or support uh, the continued bombing campaign against Iraq. These are, so the themes were, were familiar. Uh, obviously, what makes it different is this videotape was clearly shot in the period between today and uh, September 11th uh, because he does reference the World Trade Center attacks uh, uh, by talking about these large buildings that were attacked. He doesn't directly take responsibility, but he's certainly uh, rejoicing in those attacks, I think. Let's, let's listen to one segment of what he had to say. I say these events have split the whole world into two camps, camp of belief and a camp of disbelief, so that every Muslim should come out to fight for his religion. The winds of change has been blowing now. And to America, I say to it, and uh, it's, uh, to its nation, I swear by God, you, America shall never enjoy, nor those who live in America will never enjoy peace unless we enjoy it in Palestine and before all the disbelievers uh, leave the our holy uh, land. Peter Bergen, you couldn't ask for a more blatant threat there on his part. Well, obviously that's what he hopes. Is um, um, it's 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 a very th chilling uh, statement. But I think that uh, you know it's wishful thinking on his part in the sense that this hasn't split the world into believers and unbelievers. There isn't a great proportion of Muslims who support Bin Laden's views. It's a tiny minority. Uh, on the other hand, there are a billion Muslims. So even if 0.1 percent of the world's Muslim population support him, that's 100,000 people. Of course, any kind of it's hard to m exactly calculate how many people he has, but certainly several thousand very committed followers around the world. All right, let's listen to one other uh, section of uh, Osama bin Laden's remarks. Uh, this is America. God has touched it by a wound which has destroyed its greatest uh, uh, buildings and thank God for that and this is America filled with fear from north to south from east to west so thank God for that 
and what America is tasting now is something very little of what we have tasted for tens of years. Uh, our nation uh, for 80 years is tasting this uh, humiliation its uh, sons uh, being killed and uh, its holy places getting attacked and nobody is hearing and when God has guided a group pioneers of Islam God has helped them to destroy America. I pray to God that uh, to lift them up to the highest pos position. So Peter, you're right, he's not taking responsibility, but he's certainly taking great satisfaction in what's happened. And you could see the depth of uh, his hatred for the United States and what he is saying it has wrought on the Islam, Islamic world. Yeah, I mean, this is part of a, a pattern of statements he's made in the past in which he has rejoiced, for instance, in the attacks on the U.S. embassies in Africa in 98, the attack on the USS Cole in Yemen in 2000. Uh, he doesn't directly take responsibility, but he says it was a good thing. Uh, and these statements have become more and more intense as time has gone on, culminating in this statement here. And uh, again, we want to tell our audience, this is part of a video that was released today by the Al Jazeera network. This is the Arab uh, television network based in Qatar. Uh, we're going to listen to one last uh, part of what Osama bin Laden had to say in this videotape. The situation is clear so that any Muslim after what happened and after what uh, Many officials in the United States headed by Bush and they came out with their men and with their equipment and they have encouraged the countries claiming to be Muslims against us. They came out to fight Islam. By the name of terrorism. Peter Bergen, again, you've been studying this man for many years. What do you take from that? Well, I think one thing about the statements he's been making this year is a confidence of the man. This is a man who doesn't appear to be easily intimidated. Um, he is uh, uh, very confident. He's declaring war against America, uh, and e with each successive tape that appears, because it's part of a p part of a pattern of tapes that have appeared, uh, his, he seems to be more personally confident. When do you think? I mean, what's your guess in terms of when this was taped? I heard speculation today it would have been soon, closer to the September 11th attacks rather than more recent. Presumably, it appears to have been shot at uh, probably somewhere in a very remote location in Afghanistan. So it would have had to be taken from that location and end up uh, with Al Jazeera television. That would have taken some time. So I think, just my speculation, that it was probably made several days ago.